Okay, the webinar is live. Just give me a few moments to bring in our student reps and I'll let you know when we're good to go. Okay, I see Isabel and Max are both logged on. Welcome, Isabel and Max. Mr. Parapato, we are good to begin. I officially call the meeting to order at approximately 7.06 p.m. Uh, Keith, can we have a roll call? Mr. Abu Dawood? Present. Mrs. Colombo? Here. Mr. Gersmeyer? Here. Mrs. Hanlon? Here. Mr. Pontillo? Here. Mrs. Price? If you press the space bar, it'll unmute. Press yeah, I tried that. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Romano? Here. And Ms. Mrs. Sembler? Here. And Mr. Parapato? Here. We have, we have a quorum? You're muted, Mr. Parapato. All right. Want to do uh, the salute the flag? I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of, the of the United States, United States of America. America. Okay. Thank to you. the Republic, Republic for which it stands, one, one nation, nation, under God, indivisible, liberty, and justice for all. All right, the New Jersey, I'm unmuted, right? Okay. The New Jersey Open Public Meetings Law was enacted to ensure the right of a public meeting to have an advance notice of and attend the meetings of public bodies at which any business affecting their interest is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the Westwood Regional Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be sent to the following announcing time and place thereof. Westwood Borough Hall, Westwood Public Library, Township of Washington Administration Building, Township of Washington Free Public Library, The Record, Community Life, and Pascac Press. Okay, at this time, can I have a motion for minute approval for last month's meeting? Mr. Abu Daoud, and I have a second, Ms. Hanlon, Mr. Rosado. Mr. Abu Daoud? Yes. Mrs. Colombo? Mr. Colombo? Yes. Mr. Gersmeyer? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Pontillo? Yes. Mrs. Price? Yes. Dr. Romano? Yes. And Mrs. Assembler? Yes. And Mr. Parapato? Yes. Motion carried. At this time, we would like to have the superintendent's report, Dr. Gonzalez. You have the floor. Thank you. If you could give me one second, I just want to pull up my document. Okay. Good evening, everyone. As has been customary since the start of this pandemic, I'd like to give an update regarding our response to the current public health emergency in our school district, beginning with the review of the cases. In addition to celebrating 100 days of school the other day on February 10th, We also achieved another milestone in the district by reporting over 100 positive COVID cases since September. As of today, we're at 120 cases with two thirds of those associated with students and a third with staff. 
However, positive case numbers alone involving students and staff do not even come close to describing the significant impact that this virus has had on our school district's ability to deliver a thorough and efficient education, as it does not even include the number of positive cases associated with the families of our students and staff, as well as in our community, that require our attention and result in the need for quarantining. For instance, in January, we had 74 staff members and 286 students who were not able to attend school in person because of a COVID positive case or request to quarantine per the Department of Health guidance pertaining to close contacts. In February, that number is 38 staff and 149 students who are asked to remain home because of a positive case or close contact. And those are the only instances we know of. There are still other numbers of people who must self-quarantine for travel purposes and or for other precautionary reasons that aren't included in those figures or that we don't even know about. Now, when you combine the COVID-related quarantines with the non-COVID-related illnesses or leaves, and you can imagine and have already likely experienced the staffing impact it has on a district with 300 teachers. Fortunately, while these numbers may appear daunting, they are managed as a result of the design and implementation of our reopening plan that prioritizes health and safety and mitigates the spread of the coronavirus. And to that, add to that a supportive, dedicated and creative staff of teachers, administrators and instructional support staff. We have all worked together to provide a continuous educational experience under such unprecedented conditions. Tonight, I will be presenting a summary of where we are today and where we are headed in reopening in our reopening plans, as well as the scarcity of guiding resources schools and districts are expected to use to take on this complex task. Most of this information will not be new to you. However, it represents our path forward. Before I begin, I do want to note a few key points. When asked about who is responsible for developing the plan, there is a short answer and a much longer answer. The short answer is the ultimate responsibility of developing the plan resides in the realm of the administration. Per the New Jersey Department of Education road back guidance and our very own board policies, the reopening plan nor decision about the status of our schools does not require board approval and is determined by the superintendent. However, that's not to suggest that the decision is void of any input by the Board of Education or any other stakeholder. Now, when considering the longer response, included in that responsibility for developing the plan is the engagement of the entire school community, including staff, board members, students, and our families to help inform our work. While the school-based pandemic response teams and district reopening committees represent only a small cross-section of stakeholders. We have also actively solicited and considered feedback from our staff, family, and students via numerous surveys and our decision-making. Likewise, while the reopening plan is not a part of the governing function of the Board of Education, our board members engage in discussions in public and in committees relative to our plan, as you hear during their reports. The formal and informal, public and private feedback we have received from everyone since day one has always been considered. Unfortunately, the diversity of impact, comfort levels, wants and needs makes a single unified solution impossible. While the plan may not conform to everyone's expectations, I assure you all opinions have been heard and considered. Oftentimes, I'm also asked, well, why can't our district do certain things that other districts are doing? The simple answer is that we're just not all the same. As the only pre-K to 12 regional school district in the County of Bergen, there is no one else like us. We certainly cannot be appropriately compared to our K-8 regional um, or regional high school districts, uh, high school only districts that is, leaving us to look at other K-12 districts. In all cases though, no models are exactly the same when you look at the details of their districts and the specifics of their plans. However, I can say with confidence that a hybrid model is consistent with the vast majority of similarly sized and configured school districts throughout the county and state, 
if the districts are even open at all. Now that was supposed to be my brief introduction, but let me jump into my presentation and say, uh, share my screen quickly. Just wanna make sure. Are you able to see my uh, first slide? Okay, great. So just to get started, um, wanna start with what the basis for our decision-making has been since day one. Beginning with the New Jersey Department of Education requirements that were issued back in the summer of 2020, this is and has been the only set of guidance that we have gotten from the New Jersey Department of Education on how to open up our schools. Anything that you see in our plans today and in our plans moving forward, tie back to what is indicated in this plan. So whatever is missing from the plan uh, that we've had to fill in the blanks and whatever we've had to follow is all contained in the DOE guidance. In all cases, as you've seen here, this is the same slide that we used when we presented our original plan. And the focus on in-person learning, social distancing, face coverings, as well as providing families with an opportunity to opt for full remote has been a hallmark of all of our planning. We also recognize that because of the nature of the development of these plans, we would not be able to go back to business as usual. And the school day and school year has been appropriately adjusted to allow for minimum session days or days that don't necessarily comply with the same schedule that we had before, but ensure that we meet our 180 day requirement for uh, a school year. Likewise, the New Jersey Department of Education recognized that a one size fits all plan to accommodate hybrid or remote learning is neither feasible nor appropriate and is committed to supporting local leaders in developing their plans to reopen schools. Once again, the hybrid models of cohorting students or grouping students to limit mixing as much as possible, as well as including a schedule that considers rotating cohorts for in person instruction by days or weeks has been the guidance that we have received from the Department of Education and what you will see in most school districts reopening plans. The other sources of uh, guidance that we have received include those uh, that come from the New Jersey Department of Health. And all of these resources are listed in the resource portion of our COVID-19 portal. So you could see the same guidance that we see. And according to the latest Department of Health, uh, January 19th Department of Health guidance, the reopening of schools requires broad community commitment in order to reduce the risk of exposure. Such commitment involves social distancing, wearing masks, cleaning and disinfection, and meticulous hygiene practices. These are things that have been, once again, the hallmark of what we have put in place in order to mitigate successfully the transmission in our schools. Some amount of mitigation will also be necessary until a vaccine or therapeutic drug becomes widely available. But once again, there is no indication as to what impact a vaccine will have on our abilities moving forward, but we have received uh, guidance regarding the impact of uh, receiving vaccines for quarantines, for instance. So we hope as the vaccine becomes more readily available, we'll get more information for how we could use it to our advantage to reopen our schools further. Further guidance from the Department of Health also highlights the focus that the more people a student or staff member interacts with, and the longer that interaction, the higher the risk of COVID-19 spread. Hence our focus on modified schedules and cohorting and grouping students. Much of the uh, guidance you'll see here, and I don't wanna uh, read the, the slide to everyone because it's, it's certainly consistent with what we've been speaking about, but it continues to reinforce all those things that we have put in place and continue to put in place since we've opened in September. Another resource that we have uh, followed 
is our New Jersey Schools um, Interscholastic Sports Association, which has provided the guidelines for how we could safely open athletics in our school district. This is consistent with the governor's executive order. This is not a superintendent decision. This was a governor's decision that was then filtered down, whereby the Department of Health provided general guidance and then deferred to the NJSIAA for the more specific guidance for us to be able to reintroduce athletics safely for our students, student athletes and coaches. Inclusive in their advisory task force are medical professionals who helped develop the documents to guide the safe return to interscholastic athletics, addressing things such as schedule, capacity, spectators, facilities, air quality and flow, face coverings and much, much more. So all of the work that we have done has followed those recommendations in order to ensure that we are doing things safely. As we get new information, whether it be by executive order, by governor announcement, or through the Department of Health, we incorporate, consider that and incorporate that into the work that we do. We also have consistently looked and listened to the CDC, but generally the flow of information comes from the CDC to the State Department of Health, the State Department of Health to our local health department, from our local health departments to us. But that being said, the guiding principles of the CDC's considerations as recently as February 11th have always focused on the importance of opening schools, as I think we would all agree, that allows us to ensure that the, um, the benefits of in-person learning are experienced in a safe and low transmission environment. It's important to note that as we continue to look at our implementation, that we do so while acknowledging that the risk is lower when the community transmission and spread is lower as well. Further CDC uh, considerations include COVID-19 in children and adolescents, which acknowledges both that symptoms may be milder, but the ability to transmit the disease to older adults is still present and evident. And therefore, because COVID-19 can spread to other children and to adults, it is important to continue to take measures to minimize the risk of spread in our schools. So with that, all of the work of the administration, all of the work of our teams to provide input in our plans, to our families to provide input, have considered the guidance that, that I just referenced. And over the past several months since November, we have previewed what the elementary and then the middle and high school have put together as the next phase for the school district. And, and I hesitate to, hesitate to put a number on it because since day one, we definitely look different in our schools than we did uh, maybe two, three weeks later as we continue to increase in-person learning opportunities for some of our vulnerable populations, for our at-risk students, for our students with individual uh, education plans. So we certainly have continued to phase in uh, more students over the course of the several months, but what is going to follow is the, the next, next major phase and change to our model. At the preschool level, You'll see side-by-side -side comparisons to show how we reopened in September and how we are looking to move forward in the next phase. At the preschool level, our cohort started with three uh, groups of students with a hybrid group of students for our tuition uh, students. And moving forward, we'd be looking for in-person daily instruction for all preschool students. And we would always still maintain a full remote group of students for any parents who choose that option. The schedule and the highlights, as you see here, are listed in order to enact that next phase. But once again, doing so would transition from a cohort reduced capacity model to an increased capacity model, reducing social distancing in our classrooms. If you look at our elementary school, 
Similarly, we've talked about moving from a hybrid group one, group two model to offering in-person learning opportunities five days per week, starting with kindergarten through second grade as our first phase, and then two weeks after, then inviting our grade students in grades three through five for five days of in-person learning. Once again, also continuing to open the option for full remote for our students. You'll notice that in the schedule, the schedule remains so that the morning schedule would run from 8.50 to 12.50, allowing time for students then to return home or the students at home to then have lunch, and then resuming at 2 p.m. for a live or virtual check-in with their teachers. The highlights, as you see listed here, increases in-person learning in this next phase from eight to 12 hours per week to 20 hours per week. So certainly the, the opportunities for in-person learning increases greatly. However, what you don't see in the highlights is our ability to say that we are continuing to decrease capacity and maximize social distance. At the middle and soon to be high school level as well, you'll see that we are continuing to focus on maintaining a decreased capacity in order to maximize social distance. Because of the nature of the movement of students at the secondary level, we would not be able to put in place the same types of mitigating measures in an appropriate manner to allow students to travel from class to class or even from school to home while carrying a, a desk shield, for instance. So the model that is uh, that we are looking at for the middle school, as well as the high school, would offer five days of in-person learning for, for in-person students, but grouping students into AM and PM groups, thus allowing our students to have the benefit of continuous five days of instruction, but it would still be in a reduced capacity environment. The daily in-person amount of time would not be the full four hours, but as I indicated in the roadback guidance, uh, that still permits us to meet our, um, our obligation for 180 days of school because remote instruction that continues in the afternoon or, or conversely in the morning um, would count towards the, the requisite number of hours. In the end, at the middle school, it increases in-person time for a middle school student from about eight to 12 hours a week to 15 hours a week, but it also provides that daily in-person instruction option for students. As I mentioned at the high school level, the next phase is similar to what I just described, that we would have an AM and PM session. We would have the all remote session. We would have a reduced number of hours during the day, but because it's five days a week, we would increase the in-person time from eight and a half to 12.8 hours up to 14 hours a week. Doing this model continues to afford us the ability to have decreased capacity and maximize social distance. Again, this is not new information. This has been the information that I've shared, but I wanted to be able to show the side-by-side -side comparison. And I also, this uh, presentation will be included in tomorrow's Cardinal Connection so that if you um, would like to reference it later on, you could certainly do so. Now, the big question of when this is going to happen has been you know, talked about as well, but I do wanna to speak to, again, the resources that we have received continue to focus on low community transmission, as well as the importance of social distancing, mask wearing, not mixing uh, groups of students, and cohorting students. In our models, especially our elementary models, we are compromising some of our key mitigating strategies that have led to the success of our efforts to, to prevent COVID transmission in our, in our schools. And therefore, we are going to focus on implementing the next phase when the community spread is low. To that end, we are currently using the COVID activity level index, the Cali report, as our guiding metric for a region. 
Because if you look at the road back DOE guidance, there is no metric. If you look at any of the guidance, the only guidance that we have is the NJDOH Cali index that provides the activity for the state and by region. As we continue to progress and as we continue to look at, at our data and continue to work with our health professionals, if additional information comes available from our health professionals that will favor a safe and quicker implementation timeline, we will definitely consider it. We have not received such data, but if it certainly comes our way, I will be sure to let the board and the, and the community know. And if we believe it's safe to return sooner, we would certainly activate that option sooner. Couple considerations that I also wanna end with. Once this plan is implemented, the next phase, this next phase that I described will likely bring us to the end of the school year. We're not gonna have the ability to continue to drop back and forth uh, or plan for a, a third, fourth and fifth phase and safely implement and prepare our students for the conclusion of the school year or safely and implement all those end of year activities that everyone's looking forward to that they missed last year, whether it be proms, dances, or, or culminations and promotions. We wanna make sure we continue to put safety first in order to make those end of year activities possibilities. So I say that it will likely bring us to the end of the school year because I, I wanna make sure that we leave room if something subs substantially happens that warrants a, a, a return to a tighter grip, then we would certainly follow that uh, guidance from the Department of Health. However, if we also see that we have the ability to increase even more, we would certainly explore that. But likely this will bring, bring us to the end of the school year once implemented. I also wanna highlight that you know, in all the models, one of the things that we, we mentioned in, in the summer was that families, flexibility was going to be key. We didn't want to lock people in to a model once it was established and not give them the ability to choose to go all remote or join their in-person counterparts. And therefore in the models currently and in the models moving forward, that flexibility for choosing in-person or full remote would remain. I'd mentioned before that the elementary plan will increase class size and decrease social distance resulting in full class quarantines when we experience positive COVID-19 cases. So again, it's important to note right now, if we are able to confirm that someone was not within the six feet uh, of close contact for the sustained period of time or, or total of 15 minutes, then we have the ability to avoid quarantines. But in a case where we are filling our classrooms and uh, compromising social distance, that is not gonna be an option for us. The secondary plans will require um, full days of in-person instruction by all of our middle and high school teachers. Since the opportunity uh, presented itself in the spring, um, we have uh, taken advantage of allowing our teachers uh, in the afternoon to take care of the, their, um, their instructional responsibilities and, and uh, administrative responsibilities as needed uh, in order to give our classrooms and uh, custodians more time to ventilate and air out prior to the next day of instruction. With the next phase, we would not have that afternoon option for the middle and high school student, uh, high school teachers. So for all those reasons that I just shared, that's the reason why if we were gonna implement the next phase, we are comfortable doing so when the transmission is low, the activity low, and the risk to our students and staff is low. So once again, this is all uh, just a summary for my report this evening of the work that we've been doing. But in response to several questions that I, I re received, I figured I'd put it all together in, in a uh, presentation. And as I said, I will include this presentation in the um, next Cardinal Connection. Thank you for listening this evening and have a good night. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, much appreciated. Um, we're going to, at this point, move on to, to the board president's report. Uh, and with respect uh, to the length of the agenda and in light of the budget workshop tonight, 
Um, I am going to forego my report, uh, but not without first just, you know, as always expressing my, my gratitude and appreciation um, for the entire Westwood Regional Staff and Administration for all the hard work and a job well done. Um, and most recently, a big thank you to the buildings and grounds for our unprecedented uh, snowfall in February for all their hard work. It doesn't go unnoticed. Um, so thank you. And at this point, um, I would like to move on to the business administrator's report. Mr. Rosado. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, I, I told you I was yeah, going to be no. quick. <laughs> Yeah, going to be. I am going to be quick. I'm just going to. We. I do have the budget workshop tonight uh, that we will be discussing during new business. The only th other thing I wanted to point out on the uh, agenda tonight is the bid opening for the security vestibules. Um, uh, the award pro the award for the project for all five other remaining schools because the middle school has it done built in would be a uh, one million thirteen thousand. Uh, we accepted two alternates for the high school. Uh, one being the floor tile, um, removing that, those are starting to pop up. And so doing a terrazzo flooring, epoxy terrazzo flooring, and then um, redoing the uh, ceiling entryway uh, since we're moving the doors and stuff. Um, and I will conclude my report for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Rosado. Um, at this time, we will have the student representatives report. Um, we have Maximilian and Isabel. Um, I know you have prepared something for, for not just the high school at this juncture, correct? Um, so I'm not sure who's presenting the middle school, but why don't we start with maybe the middle school report? All right. Um, for the, as for the middle school in, in February, they had over, <coughs> excuse me, they had over 80 students participate in tryouts for their uh, seasonal girls and boys basketball teams trials were in late January and teams continued to c compete in league games throughout the month of February and into early March so um, we say uh, good luck to all the players playing um, also clubs and activities are are um, are happening like usual with regular virtual meetings held in morning sports club with them having the option of meeting in person, obviously. Uh, many have taken on uh, altruistic spirit. Uh, Helping Hands Club also has spread positivity throughout the school by po posting inspirational messages and have sent staff members a, a video thanking them for keeping them safe during, uh, during this time. The National Junior Honor Society has started their charitable work um, with started with the food drive and the student council over there also uh, motivated the school to wear red for a national heart association and also encouraged students and staff to write Valentine's Day cards for children at St. Jude's. Thank you, Maximilian. Um, Isabel? So at the elementary school through the 25th to 29th of January, the Great Kindness Challenge and Spirit Week gave students and staff from K through five ways to highlight kindness and love for everyone. Uh, led by guidance counselors, children participated in acts of kindness and overall wellness for healthy bodies and minds. Schools get certified as a kindness school for the last several years and look forward to another certification. Classes are also recognizing and learning about Black History Month within lessons, activities, and discussions. K-5 is also looking forward to Read Across America Week and other virtual activities as spring is on its way. Uh, for the high school, after a full review of the current circumstances and the need to fulfill the entire curriculum, final exams will not be held this spring. Scholarships for seniors can be found on Naviance. Uh, the Westwood Public Library will continue to host the SAT and ACT tests throughout the rest of February and into March. AP French students at our sister school in Montpellier, France, presented posters in real time. And the theme of these presentations was awareness of global environmental issues. The Honors Choir class is continuing to work on their big project. And in addition to this, all of the choir classes are sending in recordings of themselves singing in the hopes of putting them together like we did with our holiday performances earlier this year. 
Last month, the PE and Health Department worked with special services to provide all high school students with a lesson presented by Mrs. Squire and Mrs. Byers, focusing on mental health and coping. The push in lessons were well received and the departments look forward to continuing to work together on sim similar lessons. The month of February brings new themes that students encourage to follow. The drug and alcohol theme of the month is alcohol. The wellness theme is exercise and mental health. And the diversity and inclusion theme is inclusion in our club and activity. Juniors, Sydney McPherson and Kevin Kim have continued their organization called Tech Neutrality, where they help raise money to donate computers to those in need. In, in September, we reported that they were starting this organization and their goal were, was a $5,000. As of now, they have raised about $8,000 and donated 30 laptops to clubs such as the uh, Boys, and, Boys and Girls Club throughout the Bergen County. We congratulate them for their efforts to help others in need and providing great resources uh, that are really helpful, especially during these times. As class of 2021 graduates this year, Project Graduation 2022 committee is underway as they prepare for their graduation the following year. Financial help is encouraged to aid in facilities and entertainment. For more information, please refer to the February 12th weekly update. Permission slips are still needed for the senior bowling event as the deadline approaches this Friday. You can email Keith de Blasio for more, more information. The winter athletic season has been fun, exciting, and filled with a lot of highlights. Uh, we saw that the boys and girls basketball will be finishing their seasons next week, and they both had their senior days this week with their parents allowed to be in attendance. Also with High ice hockey and swimming uh, have also been skating and swimming as they've been fortunate enough to continue to offer all of these sports to the student athletes. Winter track continues to work out waiting for the snow to clear and looking to participate in a few polar bear meets before the season ends. Earlier this, this season, the senior girls basketball player, Katie Gashler became the fifth girl in school history to pass 1,000 career points, which is a tremendous honor. Furthermore, Katie was named as this week's Bergen Records Athlete of the Week, so we congratulate her as her uh, as she and the girls basketball has won as of now 10, 10 consecutive games, and also not to mention the girls bowling remains unbeaten as they both look to capture another league title as their season finishes next week. Lastly, the boys basketball uh, once again ran, ran their uh, successful Cars vs. Cancer event. This time, uh, it was hella virtual. On Monday, the NJSIAA um, will open wrestling, volleyball, and gymnastics as they're excited for another set of student athletes to participate in their given sports. This concludes the student board report. That was excellent. Thank you very much. I thought that was a great idea to, to add the, the other schools in the district and uh, really nice job reporting. At this time, um, we're going to move on to the uh, committee reports. Um, and first up, we have Mr. Boudoud with policy and governance. Thank you, Mr. Parapato. Policy and governance met on February 17th. We met in uh, at 5 p.m. We reviewed over 10 new policies and also 10 new policies to, to revise or add, and then also four policies to abolish as per Strauss Esme. The committee recommended all newly reviewed policies to be added for the first reading and also designated policies be abolished per Strauss Esme's recommendation. We did a follow up from the previous board meeting on policy 3324-4324, the right of privacy teaching and support staff. Uh, we recommended no change to the policy per the alert summary of the policy have been developed simply to inform school employees of the reduced expectation of privacy pursuant to an investigation of work related employee misconduct that may result in school property being searched without a search warrant 
in that instance where search may be necessary, the administration would confer with legal counsel or law enforcement as needed based upon the specific circumstances. We recommended reaching out to Stratus SMA, which we did, and they also recommend to continue with the policy to have no regulation as there would be too many instances to add to that regulation. So we're putting it back on the agenda for vote. Uh, we have the draft regulation for 7250 and the naming application to be discussed under old business tonight. Uh, board meetings in person versus remote. Our recommendation was to conduct meetings virtually until all nine members of the board are able to attend in person. And then the draft agendas to the board, the administration can send draft incomplete agendas on Friday and final agenda cover memo and attachments on Tuesday. Our next meeting is in March. A date has not been set. When we do finalize a date, we will let everybody know. That concludes my report. Thank you, Mr. Parapato. Thank you, Mr. Boudoud. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Gersmeyer with Finance and Facilities. Thank you, Mr. Parapato. Finance and Facilities actually met twice since the last full board meeting in public. Uh, we had a late January meeting that had to be postponed until the following week. So we, are, we first met on February 3rd. And we tackled a couple of different topics. Uh, first, we had a quick update on the middle school uh, continuing project updates. Uh, updates about the uh, construction in the kitchen area. Um, almost ready to schedule final plumbing, electrical and fire inspections for the final TCO. Got an update on the band and chorus area and uh, the sea, uh, above ceiling inspections were passed just before uh, that meeting at that time. Uh, at, at that time that we discussed this, uh, the, uh, the final fire inspection was still to be done, uh, but it was scheduled and the final electric was due to be done the next day. Um, they were and final cleanup crew was scheduled for uh, the, shortly after that meeting. Uh, moving on, the new faculty bathrooms uh, are online and are being used. Uh, those are located in the old library section of the middle school for those that have been in the building before. Uh, and just uh, reviewing a, a, an issue, a slight issue in the heating in the, in the front wing. Uh, manufacturers were contacted in figuring out the, uh, the probable cause and mitigation factors there. As Mr. Abu Daoud uh, briefly touched on, uh, we also looked at the uh, naming of uh, naming of facility regulation 7250. Uh, I'll touch on that when I cover the second meeting we had. Uh, moving on, we discussed the budget calendar. Uh, major part of the budget calendar is our budget workshop tonight to go over the 21 proposed 2021-22 budget. Uh, we went over uh, various capital projects on the short-term plan. Uh, I've covered these in prior committee reports, including an additional staff bathroom in the Berkeley School, uh, ongoing upgrades to the high school media center and the technology hub, uh, looking at assessment of electrical upgrades uh, to, that's the first step in determining uh, the inventory and assessment of our current electrical infrastructure, whether it be for uh, potential use of air conditioners or uh, any other uh, facilities upgrades that and to see if the systems can handle overall upgrades in that manner. Uh, we're also discussing this year's cycle of uh, roof replacements. Uh, usually every year we, we choose a, a roof upgrade to make sure that no one building falls too far behind the other buildings. Um, I believe up for uh, inclusion in the new year budget is the roof replacement for the George School, and we'll probably cover that in uh, during our budget workshop later tonight. Uh, moving on, we discussed briefly the use of facilities by outside organizations. Uh, we had talked about this in the fall, and the recommendation was to, to revisit in January. So this essentially was our January meeting. Um, the, uh, the request for that meeting was to have some input from the administration. Uh, the principals uh, were polled during their last, at the time during their last administrative leadership team meeting about, about what to do about non-school district organizations using our facilities. And there were some concerns 
addressed. Uh, and the consensus was that uh, as far as the recreation departments go, if one of the town's rec departments begin and request to start programs again, the principals are more comfortable allowing them use on a case by case basis. The district would, however, require the use of site managers to help ensure district protocols are met, along with additional charges for the extra disinfection needs from the use of those programs. Uh, as far as class five groups, uh, consensus was to not allow outside private groups access to indoor facilities at this time to avoid introducing additional cohorts uh, into our school facilities. Uh, we got an update from our buildings and grounds director, Mr. Uh, Caffini, about LED lighting upgrades. Uh, we are still part of the, the double rebate program, uh, which is, has, has helped us complete lighting upgrades and save on our utilities much faster than otherwise would have been possible. Uh, the, the most recent updates in Washington School, a lot of work being done in-house for the lighting in the cafeteria, as well as outdoor lighting outside Washington School, over at the high school. The back parking lot uh, lighting has been upgraded, as well as um, looking into uh, not quite a double rebate program, but for the hallways and emergency uh, lighting, both the existing and new getting installed, um, a single rebate with a lot of potential seat savings there as well. Uh, we discussed uh, indoor air quality reports as a part of the assessment to determine the, the, the safety of our schools, which goes back to our uh, board district goal, number four, I believe. Uh, we, uh, West, a group called Westchester Environmental is conducting testing and we're waiting to receive the reports from those indoor air quality tests. Um, as Mr. Rosado mentioned during his report, uh, we'll see on, on the agenda tonight, the, the bid awarding for the security vestibules. Uh, we, we discussed that briefly at our committee meeting that at that time the bid was out um, and we, there was quite a, quite a few uh, contractors interested in it. And the pre-bid meetings and all that happened earlier in January and February. Um, we also cover Berkeley street parking for staff. And I'm gonna jump over to our second meeting that we had that was February uh, 10th, one week later. So in that meeting, we cover two main topics, um, the regulation 7250 and the Berkeley parking. So um, at that point, we had agreed, actually we, we were very much impressed with the application. Um, we were recommending at the end, the application seemed to be final from all the committees. In fact, we learned that it had already been sent out um, to the parties interested in the, uh, the topic at hand um, for naming uh, for Vito Trous. So uh, despite the fact that we're still discussing regulation, I think we thought it was a good sign of a sign of good faith to get that application out to the community um, sooner than the regulation had been finalized. I thought that was a good move by the district. Um, as far as the draft of regulation 7250, uh, the main concern coming from finance facilities was related to a part, uh, the part of the facility, sorry, the part of the regulation associated with the, the building of the committee for evaluating the application. We have varying, uh, varying opinions during the meeting. I, I, one board member uh, discussed just not having a committee and having it go right to complete 100% uh, board approval um, without uh, other stakeholders involved. Uh, we had a uh, the way the, the regulation is written does, does lay out a, a wide range of stakeholders uh, from board members to uh, community members to uh, representatives from other schools. Or if, if the facility is related to a specific school, having a, rep uh, a staff representative from that school, uh, potentially PSO members, things like that. Uh, and another, another option was to and eventually the recommendation that we're bringing forth and we can discuss later in old business is to potentially have the finance facilities committee review the application uh, to vet it, verify the information and uh, potentially invite stakeholders to a committee meeting as part of a kind of middle ground there. Again, we can cover that later tonight. Uh, moving on to Berkeley Street parking, we had covered just recapping the overall situation for any new board members that are part of the, that committee. Uh, discussed the needs, uh, the, the surrounding area, and, and the, the big uh, task at hand was for our, our new board president, Mr. Parapato, to reach out to the new council president in, in Westwood 
uh, to attempt to set up a meeting between the uh, between a small group of reps from the BOE and a small group of reps from the Westwood Mayor and Council to sit down and discuss, um, kind of re-engage on the project because we haven't really uh, had a chance to talk since pre-COVID last March in 2020. Um, that that reach out has been done and and there's been some back and forth to kind of solidify uh, a Zoom meeting time. And the hope is to have that meeting between now and our next public meeting on March 18th, just because the, the, that's a big topic and it relates to the budget that needs to be uh, voted on March 18th. So uh, that's that's where we are with that. And uh, that concludes my report. Oh, sorry, the next committee meeting is actually slated for March 10th. Uh, so uh, we will have a lot to talk about that. And that's my report for this evening. Thank you, Mr. Gersmeyer. Next up, we have Dr. Romano with curriculum and instruction. Okay, thank you. So the Curriculum and Programs Committee met on February 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, in addition to Dr. Mortimer, we actually had Ms. LaForgia join us uh, from, from FAMS. I'm sorry, <laughs> that, that's a flashback from Worms, uh, different middle school from Worms. And um, we, we started the meeting uh, talking about the middle school scheduling consultant report um, that was actually provided to the committee uh, prior to the meeting. So we'd have the opportunity to review it. Uh, it came in the form of a two-page letter from consultant, uh, Mr. Michael Reitig. And um, at the meeting, Mrs. Ms. LaForgia discussed, um, you know, some, some, I guess what we'd call basic, um, she gave us some feedback regarding the, the, the benefits of having met with the consultant. And, and they included, but are not limited to, uh, just, just, just the appreciation of, of having the opportunity to get the perspective and have dialogue with another scheduling expert from an outside scheduling expert, one who's objective. And um, um, we, we talked about, she presented, we, we discussed, um, you know, the alternative, uh, um, I gotta say, we discussed three separate alternatives in great detail. Uh, one involved an eight period day, which would reduce social studies, science, physical education, and encore instructional time. Basic, uh, and then everything outside of ELA and math would go back to 40 minutes. Um, and, 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 and that was an attempt to regain, to restructure the schedule and regain recess. Um, there was a general concern um, um, with the previous schedule uh, that they were trying to approve upon. Um, alternative two had to do with, uh, uh, well, again, you know, the, 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 sh the, the shortcomings of that had to do with uh, the fact that it min would minimize, uh, minimize world language instruction, health and physical education and encore goals and New Jersey state standards. Uh, so again, so that for those reasons, that was not desirable. And then there was alternative three um, resulting in uh, ELA and math being 60 minutes and all other courses would be, uh, classes would be 40 minutes. Um, the biggest downfall to that alternative was that uh, there would no longer be an abil uh, the ability to team, which is one of the central tent, you know, one of the central practices based on one of the central tenets of, of, of middle school, uh, the middle school model. So again, that was a concern. Uh, just regarding the recess edition specifically, um, we um, Ms. LaForge uh, discussed with us the, the concept of overlapping lunch periods, um, creating mandatory recess. When and you know she 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 did she did um, present a statistic to us regarding the, the fact that fifty percent of the kids, um, fifty percent or fewer, uh, previously chose to participate in recess. And, and, and we, we had a little bit of a discussion about that. We, we've had past discussions about the possibility of maybe trying to implement recess differently to engage students uh, more effectively in recess. Nevertheless, um, of those three models, not, none would provide an, an alternative um, that would allow for the reconstruction of the schedule and the incorporation of recess without significant loss um, and, that, and then again, that's according to, to, the, to the administration. Um, and um, we discussed the wind period very specifically. Um, we talked about trying to move the period, the wind period to an earlier time, um, removing the six, eight, uh, six to eight transition time for common wind period, removing world. Uh, the problem with that is that it would remove uh, world languages and encore teacher availability for uh, sixth through eighth grade help. Uh, throws off uh, shared staff transition between. So basically the gist of it is the, the conflicts uh, and, and the resulting loss in, 
in the eyes of those who were involved with scheduling and trying to incorporate recess without the loss was far too great to reinstitute um, recess. So the uh, so um, um, Ms. LaForge spent the remainder of that segment of our meeting answering questions about the placement and the function of intervention in Richmond Advisory, or otherwise known as e, uh, IEA or the WIN period. She answered questions about the 30 minute uh, sixth grade lunch and the 28 minute seventh and eighth period lunches. Um, Mrs. LaForge responded to concerns about the loss of the 10 minute recess, as I stated earlier. Um, and we did discuss that a bit. Um, one committee member suggested uh, forming a subcommittee to further investigate middle school scheduling and recess. Um, at that point, the committee just reviewed um, in general, the board's role in matters like these. And we talked very specifically about policy, budgeting and personnel. We talked about the fact that it wouldn't be appropriate for the committee to form a new committee to in fact do the superintendent and or his designee's work. Um, and so understanding the board's clearly defined roles, the committee then requested that the superintendent, the administration would consider expanding the current school-based teacher committee to include two board members and two parent community members appointed by perhaps the uh, Worms uh, PSO. The hope was that given the, uh, the ongoing nature of scheduling work and the need for representation by the various constituencies, all parties might lend uh, respective input and derive firsthand takeaway experience. Uh, the request was denied uh, at this point. The committee is hoping to continue conversation with, with Mrs. LaForgia very specifically about the report, just to better understand the report and, and, and I guess derive comfort from where we are with, with recess, where we might go in the future. Um, next on our agenda was, was an update on, on district goal three. And the committee and committee members had the opportunity again to review the elementary, middle and high school action plan tables for district goal three. Um, and just, just for those of you who, who, you know, who don't have district goal uh, three fresh in your minds, district goal three is to ensure that students are afforded the same quality and scope of instruction and other educational or related services among all educational environments. For example, hybrid in, uh, hybrid in school, hybrid at home and strictly remote learning. Um, one member made, a, uh, made uh, appreciative mention of the revision and clarification of the indicators of success and mid-year review columns of the action plan. And the committee looks forward to clearly presented results um, of the degree to which the district uh, will meet each of the measures for success in its final review of district goal three and of course, all of the district goals. Uh, next on our agenda was uh, learning in a time of COVID and beyond plan. And uh, Dr. Mortimer was, was happy to report that all summer programs will be held uh, in the middle school. Um, she presented us with a planned budget. Um, the elementary summer enrichment program will be replaced by an, accelerate, an acceleration program. Uh, it'll be uh, invitation only, and we'll target our, what they call our, our bubble students, um, which, which rank or rate as what's called early on grade level in, in iReady. Um, so basically we'll be identifying the students who have the greatest need for uh, the acceleration program. Um, new this year, uh, summer BSI program uh, at, the, uh, at the middle school, and in addition to a, uh, a longstanding elementary program. Uh, Dr. Mortimer shared that she hoped to hire uh, 10 teachers for elementary, uh, the elementary school program and six teachers for the middle school program. And then we had a few FYI items on our list. We, we talked about high school final exams. So Dr. Mortimer just informed us that high school administration uh, surveyed teachers and uh, their desire is that 90% uh, to, to, um, to uh, forego final exams for the 2020-21 school year. Uh, more, uh, the general feeling is that it's more important to continue with the curriculum instead of reviewing um, and administering exams. Um, and then um, she pointed out that due to the hybrid model, there's been a reduction in instructional time. And if you just, just you know, reflect back on Dr. Gonzalez's presentation, you can see that, that um, it's, a, it, it's a significant reduction in time. Uh, all models present some reduction in time. Um, final exams currently count for 15% of the final grade for, the full, uh, for a full year course. Um, finally, um, great weight was given to concerns about the mental health of our students. Um, Next, we talked about NJSLA testing. That's our state testing. 
annual state testing often held in the spring. And um, so, so, so for this year, the testing window has been postponed. Um, it, it, it cannot open until April 5th. Uh, it will be held in ELA and math in grades three through nine, in science in grades five, eight, and 11. Uh, we, we will have the option to test students remotely. So in other words, we'll be able to opt out of testing students remotely. Um, we, need, uh, we need to note whether a student is taking the test remotely or in person. Therefore, we cannot do the elementary testing in a single week. Uh, this, this will, you know, it would actually take, uh, I believe it's two to three weeks to do that. Uh, high school is doing a special schedule and has enough classrooms to test both cohorts at the same time. As far as conclusions, recommendations on that topic, various states have allowed for testing waivers. New Jersey has not done that at this point, or I should say as of the point of our, our, our last meeting. Uh, testing is scheduled to begin on April 5th of 2021, as I said. Uh, New Jersey schools have, have, have the option to decide whether or not to administer testing uh, to students who are engaged in the full remote learning model. Um, from what, I, from what we understood from our last meeting, Westwood Regional, the Westwood Regional School District has not yet finalized its decision on that option. Um, the, the January middle school, high school reopenings, I'm just going to, I'll defer to Dr. Gonzalez's presentation on that, where he went over that in, quite the, uh, in great detail. Um, in terms of our conclusions and recommendations though, um, it was interesting to learn that based on the, the survey data, the recent survey data that we received, and based on the way that we asked the questions, one in particular, which would have, have involved parental choice of a variety of options um, for returning to school, where they, were, where they were invited to check all that applied, we were able to project the maximum number of students if we were to go with an AM and PM, well, uh, with, with the, the model of preference or the model of choice, which is the AM PM model. Um, we could have a potential 85% in, stu in, in, um, uh, in school student participation, which would yield then a 42.5% um, presence of students at any given time. 42.5% uh, in the AM, 42.5% in the PM at its maximum. Uh, implementation would follow uh, two weeks. Uh, again, again, and now I'm now, yeah, uh, again, I'll just defer back to Dr. Gonzalez's presentation. And that's, that was actually basically the gist of our meeting. Our next meeting is March 16th at 7 p.m. Uh, some of the, one of the topics, uh, one of the main topics on our dis, uh, agenda at that time will be the iReady uh, program. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Romano. Okay. Um, I'm having trouble, Dr. Gonzalez, just opening up the, the latest the latest, uh, latest agenda. So there, I'm just assuming there's no awards and recognitions and special report, correct? I just don't want to make the assumption, but... Correct, correct. Okay. Um, okay, we're going to move to public forum. Um, during this portion of the meeting, district residents and staff are invited to address the Board of Education on, many, on any topic specifically addressed in this agenda or on any other questions, comments, or concerns that may be in respect to the operation of their schools. The board requests that individuals wishing to speak raise their hand and sign the speakers list via the chat feature in Zoom, giving name and address, and ask that all remarks be directed to the board as a whole, not to individuals. The board asks that members of the public be courteous and mindful of the rights of other individuals when speaking, specifically comments regarding personnel matters are discouraged and cannot be responded to by the board. Students and employees have specific legal rights afforded by laws of New Jersey. The board bears no responsibility nor will be liable for any comments made by members of the public. If a matter concerning a district member is of interest or concern to a resident, the matter should be referred to the responsible building principal, superintendent of schools, or the board of education, either by telephone, letter, or email. Although the board may not respond to the items raised during the public forum, all public comments will be considered and may be discussed tonight under the appropriate agenda items or new business at this meeting, at subsequent meetings under old business, or during the board committee meeting if appropriate. Each speaker's statement will be limited to five minutes in duration, and the public will be limited to one hour in duration. And at this time, um, we'll open the floor for, for public comment. And I just, Mr. Rosado, I'm looking at you. I just don't I'll have the chat. 
You want me to announce them? Okay. If you don't uh, mind, yeah, please. First one up is uh, Andrea Vecchione. And just be mindful just to uh, name and address, please. Hi, Andrea Vecchione, 71 Salem Road, uh, Township of Washington. Good evening, Dr. Gonzalez, Board of Education and Community Members, and thank you, Dr. Gonzalez, for a very thorough update tonight. Last night, I spoke in opposition of the Westwood Regional School District opening their K-3 program at capacity for five days a week. Since the Westwood Regional School District has not provided any specific insight about the following concerns. Will there be proper ins inspection of the air filtration system at the schools? Were the teachers surveyed to determine why they were uncomfortable opening at full capacity? When we do open at full capacity, will the district hire additional teachers to aid in ensuring that students are constantly following COVID protocol? Is the district considering relocating classes to larger spaces in the building so socially distancing our students is more realistic? Will the district conduct actual health screenings, purchase additional PPA for staff, including portable sanitation systems, quick sprays, and air purification systems? Again, I urge the board, as well as the community members listening, to recognize that it's only through these efforts that the surrounding districts were able to successfully open. My husband and I listened to the January Board of Education meeting at full and noted quite a bit of misinformation presented publicly. Firstly, comparing our very young age students returning to a crowded and much more and stagnant room to a group of willing athletes who are moving around a much larger space is not only absurd, but a very bad example. It's because of such programs transmissions that many New Jersey schools have been forced to shut down. Discussing anecdotes, surveys, and state ratings that are tremendously skewed is pointless and irrelevant. With a quick Google search, you'll find that there's been 10 outbreaks in our area in the last week linked back to school classrooms. Publicly and confidently stating that our school buildings are safe for our children's return is not only irresponsible, but dangerous. To my knowledge, and I've asked a total of six times at this point, there's been no inspection com completed as promised on the district's website and during the August about Board of Education meeting. Mentioning that families always have the option of choosing to work remotely is ignorant and in ineffective. From experience, I can tell you that the fully remote students get limited interaction with their teachers, leaving those children feeling like an afterthought. Similarly, saying things that this generation will face damaging effects of being remote is not only dramatic, but very close-minded. The district board, superintendent, teachers, and community do not cause COVID. This is what we're facing and how we respond to it is not only valuable to our children, but also for the well-being of the community itself. I've mentioned in the past that my husband and I are new to the area and are eager to become active participants in the school and town community. We were told that the district isn't like any other. The members of the community are like family. This is not what we've been witnessing and it really needs to stop. We don't wanna publicly oppose our fellow families or offend the administration or board of education, but we feel that it's never right to patronize anyone. And it seems counterproductive for board members to fight publicly. And by the way, we applaud those of you that remained professional. And as a teacher myself, I find the mindset that the teachers union not making decisions whether or not they should return to school to not only be insulting and condescending, but also threatening. With all due respect, they are exactly who should be invited to lead this conversation. They, along with community member nurses, doctors, architects, professionals, should be the one asked to sit on the reopening committee. Use your resources. Families with all different kinds of backgrounds and belief could be a part of this conversation. Instead, most district families currently feel that they're not only being uh, uh, not heard, but also being ignored. Emails should always be answered and rules should always be followed. And teachers should always be respected. After my speaking at the last board meeting, I actually had a district teacher who I didn't know fought me and tell me to fight with everything I have. Your district teachers are listening and what you say directly affects the culture and climate of our schools and therefore my child. Please use your words wisely. It's disgusting that teachers are feel left fearing their return at full, uh, uh, they're returning at full capacity. The CDC and public health experts state that schools should ensure staff and students wear masks, stay socially distanced and wash hands and that this is paramount to curbing the spread. Two, article, two other articles clearly state that the school buildings do not spread COVID, but only in areas where the virus is rare. A direct quote from the US News, once community spread becomes out of control, then you need to start thinking about whether any public spaces are safe and schools are just that. With the US failing to contain the virus on a national level, American K through 12 schools have reported more than 313,000 COVID cases from September to just December. One characteristic among a uh, common among schools that are doing well, they're operating under capacity as they've opened with arrangements designed to minimize crowding. Numerous doctors have publicly urged schools to open, but only to do so with socially distancing. It's ironic that the board who's meeting virtually is determining the fate of our children. 
take a look at your screen. Our classrooms are predicted to house young students double the amount that you see. If you're unable to physically meet in one room, then how safe could it be for our children of 20 to do it daily? I wanna end by saying that I do want my daughter in school five days a week, but I wanna ensure that she's there safely. There can be a third option to divide our cohorts in a morning and afternoon session, keeping our numbers low and providing our students with the in-person time desired by the community. If this isn't realistic, then perhaps the community could come together to discuss ways to make our remote learning more engaging, interactive and effective. Surrounding districts are also successful in doing that. As always, thank you for your time and attention. Thank you, Ms. Vecchione. If you can just uh, please just put your uh, name and address or your address rather in the chat box, that would be appreciated. And it's in there. Oh, okay, great. Okay, next one on the chat, is, I'm gonna, and I'm gonna ask everyone who has a hand raised to please sign into the chat because we're gonna be calling off of the chat. Uh, and as uh, Mr. Parapato has stated, please put your name and address in the chat uh, so that you can get called. Next one on the chat is Kelly Rydell. Thank you for thank you for unmuting me. Good evening. Thank you for your time, Mr. Romano. Um, Franklin Ave Middle School was a flashback for me. I used to work at Ramapo High School, so I, I got your fam's reference. Um, at this time, um, under the the um, care and creativeness of Ara Wendell, we are. Um, I am one of a few um, representatives for our community who would like to sh shout out some of our administration our staff, our support staff, our teachers, our nurses, our counselors. Um, so at this time, I will just speak on behalf of that group, on behalf of our parent community who has flooded uh, a new Facebook group with uh, so many kind things to say. So I'll get started, but I am one of a few parents who will be speaking this evening. First and, <clears throat> first and foremost to our administration, I'd like to thank Dr. Gonzalez for safely and strategically leading our district through this unprecedented time. Our family appreciates all of you. For Jesse F. George School, shout out to Ms. Shin. You truly understand what it means to be an elementary educator. You show such true compassion and love for your students through your lessons, emails, and informal meetings in the hallway and outside. Thank you for caring so deeply for our children. Shout out to Mrs. Masnick. In 2020, a year that we will never forget, you redefine what teaching means and looks like for your second grade students. You taught with all of your heart each and every day. You were learning new tools, technologies, and strategies as you remained a pillar of support and comfort for our children when they needed you most. You set time aside to meet individually, both from, out, from a distance outside our homes and in Zoom meetings to make sure students felt listened to and loved. Thank you for making spring 2020 as memorable, enjoyable, and as meaningful as you possibly could. To Mrs. Villardo, who simply is the best. She started a new third grade, she started as a new third grade teacher at George last year and now teaches second. We have been lucky enough to have her these past two years. She sees so much light and potential in every one of her students and goes above and beyond every day. Our kids adore Mrs. Villardo, and we are so grateful to have her at George School. Shout out to Ms. Mosery and Ms. Winchell. They are caring, patient, and understanding. They adore their students. For Brookside, thank you, Mrs. Oldeck, a wonderful kindergarten teacher who we are grateful for every day. From your detailed lesson plans to your endless patience and amazing report with the kids you teach, we can't imagine having any other teacher. I'm sure this hasn't been the year you envisioned, but you've tackled it with grace and have given your class a wonderful experience in spite of the obstacles you've currently faced. We appreciate you. Thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for all that you do. Mr. Conroy, thank you for help for keeping Brookside up and running during these crazy times. The kids love listening to your good morning Brookside in the spring. You provided a sense of normalcy during a time that was so challenging. Thank you. To Mrs. Elysian, Mr. Barbareri, Ms. Yu, Ms. Poratelli, Mr. Hull and Senorita, your weekly lessons are so fun and are wonderful reminders of the fun that learning can be for our children. Your lessons have become family fun nights and we are extremely grateful to be able to learn the recorder during a pandemic. 
for Berkeley School. Thank you, Mrs. Lepore. She has kept her second grade students engaged, interested, excited to learn. She is always encouraging and has strengthened Kendall's love of writing. Thank you, the Falk family. Thank you, Mrs. Siegel. She kept her students learning and having fun last spring so they could finish strong. Shout out to Mrs. Georgia Darius, Georgia Diaz. I'm sorry, I, I apologize. She's a second grade teacher at Berkeley School. Kindergarten, uh, kindergarten teacher is one of the most special and cherished years in school. While my heart aches that our kindergarten students aren't having the traditional K experience, we realize how much of it is special because of the teachers. You go above and beyond, demonstrate so much kindness and patience towards the children. I am amazed at how you will always handle every day any hiccup with such grace. Thank you for making this unusual year a special one. At Washington School, Mrs. Laurent was my daughter's kindergarten teacher. I was beyond stressed when my daughter with a food allergy entered school. Not only did she also understand my stress as an allergy parent herself, but she made this transition flawless for my daughter and honestly for me as well. I always get my ear, I always get my ears and eyes when I see Mrs. Laurent happy tears because she is just a gentle, comforting soul. I adore her. She also shares a birthday with my daughter, which made her kindergarten year even more special. Thank you, Mrs. Christofik. You have a heart of gold, patience of a saint, and knowledge of how to handle those tougher children. Thank you for being patient with Thomas and for always zooming with him any time he needs that extra push, assistance with schoolwork, or just to see and have a chat. Keep up the great work, you are truly appreciated. And the last two are for our special services department. Shout out to Mrs. Allison Espinito, es Esposito, our case manager at the district for special services. Since the start of this pandemic, she has stepped up with getting us the support we need to keep our son engaged in school during fully remote last year and the return to in-person education. She's been completely understanding of the current world around us and focused on the children's needs. Thank you, Allison, for all you do. And last, is, I'm sorry, your time is- That's okay. The last one for, was for Miss Ariana. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. Okay, so doesn't, I don't know if we're having technical difficulties, no one's call, signing in. So I'm gonna go through the list. I do see we have a phone caller, so I'm going to go to the phone caller because I know they don't have op, um, access to the chat. Uh, All right, thank you. Just state there your, your name and so your I, address. Yeah, if you can please state your name, your address. You're muted. Uh, we got to unmute them. I only have the ability to ask them to unmute. I can't actually unmute Wait, them. Is that star six to unmute for phone? There we go. There we go, yep. Hello? Yes. Hello, may I go? May I speak? Yes. Good evening. My name is Janet Sopwith, 849 Robinwood Road, Township of Washington. As the former mayor and the current school administrator and a longtime resident of the township, I am respectfully requesting that you name the stadium field in honor of Vito Pal Trout. Vito had a unique Mr. perspective. Hopkins. Mrs. Hopkins, yes. can you do me a favor? I believe you have the the uh, the, the, com the computer on. Uh, can you yeah, mute hold on. the computer I'll, I'll... so we don't get that echo? Yes. Okay. Is that better? Much. Thank you. Hello. Okay, I'll start at the beginning. As the former mayor, a current school administrator, and a longtime resident of the township, I respectfully request that you name the stadium field in honor of Vito Pal Trous. Vito had a unique perspective by encouraging our residents of all ages to connect with each other, attend games and events, inspire people, and support our teams. I followed Vito's advice myself many times, as he always encouraged me to attend games, which I did. This is how I realized the importance of his goals to connect with people to create a large scale team with his winning ways. After all, Vito was the inspiration for James Stickles Memorial Plaza at the library. Imagine this Boy Scout being inspired to design, create and work so hard to complete such an important project. 
there are probably many more projects and things out there inspired by Vito. Vito was also a very wise man who was able to solve problems. He had the respect and admiration of the students and staff who realized his importance to everyone. For Vito, the word team consisted of giving his time to support students, his expertise to help others, being an advocate for the school in town and mentoring others. Yay for Team Vito. Just remember, Stadium and Vito, perfect together. Thank you for your time and consideration. If there is anything else I could do to help you in this situation, please let me know. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. So again, like I said, it appears we have some technical difficulties. So I'm gonna start reading names. I have the first one on is Snee. And then I have Tommy Snee. I'm not sure if they're one in the same or two separate ones. But... No, no, you're oh, muted. Hi, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, good evening. My name is Brita Snee and I live at 772 Koch Peak Avenue in Township. I cannot say enough about the hard work demonstrated by Mrs. Shell and Miss Aleppa every day. The dedication to their craft is to be admired. My husband and I thank God every day and twice on Sundays that our daughters are under their care in this disastrous situation. I cannot believe that we are knocking on the doors of March and we are still in phase one of the reopening plan. As others have done before me this year, I ask the board tonight to allow the parents that are comfortable sending their children five days a week the option to do so sooner rather than later. The hybrid option that we have been using since the beginning of the school year, simply not enough for my children. For those that feel the hybrid option or remote option are going great for your family, I am so happy for you. I wish I could feel that way. I just want to share the events of one of many disastrous days at the Snee House, thanks to not having the option to send my daughters to school five days a week. Both my husband and I were working from home on this particular day, as were the girls. My second grader came in to ask me for help, and because I wasn't a call I could not get away from, I told her she would have to wait. Shortly thereafter, my kindergartner came in asking for help, and I had to tell her the same thing. Unbeknownst to me, my second grader then asked my husband for help, and he was not available to help either due to his work commitments. When I was finally able to assist my kids around lunchtime, I asked my second grader what she still needed to do for school. Normally, she, she responds with one, maybe two things still needing completion. On this particular day, she responded by telling me that she still had at least four things to get done. After going through how disappointed I was in her for not getting any work done, she told me through tears that the reason she didn't get her work done was because she was busy all morning helping her kindergarten sister get through her assignments since she needed help and had no adult available. Guess who was in tears then? This is just one example of how wrong the hybrid schedule is for my family. The fact that my kindergartner has worked more than 200 hours independent of a teacher is unbelievably unacceptable. Let me say that again. My kindergartner has had to work over 200 hours independent of her fabulous teacher. It pains me to know where she could be if she had all that time with Ms. Shell that she not only deserves, but is entitled to. Again, I ask this board to give the parents the option to send their children five days a week. If indoor sports can take place, bringing athletes from other districts into our buildings, the K-2 students should be given the option to be in school five days a week. There are still four months left in this school year. Do right by your youngest learners and let them in the buildings every day like their friends have been doing in neighboring towns for months. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak tonight on behalf of my children. I hope other members of the board will do the same tonight like Chief Pontillo did last month. It is time to finally give parents the third option that, according to your survey, 80% of families want and have been advocating for since September. Thank you again and have a good night. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Tommy Snee is next. Can you hear me? Yes.
I'm sorry, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Uh, good evening, everyone. The current state of our K through five reopening plan is really a two part tragedy. The first is we have a superintendent who seems to operate as an empirical king. Since last September, many parents have been lobbying for a third option of in-person instruction for 20 hours every week. The phase two plan details were announced in December and indicated that the reopening plan would be based solely on a homegrown arbitrary, not based on any DOH, DOE guideline, Cali metric linkage. It appears that we are the only school district in Bergen County operating under this arbitrary, unscientific, festivist for the rest of us like metric. Our Cali metric linkage was created under the direction of district leadership who coincidentally will earn over $2.7 million this school year alone while our most vulnerable K through two learners receive on average less than 20 hours of in-person led instruction every two weeks. This brings me to my second point, our legacy board of ed members and ongoing lack of board leadership. I wanna be clear that I'm referring to all of the board members who served on the board of ed from June through December 20, as well as those who are still on the board. It isn't fair to include Chief Pontillo and Ms. Price with this feckless do nothing group. According to the New Jersey School Board Association website, and I quote, School board members are state officials empowered by state law to govern. Let me say that again, empowered by state law to govern the public schools at a local level, end quote. Since September, many concerned advocates have been actively lobbying the legacy board members to actually govern and perform oversight of our empirical-like superintendent. Up until the most recent January meeting, there was no legacy board member who had the courage to govern, never mind bro broker the open conversation of actually implementing phase two. For many parent advocates, our prayers were finally answered with the election of Chief Pontillo, who raised a voice for the 80% families that want their children physically in school 20 hours every week. He appears to be the only board member following the elected Board of Ed member oath by trying to hold the superintendent accountable regarding the chasm between what the majority of parents clearly want and what the Board of Ed has allowed the superintendent to intentionally continue to force on us. News flash for several legacy Board of Ed members as just another district employee Dr. Gonzalez works for and is directly accountable to all of you. And you in turn represent the district parent community. The brazen unwillingness to stop the Cali linkage, which continues to damage almost a thousand learners, that is on all of the legacy board members. According to the New Jersey School, Business, uh, School Boards Administration website, and I quote, when the chain of command is used properly by citizens and board members, communications are improved and the Board of Education can act as the final arbiter on issues which have not been resolved and other steps in the chain, end quote. Since August, many of us have followed the chain of command. Dr. Gonzalez has stubbornly made his position clear. He's unwilling to abandon his truly unusual and unnatural commitment to an arbitrary homegrown metric linkage. As best as I can see, the surveys of all four schools have shown a majority of at least 80% of the families want their children back in school 20 hours every week. Based upon my research, confirmation from employees of the NJDOE and School Board Association in Trenton, as well as feedback from other superintendents and board members in neighboring towns, the responsibility to execute on what the taxpayers have clearly wanted and stated remains on all of the legacy Board of Ed members. As the most highly overcompensated employee of the district, Dr. Gonzalez is accountable to all nine of you as you were elected to oversee and manage him. Please stop shirking your responsibility. Apparently this relationship was covered in your school board association training classes. But to clarify the relationship for those that either forgot or didn't take the class, Dr. Gonzalez is an employee who works for you. You are his boss. Therefore, you ultimately own this arbitrary Cali mess. To quote my friend in Virginia, figure it out. For the board members with children in grades K through five, I ask that you please compartmentalize your personal feelings of fear and fright regarding your own children being in school 20 hours every week. Recent board member comments include, and I quote, if I have to stay hybrid, that's what I feel like doing. I feel that it should stay the way it is, end quote. Quote, I don't think five days a week for that young age is a solution, end quote. Understand, I'm not suggesting that you're not entitled to your personal feelings, likes, and fears, because you absolutely are. But based upon conversations with my new friends at the School Board Association in Trenton, other local superintendents and board members, I'm asking that you follow your oath to serve the needs of the 80% of the families that want their thousand learners physically in school 20 hours every week. You took an oath as an elected board member to govern on behalf of the district taxpaying families who elected you, not based on the fears of your own family or what you feel like doing. 
understand your family still has the remote option. If you can't put your own personal fears or likes aside, then maybe you have a completely different decision to make. Please stop the theft of education from a thousand of our learners and continue discrimination against 80% of the families that elected you yes. to govern on their behalf and not how you Mr. feel. Mr. your time is up. I'm sorry. Please stay healthy and well. Thank you. Next one up is Dan D'Agostino. Hi there, it says it's um, uh, unmuted. Can you hear me? You are, we can hear you. Thank you. So hi, my name is Dan D'Agostino. I live at 71 Salem Road in Township. Thank you for this opportunity to speak this evening and thank you for all your time volunteering to our community. I'm typically a silent member, generally unaware of any political or social events happening in the area, but lately my wife and I have been speaking, I mean daily, uh, about how challenging this is. We want nothing more than to have our kids back in school, uh, five days a week, living life as close as normal to as possible. Like many of you, I'm sure, our every day is frantic, schedules dependent upon multiple caretakers, extracurriculars. Uh, I mean, we've made outside accommodations and tried to look beyond the conventional box, so to speak, to figure out how to have our daughter safely learn and continue to thrive. We constantly wonder if our daughter is receiving enough. Inclusive of looking within the district and outside for creative solutions, we too considered private schooling because of the accommodations that they promised. We see many other families in the area doing pretty much the same thing. Everyone's asking, what are they doing? But no one is asking how. Surrounding schools and districts that have stayed open have invested so much more than just desk shields. They have thought outside of the box to accommodate their population in a safe and effective way. Uh, those that didn't, they either shut down or have seen only their best, most quality teachers leaving their careers behind. We want to reinforce to our daughter that being a part of the public school system is critical to community development. And that's why we continue to keep her enrolled. However, I have to say that I'm really saddened by what I'm seeing in our community. My wife insisted that I listen to the last board meeting and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was disgusted. People were personally attacking the board, the members, members against each other, the teachers. I know that we're better than this. You know, I, I saw Dr. Gonzalez's statistics in the slideshow, which I can't thank him enough for in the beginning, 120 cases in 100 days. And that's with us following the standards and the rubric. I, I just don't see how following the Cali system without thinking outside of the box and, and how to get our kids back is ever going to be rectified. You know, I, I'm not in education, uh, true, full disclosure, I could never do it. I'm an architect, so I know facilities. I'd be willing, and I'm sure other people in the community are, would be willing to step up and help create a committee. I, you know, I'd be happy to, to try to figure out, like, can we use the auditorium? Are there other things that we can do? The reality is, is that this year is probably gone. We're not going to see any, any changes to this. So what are we going to do in September or October or next year? And what's it going to be like as we transition? I, I, I'm urging everyone to please look beyond this because it is important that we get these kids back. You know, we've been told very early on that our facility cannot properly social distance. So I'm volunteering to get on a committee, help out however I can. I think everyone is doing a fantastic job. And frankly, it, it's been hard to keep the numbers at bay as they have. I just hope that we can come up with a plan to move forward. I thank you all for your time and your attention. Thank you. Thank you. You're muted, Keith. Sorry, next one is Michelle Capasso. Hi, Michelle Capasso, 328 Colonial Boulevard, Washington, Washington Township. I am reading more shout outs for more of our um, staff. So at Jesse George, Mrs. Purcell, thank you for always bringing your A game. You are energetic, engaging, and fun. I feel blessed to have you as my daughter's teacher. Gigi is your biggest fan. Mrs. Williams and the first grade team at Jesse F. George, you have truly created, sorry, you have truly created a fun, interactive, virtual experience for our kids. Thank you for your support, your support both in and out of the classroom. 
Sending a shout out to Mrs. Alessi, school nurse at Jesse FG, who has been contact tracing around the clock with all her normal responsibilities. Thank you for your knowledge, professionalism, and keeping our school safe and healthy. Shout out to Mr. Licknick at Jesse F. George. He is so encouraging with the kids. He has such a great personality and always is so happy. My daughter loves her calls with him. Thank you for keeping her interested in learning and an instrument. My boys had an amazing year. Miss Kirkby has been so great with my Jake and all of her students. I see Jake climbing and reading and math and is always so happy with school. She was amazing for Nikki too when he had her two years ago. Thank you so much for making learning so fun for our kids. My kids would especially like to thank the lunch staff for providing such generous lunches at George School. The highlight of their week is unboxing their lunch bags, trading items, and of course the chocolate milk. Uh, at Westwood Regional Middle School. Laura Jones, Nora Abbasi, and Daniel Miller, all at Worms, all go above and beyond. Thank you, thank you, thank you for promoting positivity. You are all doing so great. Not only are you enthusiastic and still giving my daughter the education she deserves, I know they are working way beyond school hours. At Washington School, I'd like to give a huge shout out to Mrs. Shell at Washington School. She is an amazing teacher for my daughter, Tessa. She has a kind way about her and truly gets what is going on during this crazy school year. Her kindness, flexibility, and dedication is apparent every day. She goes out of her way to make Tessa feel comfortable in class. And even when out of class, she makes a point to include each student in virtual learning conversations. Her contagious smile always helps to make the learning experience that much better. Thank you, Mrs. Shell, for not only being there for Tessa, but also for me too. And thank you for all your hard work you have put in thus far. Please know the O'Sullivan family is very grateful. At Brookside, we are so grateful for Mrs. Artie, Ms. Voza, and Ms. Tadello at Brookside. They are truly amazing, and we feel so blessed to have them educate our children this year. We can't thank them enough for all the love and kindness they have shown our children this year. Also, Mrs. Jeans, we are so thank you, thankful for your support and encouragement. She has not only showed uh, to our children, but also to us parents. Having her check in to make sure all is going well and keep our kids on track means the world to us. Thank you for all you have done to make this crazy a little less crazy. Lastly, Berkeley. Shout out to Miss Ross at Berkeley School. She is doing an amazing job keeping her, my daughter engaged and interested in school during a very challenging year. Thank you for looking out for her and doing everything you can to make sure she has a successful year. So very grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next one is Andrea Mansi, Mansu, I don't know. Sorry for butchering names. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I am going to read more shout outs also. Um, before I do, I wanted to say thank you to Ara for putting out some, such positivity because the negativity gets a little exhausting. Um, so I'm starting with Brookside. Could you just state your you. name and uh, address for Sorry, sorry, I thought I put it in the chat, but Andrea Peck, um, 28 Sixth Avenue in Westwood. Oh. Um, a special thank you to Ms. Pilella and Mrs. Carroll at Brookside for your dedication and care. Thank you for going above and beyond each and every day. We are so grateful for such amazing teachers. Shout out to Mrs. Basavesky at Brookside Elementary. She is caring, kind, and full of fun. My daughter loves going to school or Zooming with her classmates. Thank you for bringing your best every day. A special thank you, shout out to Mrs. Tadiello and Mrs. Oldak for all of their hard work and dedication to our children during this past year. Their patience, kindness, and ability to put smiles on the kids' faces each day while navigating a hybrid schedule is truly amazing and much appreciated. My husband and I are so grateful. We couldn't have asked for better teachers. I want to thank all of the staff at Brookside, especially Mrs. Johnston, Mr. Levesque, and Mrs. Pickett. They have all worked tirelessly to make a smooth transition into the school year and keep our son happy and learning every day. Shout out to Mrs. Diaz and Ms. Seigel of Brookside Elementary School. They bring joy, fun, and a ton of learning to fifth grade every single day. Their energy and enthusiasm is contagious. They are the dream team. Thank you for all you do every day. 
at the high school. Thank you, Mr. Rudy. I'm going to butcher his name, Trezvalis, at the high school for keeping the kids engaged and giving them confidence. At Berkeley, big shout out to Mrs. Stewart at Berkeley. My daughter loves kindergarten. Teaching a child to read during this crazy time seems like an impossible task, but you are doing it. My daughter is reading and loving it. Let's not forget writing and math. I am amazed by how much she is learning, and we cannot thank you enough. At Worms, thank you to all of the teachers, administrators, and staff at Westwood Regional Middle School. Keeping middle school students on task, interested, and engaged is no easy feat, especially during construction and a pandemic. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Barbarito, who has always encouraged and pushed his students to their fullest potential. Thank you. Thank you to Mrs. LaForgia, Mr. Uh, Atanasio, Ms. Sparno, and all of the administrators and counselors for always being available for both students and parents. At Washington School, wanted to give a much needed shout out to Mrs. DeCuffa. Two of my three children have been blessed to have her thus far. She truly gets to know her students and makes them feel special and goes beyond her duties as a teacher's aide. She is an angel in disguise, and my boys truly enjoy and have enjoyed her presence in their classrooms, past and present. Thank you for being so uplifting and inspiring for those kids that may be hiding behind the mask and unwilling to crack a smile. You have cracked that mold and helped Thomas to realize it's okay not to be okay in this situation and feel connected in a time of such disconnection. A simple hello, how are you doing today? What's going on? How was your weekend, et cetera, is all he needs some days to feel connected and, and as if his teachers care about him outside of the regular academics. A special shout out to Miss Agnello at Washington. She is so patient and understanding in working with the children that need a little extra help. She makes things fun and is always there to answer questions. We are grateful to all that she has done for our daughter. And that's it, thank you. Thank you. Next up is James Stickle. Uh, James Stickle, 191 Walnut Street, and I'm a junior at the high school. Good evening. 16 months ago, many members of the community spoke before this board in support of naming the field after Westwood High School's number one fan, Vito Tras. The board responded by changing policy 7250 with a unanimous vote allowing facilities to be named after members of the community who have had connection to the school district and have served as a role model. Since then, we have continued to move at a snail's pace with an inconsistent, disorganized process. In January of 2020, the Board of Education requested an accompanying regulation be made for this policy. Now we sit here over a year later and we start waiting for this to be adopted. I find it very strange that since 2007, policy 7250 has existed with no accompanying regulation. But suddenly when the community asks you to name the field after Westwood High's number one fan, now it's necessary. Does the board really lack this much school spirit? After the board sat idle on this matter for over a year, in October, I put in a formal written request to name the field after Mr. Chess. I attended November's Board of Ed meeting where the board said they planned to act within a month or two with a vote. Later to find out the following month, the regulation was just starting to be drafted despite promises that had not fallen off the board's agenda when it was discussed last June. After several months, I finally received the facility's naming application, which I submitted within a week of receipt. On this application, I signed acknowledging that I understood policy 7250 and the associated regulation, yet no such regulation presently exists. Now on the agenda under old business, it appears there will be discussion on the adoption of this regulation. Why is the regulation not already adopted, yet my application has been accepted? I don't know why the board did not adopt a regulation before the creation of an application process. I sure hope the regulation being discussed tonight is not based around what I included in the application. Sharing this application has already been accepted by the business office. I believe it makes sense for the board to move forward and vote tonight. The process made on the fly by the administration and the board of ed is unlike anything I've ever experienced. It's so confusing and disorganized as every month something new is added to the ever-changing process. How has there been no regulation in place for the rest of the building of facilities named within the district over the past 54 years, but only now it is needed? The board could have taken the simple step to name the field after Westwood High School's number one fan over a year ago, but chose not to. Why has it taken the board so long to simply vote on this matter, despite being provided with sufficient information on Vito's life and how much of a role model and inspiration he was to the students? I truly hope you can finally vote. This has taken way too long. I sure hope it doesn't take this long for the committee to be formed and the dedication to be planned. 
Additionally, last March, the superintendent stated on behalf of the Finance and Facilities Committee that committee selection process would include both the township, the borough of Westwood, different school district members, and members of the school committee. I hope we move forward and include our students and community members on this committee as promised. I don't find it reasonable for the committee to only be made of board members, many of whom never knew Vita. Myself and 520 others are counting on you to name the field after our number one fan, Vito Trask, at the home opening this September. The Westwood Regional School District has always promoted Cardinal Pride, but when it comes to naming something after the school's number one fan who supported district students for as long as the schools operate, I don't understand why the board lacks the same spirit and pride instilled in the students. According to policy 7250, in naming schools and facilities, the board shall strive to honor the traditions and high ideals of the district and community it serves. Vito undoubtedly honored the tradition and ideals of this district and had such a love for this community and the students. Will the board strive to honor the traditions and high ideals of this district and vote to name the field after Vito Trask? I truly hope you can make the community proud tonight by voting in favor of naming the field after Vito. You may delay, but time will not, and lost time is never found again. Don't put this off until tomorrow when you can do it today. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next one up is Mo Smith. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for taking the time to uh, take our uh, call. It's uh, Tom Smith at 424 Center Avenue, Westwood, New Jersey. Um, number one, uh, I'm going to piggyback on what the young man just said. Um, let's vote to name the field uh, for Mr. Trous. Um, my question, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, if you can answer it at the end, if a board member just simply makes a motion on the, uh, on the naming of the field in his honor um, and somebody seconds it, can there be a roll call vote on that? Or is that not possible? If that question makes any sense whatsoever, hopefully it does. If that would kind of um, maybe pick up the pace on this a little bit, if somebody wants to make a motion, go ahead and make it. The last thing that happens, the worst thing that happens is that the motion gets shot down. Again, um, I'm not so sure the rules are for that, but just throwing it out there to an interested board member if that's possible. Um, and I, you know, I kind of hear another topic about reopening the schools and in the middle school, the in the high school. I don't want to pit K through five through six through twelve, but sometimes I kind of feel like that's going on. And we should be looking more district wide as opposed to just the elementary school just the middle school, just the high school. I fail to understand how kids passing in a hallway for three to four minutes, whatever that might be, is a detriment to the um, spread of COVID if, if possible. Um, you know, if it takes, what is it, CDC, uh, 10, 15 minutes of face-to-face -face contact, well, it's not even possible if you're crossing through the hallway. I don't know. I, the math kind of works out for me. So how many cases, and this is a question, and I know it's not gonna be answered, um, but how many cases of spread were there within the school district from student to student, from teacher to student? I think if we all kind of look, we all know. Again, I brought up the coaching of football this past year. We had a couple of kids that um, had family members who then did get sick and home but they never transferred to the teammates. And I heard a couple of cases, another couple of sports where it was never transferred to other teammates. You're never going to know unless you try. I don't want to get anybody sick. I don't want to bring them, bring it home to another family member or another, or, you know, an elderly family member. We all want to protect everybody. I get it. You know, we're starting to get vaccinations in and, and whatever. You're not going to know unless you try these things. I, I failed to see the issue with giving the kids in the middle school and the high school, this, the, the more time, just like the element, again, I, I, maybe I'm looking at it differently because I do have a middle school student, but I'm also looking at it district wide. Let's open them all up and see what happens. You know, I, it's, 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 and it's, I know it's a very popular, unpopular opinion. I get it. I understand it. And I'm okay with that. And sometimes it's okay to be unpopular, but I kind of feel like there's this dividing line between K through five and then six through 12. We should all be looking at the district together to open up the schools. And I guess maybe if I had a kid who was in one of the elementary schools, I'd probably look at it a little differently. I, I probably would. But I'm looking at it from a person who's been watching this go on now. I had a kid who was laying on the floor the other day. Hey, buddy, how's school? Uh, awesome. You must be doing real great. Let's try something. They want to go back. 
when was the last time you heard kids saying, we want to go back to school full time? Let's take advantage of that and strike while the iron's hot, right? Let's get them in school. Let's do it before they forget what they asked for in another year from now. So I thank you for your time. Side note, instead of thanking individual staff and, and, and whatnot, thank you to everybody who shows up every day to do the job that they signed up for in these bad times. The Smith family appreciates it. The Westwood, Westwood Regional School District family also appreciates it. We thank you so much. Stay happy, stay healthy, and just please vote on the veto Trous um, naming issue. It make everything a lot easier and you guys would be a lot more popular in town. Thank you, I'm done. Thank you. Next one is Ara Window. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening Board of Ed. My name is Ara Wendell. I live at 526 Howard Street in Township. On behalf of many of us in the parent community, many in CAPS, um, we are so grateful towards our staff and administrators. I am honored to be able to read a whole handful of many shout outs from our parents across the six schools. Um, starting at the high school and the district administration, Shout out to, and I apologize in advance for any mispronunciations, um, Mr. Fritz, Mr. Urbervinich, Ms. Maroney, Ms. Winters, Ms. Androff, Ms. Stout, Ms. Martello, Mr. Chen, Ms. Rashid, Mr. Connolly, and Mrs. Lyons. Thank you for keeping all of the kids at Westwood High School on track and making them and safety your first priority. These kids always feel supported and heard, and this is important, thank you. Um, the next one for the high school is thank you to our amazing ninth grade teachers, Mr. DePerry, Mrs. Androff, Mr. Carnival, Mrs. Mankin, Mrs. Mall, Ms. Lefrieri, Ms. Campagnon, Ms. Daly, Mr. Travallis, Ms. Sullivan, Ms. Stout, Ms. Bertrillo, and Ms. Deluzio. Uh, your continuous support and understanding for your students speaks volumes. You have all made a very difficult year much better. Thank you to Mr. Michael Piedra Diaz and Special Services. You have been such a help to our family and our son. We want you to know that we appreciate everything you do. Also in Special Services, a big shout out to Mrs. Sheila Burney in uh, Special Education Services. Your support throughout the last two years has made it possible for our son to grow on his educational journey. You have made such a positive, positive impact on him and we couldn't be more grateful. Thank you. Thank you to Mr. Connolly and Dr. Gonzalez for all your support in keeping up school spirit during these most challenging times. From your weekly updates to the student and staff needs, you are doing an amazing job and we are so thankful for you both. The decisions made alongside with the Board of Health during this pandemic could not have been easy ones. We appreciate you. We know you are looking out for our children's safety and your staff. Shout out to Mrs. Antanasio, Ms. Deluzio, Mr. DePerry, Ms. Holter, Ms. Menken, Mr. Bervinich, Ms. Tarabakia, Ms. Stuffis, Ms. Stout, and Mr. Travallis. Your dedication and passion towards your subject and students does not go unnoticed. Thank you for your patience during this exhausting year of teaching and learning. Your compassion towards our children and peers speaks volumes of your character. Thank you, thank you, thank you. May you not have to stare at ceilings and LED lights for much longer. <laughs> um, to the staff at Worms, shout out to Mrs. McGovern, Mrs. Cooper, Mrs. O'Grady, Mr. Levesque, Mrs. Castellini, Mr. Castellini, and all of the Worms staff. Our daughter was so excited to be in the middle school and she's lost out on so many things she was looking forward to, having a locker, having all her friends together but you teachers have stepped up. You've made this year fun and productive for her. They haven't skipped a beat and that is amazing. To Mrs. McDonough, Mrs. LaForgia and Mr. Corso, thank you for your ongoing support. You have not only made your students feel comfortable about coming back, but the parent community as well. You have been extremely supportive when we need to make changes to the in-school slash remote status. We know this is not an easy thing to track. Um, a big shout out to JFG teacher, Mr. Donatello. 
Mr. D, this is from Sean and Arawindle. Um, if you are listening to this, uh, we wanted to let you know that you went above and beyond last March through the June 20th, uh, June 2020, to keep your class engaged during the pandemic until the very last day. From your hey, hey, it's me, it's me, good old Mr. D announcements. Thank you for your videos, your quick replies, your virtual tours, and anytime our daughter needed help. This could not have been an easy job for you. And to the custodians throughout the entire district, thank you for your dedication to cleaning and maintaining our schools. You may think that no one notices your hard work. We don't see it, but we know you do it. Parents know your tireless efforts and that you put into keeping our children and our school clean. Keep up the good work. On behalf of many parents within our district, thank you, Westwood Regional School District, staff, and Board of Education. Thank you. Next one is Angela Bolmanski. Hi, Angela Bolmanski, 98 Kaufman Drive. It's me again with my three topics. Um, this time I'm coming to you semi-prepared. Um, with a few resolutions uh, of some sort. First topic, this COVID pandemic is here and we have to learn to live with it, adapt to it. Um, it's ongoing and not going away anytime soon. We need to find some sort of resolution, which is why I'm here today. It takes me to topic number two. Time is passing and we need to do something. We're five steps behind. Um, the district, what is the district currently? and? I'm sorry, the district, what are, what are the district's current and appropriate measures you were for referring to in reference to the teacher survey on the last board of ed meeting regarding returning to five days safely? I, of course, like most parents I know, want the teachers to feel safe, but what measures um, is the district currently taking daily to provide the safety of each teacher and offering it to, um, that, that we're offering in the survey. Uh, maybe some kind of resolution can be a HEPA filter of some sort. I don't know what the teachers are looking for, but I think we need to ask them how they would feel safe to go back um, five days. My third topic, Dr. Gonzalez, you mentioned last month, the survey that 22% of the elementary school children were full remote, which leaves 78 in person learning, and that the high school was 74% full remote and 26% in person with class sizes being an ongoing issue and obviously the building size in the elementary schools being a lot smaller versus the high school and to abide by these six feet apart, has the board considered other options like maybe having the elementary school children who are 78% in person go to the high school and then have those 26% in-person high school students go to the elementary school. I mean, I don't know, just some kind of revolution, uh, resolution. Um, I feel like we just can't sit here stagnant. Um, and then here's my gibberish. Okay, so the last thing as I wanna say is, um, it's not what you do in times of glory, it's how you react and lead in times of crisis. And this is a crisis and we're all in this together. We're never gonna agree, it's like politics. We're not gonna agree on everything everybody says, but we need movement. We just need some kind of movement together. Um, and I do believe that you all have the best interests of our children and reopening and our community. And I don't have to um, praise our teachers because they know daily I tell them how much I appreciate them. And it's just sad that I cannot just give them the hug that they truly need from us. So it's all verbal, but um, I think that's, it for my little spiel and um, please vote for Vito for the love of God, give this guy the name of, of the field. I'm, I'm for it. Thank you, have a good night. Thank you. Next one up is Melissa O'Sullivan. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Gonzalez and members of the board. Dr. Gonzalez, while I appreciate your presentation tonight and speaking about the next phase, we really need to stop talking about the next phase and actually start implementing it. Speaking as a parent of a kindergartner, I am very concerned about the lack of in-person learning that is taking place for our young children. To be exact, our kids have missed over 200 hours of in-person instruction so far this year. 
This amount of time cannot be made up and it's very concerning as their foundation is built in the early years. Our kids are struggling both emotionally and academically. And quite honestly, it seems as though we are very content with how things are and there is no urgency to make a positive change. I'm sorry if this seems harsh, but as a parent and educator myself, I am extremely frustrated and disappointed in my school district. Our district has all of the protocols in place to make our schools a safe environment for our kids. And yet I find myself wondering daily, what is the holdup? Why is our district so behind the others? I feel that back in the fall, you gave us all a false sense of hope that our kids would return in January. While we were all feeling quite hopeful that our kids would be attending in person for five days, you later decided to throw the Cali index at us. Why are we using this? I know that the health department hasn't mandated that you use this because many of the other neighboring districts have either been five days since September or have since gone back to five days without using this index. You've placed a roadblock for our children that is simply unfair and you can no longer simply say, our district is different from others. The bottom line is our kids need to be in school with educators, learning and catching up on what has been missed so far. Lastly, I'm also beginning to wonder what the plan is for September. I'm hoping that you realize the hybrid model cannot continue for another year. While I realize that masks, distancing and shields may still be needed, our kids need some sense of normalcy back and a full return to instruction must be part of this. Many schools around the country have found ways to keep their schools safe at full capacity and we need to do the same. I would also, I also would be remiss if I did not mention that my dissatisfaction with how in-person learning has been handled should not be confused with my overwhelming satisfaction and appreciation for everything that our teachers are doing. I know that my daughter's teacher in particular, Mrs. Shell, has been working her very hardest to make the most of a terrible situation. She continuously goes above and beyond to make the best of things. And I am extremely grateful. Thank you for your time tonight. Thank you. Next one up is uh, Narhan. Um, Hello, can yes. you hear me? Okay, yes. that, it's Irene Fenargian. Fenargian, sorry about that. That's okay, help me laugh instead of the tears that are coming out of my eyes. So um, I'm at 446 uh, Hoover Avenue in Washington Township. Um, this issue of reopening public schools has without fail divided this community in ways that will likely be felt for decades. The decisions for reopening clearly does not represent the majority of families as reflected in the survey results from families. We have respectfully advocated to these elected representatives throughout this homeschooling COVID lockdown. How else can the families in Washington Township and Westwood that you represent express the need, not want, the need for an immediate return to full in-person learning? Families, and I continue to stress families because that is who you've been elected to represent. Families have completed surveys, written letters, made calls, but it feels like all of this is falling into a void of indifference. I want to remind everyone that prior to this lockdown, removing a child from the classroom or school was a punitive action. Despite your use of the word safety does not change that fact. How much safer can we be with a 99% survivability? One might say that there isn't enough information on long-term effects, but to take punitive action against children ahead of this information lends question to whether the children are the focus of this team. As the primary purpose of schools 
is to educate children. There may have been a lot of effort toward reopening and children succeeding in homeschooling, but effort does not equate results. I am very appreciative of my children's teachers and principal. That, it, that should not be a factor, but national and international studies are plentiful, echoing the disaster befallen our children. The passivity of this board in allowing the situation to continue this long is heartbreaking and short-sighted. My last point is, I am not asking for any family to give up their option to take their to keep their children home, but for my children and all the other children whose families are being advocated for here to keep and return to their entitlement to a public education. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I actually just want to mention that we have uh, reached the hours, uh, Mr. Parapato. Uh, how many more? I see nine more hand raises. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine more. Um, want to go to maybe do a little straw poll and just, just get the will of the board on continuing? Do you want to still... I'd like to just move right. to extend the public forum. Okay. I'll second, second Andrew's motion, please. Okay. Just for the for the nine that are up only, or I, I think we should cut it off at the nine okay. hands that are raised. So just I guess show you roll call. You want to show hands? What do you want to do? We could do a show of hands. Okay. Just the nine, right? Correct. Okay. So the next one up is Jason and Carrie Sardina. Hi. Hi, everybody. Thanks for letting us speak tonight. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, this is Jason Sardina. I live at 715 Amherst Drive. Uh, so first, we'd like to say thank you to all the teachers, staff members at Washington School. You all continue to work hard during these circumstances. Uh, but for the past six months, we've been asking the same question. Why has every other town in the Pasig Valley region figured out this appropriate plan to get the younger students in for more in-person instruction? The question continues to remain unanswered and answered with vague vagueness claiming our uniqueness. So tonight, rather than ask the same question, let's like to read off a list of the vast number of schools in Bergen County that have figured this out. They're coming four to five days a week and announce the March return date at least. They go as follows, Mawa, Oakland, Franklin Lakes, Ramsey, Wyckoff, Midland Park, Waldwick, Allendale, Upper Saddle River, Saddle River, Hohokus, Glen Rock, Montvale, Woodcliffe Lake, Hillsdale, Park Ridge, Old Tapan, Harrington Park, Northvale, Norwood, Rockley, Alpine, Emerson, Oradell, Karlstadt, Ridgefield, Wallington, Demarest, Paramus, Preskill, Tenafly. I can name more. There's 38. It sounded like you know, in the beginning of the, of the call, you were even questioning the efficacy of the vaccine. It seems like the views are very pessimistic and geared toward the district's initial stance. There's a lot of talk about the schools that have the same hybrid model, but not, about, not enough about our neighboring towns that have figured it out. We just wanna say that our children deserve more. Thank you for letting us speak. Thank you. Next up. Jen Senecola. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, my name is Jen Senecola. I live at 392 Colonial Boulevard in Washington Township, and I am going to continue with the staff shout outs. The first one is actually from my daughter, Mackenzie, and she wrote it herself. My name is Mackenzie Senecola, and I'm a third grader at George School. My teacher is Mrs. Purcell, and she is outstanding. She makes learning fun and is always there when I need her. She plays fun two o'clock scavenger hunts that involve my whole family. I would say she is officially the best teacher in the world. Uh, for Jesse George, I have to thank my, uh, Mrs. Macera, my son's first grade teacher at George. She has gone above and beyond since day one. She's so warm and loving with her students and really wants to make learning fun for them. 
My son walks into school with a smile each day and comes out with an even bigger one. Thank you. Next is Ms. Schneider. A big thank you to Ms. Schneider. My son is fully remote. She has truly went above and beyond to make them feel like part of the class. I don't know how she does it with a group of kindergartners in class and on Zoom at the same time. She manages to get it done and engage personally with my son. Her efforts, efforts are recognized and very much appreciated. Ms. Vazanek truly gave her all and made students feel so calm in a time of such high anxiety. I will never forget when Mackenzie was having a terrible day, she offered to meet her outside our house for a quick hello. Shout out to Mrs. Salvi and Mrs. Stiles at George School. They have both done an outstanding job this year. Thank you for making school fun and educational for my remote learners. And thank you for our outstanding school administration and other George School staff who have been working so hard behind the scenes to ensure a successful school year. They say it takes a village and it sure does. Thank you for being part of ours and the tremendous impact on our children. Ava and Aiden have been in the district since pre-K. The teachers, the aides, and all the staff that have been involved getting them to first grade has given them such a strong foundation. This year we have been privileged to Mrs. Williams. Happy birthday, Mrs. Williams. What a blessing. She has continued giving my children the love and support they need to move along and build their confidence in these crazy COVID months. Shout outs to Mrs. Scaduto, Ms. Duda, Mrs. Shell, Ms. Williams, Ms. Birch. Westwood Regional School District endlessly gives love and support to so many students, not just mine. The district's dedication and support to these children in the most difficult circumstances shines in each and every smile, even when they're frozen on Zoom with internet connection problems. Westwood Regional Middle, Middle School, grateful for the patience and dedication of my son's teachers at Westwood Regional Middle School. Also grateful for the crossing guards in our district. After the snowstorm, I saw a crossing guard by the middle school and one by Brookside shoveling out corners to help our kids. Such dedication. Shout out to Ms. Morrison at the middle school. Thank you for your constant dedication to our daughter, Alexa, when she needs further explanation. You give her ample time, push her to apply her best efforts and take time out of your day to offer her support. We know this current teaching model cannot be easy, but you take your students' well-being and needs into strong consideration. Thank you for helping her understand social studies better as she always looks forward to attending your class. You totally rock. Berkeley, shout out to Mr. Furriello, Berkeley president, principal. He goes above and beyond to make sure our kids are safe and provide all that he can so our kids have everything they need. I love our principal. And a shout out to his sidekick, Mrs. Gonzalez, who is on top of everything and it always makes herself and children feel welcome. Shout out to Mrs. Portelli, Berkeley's art teacher. Her assignments are such a wonderful creative outlet for the kids. My son is in fifth grade and loves seeing what the next assignment is going to be. Brookside, shout out to Mrs. Acosta at Brookside. She is so energetic and enthusiastic as, kids, as she keeps the kids engaged while making learning fun. Mrs. Acosta genuinely cares about every student and is so understanding about their individual needs in these crazy times. We truly appreciate you. And my last shout out is for special services. Um, shout out to Mrs. Fox. Christopher thinks you are the coolest sly fox. And we know with you in his corner, he will get a wonderful education. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next one is Jill McManus. Hi, good evening. Thank you for allowing me to speak. I'm continuing with the shout outs from various families within the district. First, I'll speak about staff at Washington. Shout out to uh, Mr. Gold. Sorry, can you just uh, address? Oh, sorry. 283 Beach Street, uh, Township of Washington. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, shout out to Mr. Goldman. Anytime I have to rush to pick up kids, he is super sweet and helps my daughter carry the lunch. He also is one amazing teacher. Thank you to Mrs. Kropanicki who has had all three of my children. She's very organized, highly engaging, and truly gets to know each learner at their level. She is truly amazing and has inspired my daughter in so many ways, both personally and academically. Shout out to the amazing teacher she is and outstanding human being my children have been blessed to know. Shout out to Mrs. Karn at Washington School. She loves her kiddo so much and is such a caring, loving teacher. Both my girls adored her. Shout out to Mrs. Fodor at Washington for doing a great job with the kids. Brookside School. Shout out to Miss Bella Femini at Brookside. The kids are engaged and having fun while they learn. She always follows up and they feel cared about, even from a distance. 
At George School, Mr. Rachapi, your enthusiasm, patience, sense of humor, and love for teaching has not gone unnoticed. The students are lucky to have you as their teacher at George School. The students are definitely going out with a bang with you as their teacher. Thank you for your time and dedication when working with Grace. She has connected with you and strives to do her best because of your help and encouragement. I just want to say how impressed I am with the teachers my girls have had during this and how they have handled this whole pandemic. Between this year and last year, we were blessed to have teachers who stepped up and persevered. Last year, Ms. Masera, Ms. Mosery, Ms. Wunschel, and this year, Ms. Kirkby, Mr. Donatello, Ms. Cause, they really all worked hard to help my kids stay engaged and kept me in the loop on anything we needed. Because of these teachers, my kids are still learning and growing despite all of the obstacles remote learning presents. And the special teachers too. Mr. Lipnick, Ms. Shin, Ms. Mendez, Ms. Farinella, Ms. Breen, and Mrs. Beacon. At Berkeley, shout out to Mrs. Fodor for a great job with the kids. And at the preschool, thank you to Mrs. Brockner and all the teachers, paraprofessionals, and staff at the preschool. Thank you for your kindness, patience, and for keeping our little ones safe during this difficult time. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Next one up is Sean Yershuler. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. My name is Sean Yershuler, 38 Leicester Avenue, Westwood. I appreciate you taking the time to listen to me tonight. I'm going to read an FAQ from the New Jersey School Board Association website. What is the role of the school board and the superintendent? The school board has a dual role to represent the concerns of the citizens, taxpayers, and parents of the school administrators, and to represent the needs of the students in the district to the citizens, taxpayers, and parents of the community. The school board does not operate the district on a day-to-day -day basis. That is the job of the super, who is the district's chief executive. Rather, the school board sets the policies, goals, and objectives for the district, and it holds the superintendent responsible for implementing the policies and achieving the goals. The reason I mention this FAQ is to comment is to clear up any potential doubt that current board members may have regarding their role and who the shot callers actually are. I will be frank and say this, the district voted all of you on. We voted you because we felt you'd, be, you'd have our backs when push came to shove on things like this. You are not only the voice of our kids, but also the teachers and admin as well. If the teachers are scared or nervous about a return, we need to know what can do to, what we can do to help and ease their concerns. If teachers need masks, PPE, homemade air scrubbers, gloves, cleaning supplies, thermometers, et cetera, et cetera, it needs to be voiced that we can handle this business for the district. We get a list at the beginning of every school year with all the supplies teachers require us to buy. Let's not be shy now. I would gladly donate my time and money to creating a safer environment for not only the kids, but for the teachers upon return. That all being said, I'm asking the Board of Education to go to bat for the majority of families who want more in-person education for their kids. Regardless of how you feel about the current state of things, part of what you signed up for was to advocate for our children and the families within the district. Let's set realistic goals and objectives for return to more in-person education and hold Dr. Gonzalez responsible for achieving these goals. You may not agree with us, but the people have clearly spoken via the many district surveys that were sent. We want our kids back in school five days a week. What may be working for you is not working for us. Please put aside your personal beliefs and listen to the outspoken families who are not able to continue down this path. If you don't want your kids back in school due to safety concerns, that's fine. You can continue with the subpar hybrid model or full remote, but we want more. We will no longer be complacent, especially for our littlest of learners. This has not only been a severe impact on our children's mental and emotional health, it has put a huge strain on families as well. I thoroughly dislike paying the equivalent of a second mortgage payment every month to offset where the district has fallen short. Unfortunately, families like mine have had no other option but to think outside the box in order to maintain our child's educational progress. I wish the district would do the same and stop being so complacent. This is not good or great, and it is barely mediocre at best, and our kids deserve much more, especially from a blue ribbon school like Berkeley. The start of the school year was to be my little guy's first year in public school at Berkeley, joining his older brother who's currently in third grade. We were optimistic last year that it would be a great experience for him, but when the plan was rolled out, we realized that it was not good enough for us. Currently, my five-year-old goes to school full-time, five days a week at a private school in Paramus. 
They have the same amount of kids per square foot that Berkeley has in kindergarten. They get to play on the playground, have tons of social interaction, and to top it off, eat lunch together. Why is it that our littlest of learners were not given top priority knowing how crucial these first years of education are? Why is it that we have to quarantine Valentine's or not allow our kids to play with playground equipment? Why is it that indoor sports get shoved in our face via the Westwood Regional School District social media page, but my kids can't have gym in class in school? Why wasn't there a push from Dr. Gonzalez to work with each school district and use some outside the box thinking to get these kids back in September? Last but not least, if we are not opening the school for the full-time instruction by the end of the school year, I beg the Board of Education pushes for a better remote learning system for September, no matter what the cost. The current setup is weak, flawed, and a total waste. It would have been better for kids to be working in a workbook and spending less time on a tiny computer screen that not only affects their mental health, but offers a subpar option for their progress. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Next one is Heather Syra, Syra. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, it's Heather Cyrus. I know that W kind of throws everyone off. <laughs> um, I live at 2580 Cleveland Ave in Washington Township. And I'm here to just give some of, just to tell you guys some of these amazing shout outs for these amazing teachers and staff. Um, at Jesse F. George. A special shout out to Mrs. Yuri and George School. Thank you for helping Sienna gain confidence and for pushing her to always do her best. We are so grateful for all that you do. Shout out to the JFG, JFG custodial staff at each school. You are amazing at keeping our school safe and clean while keeping everyone healthy. Thank you for all your time and efforts. Thank you to Ms. Groats, fourth grade teacher at George School for all your hard work and dedication to these students. Um, at the high school, thank you to Ms. Campion at the high school for being so helpful to Felicia with algebra. She is supportive and kind. She also provides so many resources to help the students. Thank you also to all the high school teachers for working so hard, keeping the students engaged and on top of everything, as well as being flexible. We appreciate all that you do. Um, at Berkeley, shout out to Ms. Tachi in Berkeley. She is patient, caring, and her love shows through her work. Thank you, Ms. Tachi, for showing Mateo he can do it and never giving up on him. Our teachers are the frontline workers for our children's future and deserve all the support in the world. Shout out to Ms. Lepore. We appreciate all you are doing. You are so special and have connected with your students in a wonderful way. Elena loves being in your class. She is learning so much this year. Mr. Danny and the custodial staff, thank you for working so hard to keep Berkeley clean and safe. We appreciate you. Um, at Worms, Mr. Levick, Mr. Castellini, and Mrs. Cooper are phenomenal teachers. Their patience and drive for teaching is top notch. Thank you so much to Ms. Fabricini and Ms. Forgiva, Mrs. Forgiva, sorry, for welcoming our girls back to the middle school when they transferred out for a brief period. They made them feel like they never left and went above and beyond to make their transition back smooth and enjoyable. And my last is to special services. Thank you, Ms. Hayden, who was a district OT for being such a huge support to my son. He always looks forward to seeing you and have, and you have provided him so much value for the, for, you have so, you have provided him so much value to his progress. And I just wanted to say thank you all to the board and, you know, Dr. Gonzalez, you guys are doing an amazing job. And I know these times are difficult, but you are trying your best and we know that and you're doing everything you can for our children and we truly appreciate it. So thank you. That's it. Thank you. Next one is Douglas Cusato. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Hi. So there's two of us. It's my husband, Doug, and myself, Adrian Duganzik. Okay. Uh, 2430 Cleveland Avenue, Washington Township. Okay. I'm a parent who wants my children in five days a week. I have a kindergartner, first grader, and second grader in the school district, and I want what is best for my children. Quite frankly, I'm sick of the toxic positivity the district and schools present. Don't know what that is? It can be defined as the excessive and overgeneralization of a happy, optimistic state across all situations. 
the board members, administration, administrators, and families who are telling me the hybrid method is working and kids are thriving are not in my house watching my children suffer with the at-home portion of this so-called quality education. I cannot be optimistic for you and your plans as you have not demonstrated any growth. Last spring was a terrible display of education, but you got a pass because this was uncharted waters that we were all treading water in. I was hopeful for the fall that the kids were going back five days a week as you're giving the parents who wanted to be remote that option. Why should my children's needs not be met like the others who wanted a remote education? But it wasn't. I thought they can't truly think that hybrid's going to work, but at that time, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt because of course, I am not a certified teacher. Yes, September was an improvement from the previous year, but still not enough. Then comes parent-teacher conferences, and I was told my kindergartner was not where she should be at this time of year, but it was okay because the entire class was behind. To me, that was obvious. Already having two kids complete kindergarten, I was already aware that she was behind. Then we have report cards and I look at my kindergartners and she receives threes for everything. For those that are not aware what threes mean, it is stated as meeting standards, successfully meeting state grade standards. I was completely shocked that in a matter of a month, my hybrid kindergartner was now all of a sudden on grade level. We also haven't done specials, but we're given threes for that. So I would like to think you could understand my concern as to how my child is truly being evaluated. Are the grades being fluffed and goalposts being moved? So on paper, it looks like this method you are praising is working when in reality, it is not. I reached out to the teacher about it and then the principal because I could not comprehend what was actually going on. The principal stated that she was not penalizing parents for not doing the work in the special section. Excuse me, but why would you even think about penalizing a parent for not doing schoolwork during so-called school hours. My children receive no formal education from 12.50 to 3.20. I am told 2 p.m. is mandatory for all remote students and optional for hybrid students. So my hybrid kids have no teacher interaction for two and a half hours. I'm very confused as to where my tax dollars are going in an education system that my children are missing 12 and a half hours a week. The district is being dishonest to families and again, hurting the kids and proving to me you are not putting them first. As I stated earlier, I have the kindergartner, first grader, and second grader, all who struggle and cry multiple times throughout their at-home learning sessions. It is not developmentally appropriate and you're expecting kids that young to do something high school kids can't even do. My kindergartner doesn't wanna sit for her Zoom calls and turns her back to the screen on a daily basis. She is sucking her thumb or telling her teacher often that she is bored. The videos she is told to watch, she plays them for 10 seconds only to scroll to the end and tell me she is done. She is nowhere near where her siblings were this time of year and the year before. Did the district as a whole lower their standard whole lower their standards for the children? Then you have my son, a second grader, who last week during your great idea of virtual learning is working, instead of giving actual snow days, was stomping his feet and crying multiple times, as well as proceeds to tell me he is terrible at school. Mind you, he has basic skills every time he is home and the one hour cares tutoring weekly. His confidence by default is impaired, yet frequently I walk into his workspace and see him in tears because he got behind and felt he couldn't ask for help or slow things down because he can't stop or communicate fast enough with the teacher. Take a minute and try to understand the discouraging feelings such a situation creates for my child. Take another minute to think about what that does for my child's current and future mental health. I didn't choose remote learning because it's not best for my children. You gave families within the district the opportunity to grow remote. Why have I not been given the opportunity to send my kids to school five days a week? I find it very disheartening that you board members and administration can look at yourselves and justify your decision and not allowing the children to return to school five days a week. If my example of the children's behavior is not enough for you to envision, I invite you all to my house to observe how well your so-called virtual learning is actually going. We are not on the same boat. I choose to put our children front and center. I'm not telling you to send your kid back if you are not comfortable. I'm asking for the opportunity to send mine. Keep your bias aside. I can't sit here and applaud your lack of care for the district students when you are stagnant in place. When comparing our district to the surrounding districts, I do believe that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. What I do believe in is that you need to water the grass where you are standing. By not moving forward or finding another way to improve our education within the district, we are not watering the grass. You're going to destroy it and that I cannot and will not watch. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, is... Uh, my husband, Doug, is gonna speak now. Okay. Mine's shorter uh, because I didn't prepare because I was actually 
working and taking care of Horton and math and everything else today, like some of us. Um, so basically, you know, I wanted to first commend the board of directors or the board of education from last month. So what I actually started to see is a board of education that actually reflects what parents in the town look like and sound like. That's a really important thing as we elected you. And, and I suggest just more of it. You constructively challenged each other. That's a foundation of a, a high-performing team. And we expect that from you. We expect you to be awesome. We don't expect you to be good. We expect you to be awesome. And that's the only thing. When you look at the approach that we're taking towards school, I don't have anything really great to say other than it's shattering the value of living in this school system, number one. And number two, more importantly, our children. Think about what this means to living in New Jersey. One of the biggest reasons to live in New Jersey in a, let's say, household like myself with young adults and some children, it's because of schools. We would move. You don't need to pay taxes like this. You can move out of a, a state like this and pay much lower taxes, but the schools in New Jersey are great. We are ruining that as we go through this. Ask yourself this question. Why are the local private schools all with certified teachers doubling their capacity for next year? It's because we are going to move our kids. I've signed my three kids up to leave. When that happens, now think about and remember what happens. The revenues link with these students leave as well. That has this long lasting impact on resources, the wealth in the community, all of that. It's not something like a commodity sale that you can throw at a flyer and get it all back. You decimate this for long durations of time. Positions for educators will go away. Cool stuff for kids will go away. And it will stay there. If you don't want to take my word for it, look around New Jersey. This has happened in so many towns. It will happen here if we keep going this path. I, I wish I had something great for you to, for, for, to change this. I don't. I, I sponsor everyone that really is said to bring the kids back to school right away. If you told me today in an email, a phone call right now, I could send my kids to school tomorrow, not be socially distanced, I would do it. I'd be standing there tomorrow morning with all three of them packed up with their lunch ready to go. It, it makes no difference to me. In short, we need to fix this. We need to fix this now. And we have no excuse otherwise to do so. We as adults are voluntarily watching this happen every day. Every single day we watch our kids do what they're doing. And we, we willingly know that they are not getting what they constitutionally are supposed to get. That they are, this is something everyone got growing up. We are as adults ripping that from them. Tell me why we would want to do this. I get it, COVID, it's scary. I had it, my kids had it, my wife had it. It's, it's not fun, it's crazy. But the percentage of people that actually have the negative impact from this is minimal. You look at the health of everyone else involved in this, it's also bad. If you look at people's anxiety, everything else from watching our kids do what they're doing, stack that up against the odds of somebody getting COVID and really having a problem, Sorry, I, I beg to differ with that. So in short, again, I just ask you to really look this, look yourself in the mirror. Ask yourself if you're doing everything you can. And if you aren't, think about it again. Fix it, please, soon. Thank you. Thank you. Next one is Dr. Squirza. Thank you, D Dario Sforza, 664 Hickory, Washington Township. Nearly 80 years ago, 15-year-old Karlstadt resident entered Beckham Regional, formerly known as East Rutherford High School. By the beginning of his junior year, approximately 17 years of age, November 1943, the world was a very different place, a place that required brave Americans to sacrifice everything they held dear to their heart in order to protect our freedom. He created one, a world far more different than he could ever imagine. What would have been his senior year wasn't so pleasant. Instead of English class, he was captured by the Nazis and held prisoner of war under horrible and horrific conditions. Perhaps this is why Vito spent the remaining years of his life giving his heart and soul to the Westwood Regional School District community. It gives me tremendous pleasure to be able to address our community's number one fan, and I want you all to listen loud and clear. One fan and war hero, Vito Trous, an advocate for an advocate for the naming of the Westwood Regional Football Field after Vito. For those of you that don't know me, I am the proud superintendent of schools and high school principal 
of Vito's former high school, now called Beckton Regional High School District. Since many of you, with the exception of the high school principal, were absent from the historic renaming of Ridgewood Road to Vito's Way, even though it now sits directly outside your office, I will be glad to share some parts of my message I gave that day. As a superintendent and principal, one is given tremendous opportunity to make decisions that will make a difference in a student's life from the age of one to 93. And because of a chance encounter, I had that opportunity to meet Vito and offer him a high school diploma in a covert mission we dubbed Operation Vito. After that graduation a few years ago, Vito never stopped calling me his principal. I think because he couldn't pronounce my name. The funny thing about that is he probably never knew how fond I was and how I became as his student. Like many of you listening today, I will forever cherish my conversations with him as they were some of the best leadership and life lessons that I ever had. Throughout this pandemic and global and national crisis, I have used these lessons I learned from my conversations with Vito to lead my soldiers, my organization and school community through this global crisis and battle of our lifetime. This historic time in our lives has reminded us to never take the simple freedoms in life for granted, especially our right and our children's right to a fair and equitable education. Similar to Vito, I too am the son of Italian immigrants who like Vito endured the many cultural struggles that come with growing up in an immigrant household. But the beauty of my story is because of heroes like Vito, I wasn't forced to change my last name like him. And now I am, even in the midst of a national crisis and an American nightmare, able to prosper and have my entire school community prosper from the hope and what is their right to the American dream. Ladies and gentlemen, my mission today is to ensure that my students get a robust education at five days a week in person. And Vito's mission was simply to make sure he spent a lifetime carrying on the legacy of his fallen soldiers, advocating for his fellow veterans and reminding that the world that freedom isn't free, pal. And attending nearly every Westwood athletic event for over six decades and doing it with a smile every single time. Let's be honest, a change to a simple policy or regulation is the least we can do. The renaming of the stadium to Vito Trouse, Westwood's number one fan, will not only ensure his spirit and life live on forever, but will also be a reminder to all students and parents before that couldn't attend their games that it's okay, Vito's there, still there, their number one fan, and it's all okay. As you can see, Vito may not have had an official doctorate, let alone a high school diploma until a few years ago but he had an education and way of living that far surpassed anything we can adequately simulate in schools. Vito knew that titles don't create leaders, relationships do, which takes me to my next topic. Listen, I truly did not want to get involved in the day-to-day -day business of another school district, but because my three children attend this school district, I have a moral obligation to speak up. I sit here today nearly seven months later. I'm shocked at where we still are, or I should say where we are not. Districts all around us are operating at five days a week, perfectly fine with, with in-person instruction, including mine. As the chief executive officer of my organization, while I value my staff's opinion, I do not blame them for not opening schools. I listen to all stakeholders, especially my parents. I don't create arbitrary guidelines, I lead. It is my responsibility to mitigate the virus and my responsibility alone to mitigate the fear. I do what's right for my constituents. Otherwise, I, as the chief, am not needed. As for, as for the comment made that risk is not lower when community spread is lower, that is simply a false truth. There's no correlation between community spread. Discord's up, sorry, I have to, your time's I'll up. End with, I'll end with this, if Mr. Rosado. When I received the honor of being superintendent, video gave me one simple reminder. No matter how high up the ladder you climb, never forget about the people you serve or they will forget about you. I can only hope and pray that this board and administration does some serious reflecting on the important items I discussed this evening. Because if you continue to ignore and damage relationships with- Dr. Dr. Squarza, I'm gonna ask. Damage, we will forget about you. Thank you. Good night. Uh, Last one up is Andrea Gersmeyer.
Good evening, Dr. Gonzalez, Board of Ed members. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Andrea Gersmeyer, 450 Kindercomack Road, Westwood. First, I want to say how uplifting our school district community has been in supporting our administration staff and especially teachers with posts on social media and these amazingly beautiful shout outs organized, developed, and delivered by Ara Windle. Thank you so much for your spark of joy that has such a deep ripple effect on our district. The positivity is greatly appreciated by all. Please keep spreading the joy. In January, I posted on Facebook and wrote an email to the Board of Ed about the need for decorum and how there are some of us who haven't been as vocal about our opinion in agreeing with the administration's decision to proceed with caution concerning going back to school five days a week. There has been a lot of chatter on social media and during BOE public forums about how some are calling our administration's decision to utilize the data from the Northwest Bergen Regional Health Commission and the Cali Index in developing their reactionary plan as quote unquote arbitrary. Since everyone can agree that this pandemic is a catastrophic crisis, let's for a moment compare our administration's role during this crisis to the role of the mayor of Key West, Florida, or even the governor of Florida during a catastrophic hurricane bearing down on the state. The governor and mayor will look to the National Weather Service and their wind severity index called the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale to gauge the projected damage capacity to the storm may have on their state in order to develop their reaction plan to the impending storm. As, have most, as you have most likely seen on the news, this index is categorized using wind speed, wind speed severity ratings of one through five, as well as a color-coded system, which is very similar to the Cali index using a color-coded system too. The Cali index is color-coded to indicate and rate the level of severity of COVID transmission. I don't think any of us would say Florida's governor or Key West mayor is making an arbitrary decision by utilizing the information from the National Weather Service and the SAFR index in order to develop their reactionary plan to keep their population safe. In comparison, our administration is currently doing exactly what le leaders should do during a crisis. Look to the data and use the data to develop the best proactive but cautious plan to make sure their population remains safe. Also, many have compared our district to other surrounding districts who have decided to push forward into sending their kids five days a week. As Dr. Gonzalez stated, please remember that every district has a unique combination of circumstances and variables that they must take into account in order to determine their eventual course of action with no districts being exactly alike. Every district must look at class sizes, classroom capacities, number of classrooms, HVAC systems, or lack thereof, number of COVID cases, rate of transmission, et cetera. We cannot just say, well, these towns have opened to a five day a week, so we should too. In fact, many other five day week districts in the county have had to completely shut down several times this year, while we have only seen one district wide pause. The commitment to the hybrid model has kept the doors open for almost the entire year. Do we chance increasing the risk of transmission with more major shutdowns by entering a five day a week plan too soon, which in turn could possibly cause us less in-person instruction than before. Again, using the data available is our administration's smartest way to answer these questions and continue to balance safety with in-person instruction. Lastly, I would like to read my shout out about how outstanding Berkeley School has been through this pandemic. I would like to honor, thank, and give a standing ovation shout out to all of the Berkeley teachers and staff at the most incredible school. Thank you, Mrs. Stewart, Mrs. Georgiatis, Ms. Taki, Ms. Gemke, Mrs. Preciado, Ms. Lepore, Mrs. Hogel, Mrs. Procarpio, Mrs. Poggi, Ms. Ross, Ms. Cassica, Ms. Adkins, Ms. Binder, Ms. Sabah, Ms. Schott, and Ms. Counselor for going above and beyond every day for our children. Your tireless work does not go unnoticed. Thank you to all the aides in our classrooms who also work tirelessly besides our teacher. teachers. We are grateful for all you do for our children. Thank you to the special education, ESL, speech, basic skills, and G&T teachers, Ms. Ashinsky, Ms. Brennan, Ms. Fox, Ms. Houck, Ms. Zacker, and our guidance counselor, Ms. Massara, who make sure our children are lifted up and continue to gain ground with their education and confidence. Thank you to all our special teachers, Mr. Barbieri, Ms. Eliason, Ms. Lietze, Ms. Portelli, Ms. Yu, and Ms. Arojo, who continue to be creative and engaging and motivating our children in the arts and lifting their spirits. Thank you to our amazing nurse, Mrs. Peterson, and our fantastic custodians, Mr. Danny Castro and Mr. Raimundo, for continuing to do everything they can to keep our children and our school safe. Thank you to our cafeteria staff for their continued efforts to make sure all our children's bellies are nourished and full. 
And finally, to the two people at the helm of our Berkeley front office, our beloved Ms. Gonzalez, who is always there for and helps all our children and to our beloved principal, Mr. Fiorello, who continues to keep our ship on the course to success. We can't thank you all enough for always going above and beyond whether during a normal year and support you. Please know we truly appreciate all that you do and are doing to create the best year for our Berkeley children. We are Berkeley proud. Thank you. And thank you to the board members and to Dr. Gonzalez for doing all you can do for keeping our children safe and providing the education we can at this time. Please everyone keep safe and stay well. Thank you and good night. Thank you. And that is okay. everyone on the list. All right. Thank you, Mr. Rosado. Um, at this time, uh, Dr. Gonzalez, would you like to answer what you can? Yep, uh, just beginning uh, with the beginning. Uh, there is a number of questions regarding um, what the school district is doing with regards to uh, preventative measures uh, to keep our staff safe, uh, specifically regarding air filtration, inspection and ventilation, uh, teacher feedback, um, hiring additional teachers, relocating classrooms and purchasing more PPE. Uh, on the topic of air filtration and inspection of our ventilation, our uh, HVAC system, or I'm sorry, our, our unit ventilators in all of the classrooms, you know, from the start of the summer throughout the course of the year have been continually uh, maintained and filters have been continually changed uh, actually in advance of their typical maintenance routine in order to ensure proper filtration and air exchange in the classroom. Um, as referenced in the finance facilities report, uh, we also in, engage the services of our environmental consultant uh, to conduct an indoor air quality uh, assessment as well as uh, update our indoor air quality program to ensure that that ventilation continues. Um, we're looking forward to the uh, results of the report uh, to ensure that we are receiving proper ventilation. Um, once that report is available, we'll certainly make it available to the board and, and to the public. Um, teacher feedback, why are they uncomfortable? Uh, most prominently, they're uncomfortable because of the activity, the high activity and the high uh, rates of transmission out in the community at large. So when, especially we started talking about uh, next phase plans, um, it was at a time where the COVID activity level was continuing to increase. Um, so the concern about increasing the size of our classrooms and decreasing um, social distancing was what was probably most predominantly uh, cited as the concern. Um, as it relates to uh, PPE, all of our staff have access uh, to everything from desk shields um, to face masks, as well as face shields. Uh, we have uh, ample amount of uh, disinfectant and hand sanitizers uh, in place. And with the uh, implementation or the planned imp implementation of the next phase, we have at the elementary level purchased and received uh, individual desk shields for each student as well. Um, the key in all of this, and I wanna make sure it's uh, uh, definitely clear, is that the next phase, because the next phase eliminates a guarantee of social distancing, that is the reason why we would not move to that next phase prematurely. That is the one thing that is consistent in the research and the guidance is that social distancing is one of our primary measures for keeping our staff and students safe. So if we are going to keep our staff comfortable and safe, then that's the reason why we are not moving too quickly. Um, so there is uh, at this time, no additional need for PPE that we're aware of, but I also wanna you know, highlight that we have a, a fabulous working relationship with our staff uh, and an open uh, communication with our staff. So our staff communicate uh, openly uh, and honestly with their principals. And I am uh, always uh, accessible to our teachers as well as the, um, the teacher association leadership uh, so that if there's any concerns, we're able to address them uh, together. Um, again, there, there are several comments regarding bringing back uh, the desire to bring back students uh, sooner than five days or uh, five days a week sooner than later. Uh, and again, as I mentioned, that is something that we all desire and look forward to, uh, but we'll do so when we're able to do so safely as it relates to eliminating 
um, the social distancing. Uh, the question regarding the, the regulation, why it's not been adopted, um, and also just confirmation that the current application uh, is not uh, changing the regulation. So the current application is not changing the regulation, uh, but it is uh, certain creating the opportunity for the board um, to discuss this evening, uh, the process by which the application will be considered so that they could uh, adhere to the policy and consider the, the request accordingly. Following question was, if a board member makes a motion and it's seconded, can it be voted upon during the um, public, I'm sorry, during the old business portion, if a motion is uh, uh, presented to the board and seconded, it could certainly be voted upon. There was a, a reference to uh, offering a, a false sense of hope to parents in December when uh, the announcement, uh, suggesting that the announcement of the use of the Cali index uh, sort of came after the fact. Um, we were very deliberate in making sure that the, um, the reference to the Cali index in our implementation was always part of uh, our efforts um, to communicate staff to staff and families as well as to uh, gather feedback. And, and I, I just also wanna be clear that when we are gathering feedback for the surveys, it was to confirm what we knew to be the case, which is by the first um, survey that there was a desire for parents to increase in-person learning. But more practically, the second survey was uh, for us to gather the, the hard commitments from families so that we would be able to uh, discern the class sizes and confirm uh, our ability to either uh, create the six feet of social distance or eliminate the six feet of the social distance. So all of the data was used in our decision-making uh, for both moving forward as well as our ability to uh, implement the, the plan. Uh, many of the other comments that were made, uh, both the positive shout outs were, uh, were discussed um, as well as the reference to five days a week. Uh, there is a suggestion that the movement, uh, that the, there is no correlation to low community spread and, and transmission. Uh, I don't know what that's in reference to, but I, I could certainly say uh, directly from the, um, the CDC, uh, the language from their uh, principles, guiding principles, clearly indicate that implementing these actions in schools will reduce the risk of in-school spread of COVID-19, regardless of the underlying community burden, with risk being lowest if community spread is low and proven mitigation strategies are implemented consistently. So the plans that we've discussed and the intention to move with caution is based upon ensuring that the community spread is low and we're trying to implement the mitigation strategies consistently. But as I said, even with the social distancing that becomes challenging for us. Um, all in all, I just wanna conclude, you know, just to reiterate uh, that I appreciate all the feedback that, that we received during public comment or through emails uh, both positive and, and suggestive of, of new opportunities. So I thank everyone. Uh, I also want to uh, just share with folks in, in case people don't realize I am a father of three. I have three children who have yet to step foot. Actually, my middle school student just stepped foot in school a couple weeks ago and my high school students have yet to step in school since March. Uh, and that is not by choice, uh, but uh, it's certainly something that I can uh, appreciate and relate to the concerns, the frustrations, and the hopes and desires for our students. And I certainly share the desire for us to get everyone back in our school safely for as long as possible, as soon as possible, safely. So that concludes my responses. Thank you, Dr. Gonzalez. Okay, um, at this time, uh, we will move to the agenda. And we are up with administrative and governance. Uh, Mr. Rob Boudoud. I want to move motions A and B under administrative and governance. I have anyone, Ms. Hanlon? 
Okay. Uh, conversation. Okay, I saw Mr. Pontillo, your hand went up first. Yeah, I have a question with respect to uh, motion B. Uh, last month, we uh, made a motion for someone who, uh, who was leaving the school and they were going right away. Uh, I thought maybe this was the same people, but the student numbers and IDs are different. Um, I don't understand what makes last month's vote uh, different to this month's vote. Uh, we've just listened to a whole host of people indicate they're looking for space in our schools to put their children. And we have on the agenda here a motion that takes up space in our schools for people that have already left this community. Um, I, I'm almost speechless, actually. So um, I think that that needs to be taken into consideration on, on uh, motion B. Thank you. Any other, Ms. Price? Comments, Parrot, uh, Mr. Fontello's, um, we have students who wanna be in school five days a week, including some of our own children. And it's um, to have another student here that's not currently in district, taking a spot from one of our students is just not the right thing to do especially at this time. I see Ms. Hanlon. Uh, if Dr. Gonzalez could possibly let us know approximately when this kid left the district, because we're talking about just till the end of the marking period, not to the end of the school year, um, if I'm reading this correctly. Uh, it's just a finishing the marking period. So I think that is more what it's about instead of uh, trying to turn this into something else. The reason the other student from the previous uh, agenda had to do with the left and they would have wanted to stay till the end of the year. So I, I, perhaps uh, we can get clarification on that. Yeah, I was going to just take the comments and then ask him to, to if he can clarify. Um, so, Mr. Gersmeyer? Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, on the surface, can you make a, uh, a linkage to what we heard tonight? I can see how that can can be a, be a thought that some people might have, but we literally know nothing about these two ID numbers that are in that motion. So it seems a bit premature to make grand statements about something we have zero details about. And I would just caution against doing so in a public forum like that. Any other comments or discussion? Dr. Gonzalez, do you have any anything that you would like to add to this? Um, sure, this simply, point? yep, uh, uh, simply put, I, I would not compare it to the other um, situation, all of uh, our uh, situations are different and the circumstances regarding um, the motion last week is, is, is different on, on a variety of levels. This one uh, represents uh, consistency with our board policy. So uh, if our board policy indicates that we have the ability to offer um, this as the uh, resolution um, that's the reason why we are putting it on the agenda in order to comply with our board policy. Uh, and, and by way of my understanding was that the student did uh, leave at the either end of November or beginning of December. Thank you. Okay. Any more comments? All right, Mr. Rosado, can we have a roll call, please? Sure. Mr. Budaud? Yes. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mr. Gersmeyer? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Uh, Pontillo? Uh, under motion A, yes. Under motion B, no. Mrs. Price? Motion A, yes. Motion B, no. 
Dr. Romano? Yes. Ms. Assembler? Yes. Mr. Parapato? Yes. Motion carried. Okay, moving on to uh, policy, uh, Mr. Abodur. I'd like to move items A and B under policy. Do I have a second? Ms. Hamlet, thank you. Uh, discussion and comments? Mr. Pontello? Yes, after listening to the notes that came back from the policy committee with respect to item number seven and item number nine, uh, I know it was explored that we were going to seek a regulation from Strauss Esme. Uh, I don't find that to be an appropriate thing. Uh, this policy has been out, as we learned, for a decade, uh, and they don't have one. Um, I think that the biggest concern I have, and I know there was a recommendation of, of no changes to the policy, but I, I would think that any searches conducted under policy P3324 and P4324 uh, should not ever be conducted in front of students. And that is not specifically prohibited in the policy. So I think that the board needs to take that up for consideration. And if there's not gonna be an accompanying regulation um, that that be added to the policies. Thank you. Any other comments or discussion? Uh, Mr. Dr. Romano? You're, you're muted. So, see, thank you. It sounded great. So, uh, so, so pr procedurally, um, Mr. Rosado, would, 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 we would, um, if we wanted to, we could at this point just make a motion to table that just to explore that possibility? Wouldn't that, wouldn't, isn't that what would have to happen at this point? In other words, rather than letting, rather than letting it get to a point of voting yes or no. That's the first reading. Right, no, um, I, I understand, yeah. I understand. But what I'm saying, rather than, I mean, I'm saying you is- can, We can follow, you can follow through it and then someone can make a motion to table and, right. and someone second and voted. And if, if, if agreed upon, then it will be tabled. If not, it'll be moved. Right. Well, the then the next vote. Will That's be. A, yeah, that is a good point. It's, it's a first reading, so whether you approve it or not, you're not really approving it, and you have from now through the next board meeting to explore it before final approval, before adoption. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. So then. Um, Mr. Pontillo, are, are, are you asking that we table it or are you, are you okay if we, if we approve the first reading with the intention of asking policy committee to consider your request and, and, and report back before the second, before the, before the final reading and adoption? Uh, if I may, um, I, it, it doesn't necessarily matter to me. It's a matter of process. I right. think that when the policy is finalized, I mean, I can't, I, has any, does anyone here think that the request I'm making is unreasonable? Do we all agree that searches permitted under this policy shouldn't occur in front of the students? So yes. whether you do it in, in committee, whether you do it for the second reading, okay, I think the end result would then be the same. Right. And I think that solves one of the problems why I brought it up last month. So uh, either way, I guess you'd have to just get the wording for that specific sentence that would be added on but i think it would be pretty simple to say that no searches permitted under this policy shall be conducted in front of students period just that simple yeah so i mean i would make a motion that that be added to the policy if i'm allowed to do that um and we can kind of clean it up quicker but if i'm not allowed to do that then that's fine also thank you I, Dr. I, I, I think it'd be best to do for next if you're going to change. Yeah, I, 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 I was I was simply asking because for clarity because I, I was for me I, I I I would be I would be comfortable voting yes with this with the understanding that policy would reconsider the request and offer a suggestion between now and the next board meeting so that when we do the final vote, um, 
it would um, we would have we would either have that in there or not. So at least at that point, we could appropriately vote yes or no. So. Okay. So I'm wondering. I mean, can we get like a can we get a general sense of? Are you asking for a tabling, or are you? No, I'm asking. I'm asking. I'm asking if we could do. Maybe, maybe we could just do a straw poll to see how the board feels about. Um, I don't know. Maybe we can. I, 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 I guess. I guess everyone has the right have to. Have, you, yeah, everyone I has the right you, to comment between. Everyone has the right to comment between now. the motion and the vote. So. Okay. Yeah, this is just procedural at this point. Yeah. Before, right. Exactly. Before I go back to um, Mr. Pontillo, is there anybody else who who has? Um, a discussion or comment on this? Okay, uh, Maureen, did you know? I was gonna say, I mean, I, I, I agree with Dr. Romano, just I, I think what he's trying to say is that we take it back to policy, we discuss it and see if how we can word that in there and then present at the next board meeting and then we make a vote, yes or no, like officially on that policy. Is that right. what you're asking, Dr. Romano? Yes, I mean, so, yeah. so for instance, when, when you get to me, I would simply say, Yes, with the understanding that policy will reconsider and make and mm -hmm. and 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 and, and yes. you know, yeah, because we have we have to vote on a first reading mm -hmm. or table the first reading, and I'd hate to you know that yeah. it seems like both of those would be. It seems like the the tabling would be overkill if the policy committee simply will take it back, consider, mm -hmm. and 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 you know, like I said, the the, the more important vote happens next meeting. Next one, yeah, that's all. Yeah, so we don't have to I be agree. obstructive. To Patella. Okay, I, I I just was going back to you. Okay. Yeah. No. Thank you. I'm, I'm good. Okay. All right. So, is there any other comments or discussion about anything else under policy? Okay. Mr. No. Rosado. No call. Uh, Mr. Abu Dawood. Yes. Mrs. Colombo. Yes. Mr. Gersmeyer. Yes. Mrs. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Pontillo. I'm a yes for uh, everything except uh, number 10. I'm a no. Administration of medical cannabis. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Price. Yes. Dr. Romano. Yes. Mrs. Sembler. Yes. Mr. Parapato. Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Next up, personnel. Ms. Hanlon. Yes, I'd like to move agenda items A through T. Okay, do I have a second? Mr. Abudud, thank you. Uh, discussion and comments. Okay. Um, was that a hand, Mr. Gersmeyer? I apologize. I okay, uh, Mr. Pontello. Uh, with respect to section I, uh, I was just noticing that, uh, and it reads that upon recommendation of the superintendent, approval will be given for the appointment of the following substitute aides at the rate of fifteen fifty per hour for the twenty twenty one school year, pending criminal clearance and medical requirements. Um, again, uh, you know. Forgive me for uh, being new, but uh, process-wise, I think that the rate of pay of fifteen fifty an hour uh, for a school aid is terribly low, and I think that uh, you know we should probably take action as a board to try to raise that. You know, there's discussion of, of making a fifteen dollar an hour minimum wage, and I certainly think the contribution of the aids to the district far exceeds uh, that rate of pay. So, um, I, I guess. In essence, I'd like to make a motion that we discuss a new rate of pay for uh, for the age of the district under Section I. I know that speaks specifically to one for the hiring, but I think that uh, that's something that needs to be adjusted. Mr. Rosado, can you just clarify yeah, procedurally? Just, just for clarification, um, the the rates of pay uh, for the hourlies are uh, approved at, were approved at the last May board meeting um, after the budget. We'll, there will also be um, approved at the uh, upcoming board meeting for the following year. Um, and the 
also the, the rates of pay for the aides are on a sliding scale. So I think that's a year one, but this is the substitute rate. This is a substitute aid as a verse, verse uh, a permanent aid. There's a different scales on, on those. Um, and which would be kind of in line with uh, the substitute rate of pay for teachers as well, so. Thank you. Any other discussion or comments about personnel? Mr. Rosado, roll call, please. Mr. Abu Dawood? Yes. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mr. Gersmeyer? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Pontillo. Yes. Mrs. Price. Yes. Dr. Romano. Yes. Mrs. Sembler. Yes. <clears throat> Mr. Parapato. Yes. Motion carried. Thank you. Uh, moving on to finance and facilities, Mr. Gersmeyer. I'd like to move items A through F for finance and facilities as listed on the agenda. Do I have a second? Mrs. Hamlin, thank you. Uh, discussion and comments. Uh, Mr. Abu Dode. When we go to vote, I just want to clarify on item E. I wasn't part of the board when there was a punch list asked by the security specialist. Uh, Mr. Miller, I wasn't here for that. I opposed publicly the security vestibules. So I just want to make it public again that I'm still opposed to the money being spent on it. And I think there's other ways to remedy that. So I'll be voting no on E. Thank you. Uh, Mrs. Price. I have a question in regards to A. And please forgive my being new to this whole process process but there's an item of 15 I'm sorry 1.5 million dollars but my question is what what does that encompass as far as line items so in other words basically where where's the bill for that number so there's actually that's the total of the whole bills list the check register that that's in there so it encompasses all the bills. <laughs> it's not okay. one particular item. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure I didn't make a mistake. You know, that accounting in my house would go out the window. So um, I do have a question um, also, again, because I wasn't here for any of the initial conversations uh, about for, for number for letter E. Um, and, and I, from my experience, which has been in different districts um, where we've had a full-time security officer in every building, if not multiple in some cases, um, having a, a, an entryway system of, for an intruder to be stopped does make sense in the absence of a security officer. However, it doesn't address the bigger concern, which is securing the areas where the students congregate the most, which would be the cafeteria, the gymnasiums and the like. Um, so this doesn't seem to solve a potential problem of, a, of, a, of an intruder, an active shooter situation in the case where they're, if, unless they're coming through the front door. Um, so is there um, a mechanism or do we have something in place to also um, uh, take care of that pot potential um, opening, or is this the only thing in the in our agendas for the future of our, our frontline security for our buildings? Um, th this item was addressing the your front entryways and the uh, the the vestibules for entering into the building uh, for off hours for individuals. When I say off hours, uh, outside of the the morning traffic and afternoon traffic, so it's during the school day. Um, doesn't does not address anything else at this point. Um, there was this was part of the uh, initial budget dedicated for that primary concern. I could add, uh, Ms. Price, the the district has over the years uh, made additional investments 
in our surveillance system, our uh, access, uh, remote access system, uh, both uh, hardware and software to unify all that together. Uh, we've made uh, investment in, in rekeying the district uh, and being able to uh, update all of our, our doors and locking mechanisms. Um, and, you know, as well, investing in both the security specialists and in updating our security plan. So, so this is not our, our one and only, you know, um, measure. Uh, but it's certainly one of many that have occurred over the past several years. Thank you, uh, Mr. Pontello. Uh, I, I did not see a bills list uh, with respect to motion A. Um, I don't know if I missed it in the uh, 200 pages or so since last Friday. Was that sent out for uh, as, as part of an attachment? Uh, and if it was, I know that there's other times where we link uh, things directly onto the uh, agenda. It'd be nice if, if stuff like that could just get linked in so you don't have to go searching through the emails that have been sent. Uh, with respect to motion E, um, I, I believe that the security vestibules are, are man trap doors, as they're commonly called. Is that correct, uh, Ray? Okay, so I, I think that... Um, the man trap doors are something that are commonly used to uh, keep people from escaping prison. And I think that there's something that is uh, really a false sense of security. If you think about uh, the, the real estate, if you will, around a building on, on any given side, uh, you have many first floor windows, you have many first floor doors uh, and stuff like that, that wouldn't be protected uh, with this. So, <clears throat> spending a million dollars um, to put these in place is really nothing more than a feel-good measure. Uh, with respect to technology, there's a whole host of technologies out there that I've seen, um, some that I've used, just to give you an example, one of them is called GXP on scene. It's grid overlays and stuff like that that map out schools and, and stuff like that. They work very well in uh, helping locate emergencies and getting services to those emergencies in a much faster fashion. Uh, and they're at quite a substantially less cost than a million dollars. Uh, I just can't see where in, in the times of uh, the financial uh, times that we're in with COVID and all the uncertainties where it would be a prudent decision to put a million dollars towards uh, the man trap doors for the aforementioned reasons. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Ms. Ha Ms. Hanlon, I saw your hand go up. Yeah. The the man traps that we're speaking about today are something that was um, uh, a desire of the community. Um, first of all, this was something that uh, we've been working on for several years. Uh, it was uh, put off because of the middle school project. We obviously needed to get the middle school done first. The middle school already has this man trap. Um, it is something that was also developed with uh, our security specialist for the school district. Um, while I, you know, understand concerns of some of the newer board members who weren't part of the initial discussions, and I, and I respect the fact that you know you weren't part of those. Um, you know, uh, I, I'm going to disagree with you not to put them in. You know, I, I believe we need to put them in at this point. It is something we have, we had promised community we were going to do. They do have a purpose. And while we can have differences of opinion of what each one of us thinks is uh, something we'd prefer to see, or, um, you know, uh, we, we did spend a lot of time deciding on this and, and looked at all the things that we could do. And uh, I think that it, it is a, a the correct thing to do at this point to proceed with what we had already developed and and put aside money for. Thank you. Uh, before I go to Mrs. Price, is, is there anyone else who has a comment? Or uh, Ms. Sembler, we haven't heard from you. Can you go to the floor? Um, so I think last year when we first talked about this, um, I was very much in favor of anything that I thought um, would enhance the safety of our students. 
Um, I think there were several board members at the time, Joe, Frank, I mean, it made a couple comments. Um, and I started second guessing that decision. So um, after doing a lot of like research and considering um, other options and talking to other people in the community, um, I think at this point, um, I'm not 100% comfortable voting for this um, million dollar project. Um, and knowing that this is the best option um, for our schools. I feel like when talking to other administrators in, in other districts, we're only covering one entrance way, right? So if an intruder wants to come in, we've only covered the main entrance way with the security vestibule. It's not doing anything to protect the other entrances or windows um, along the building. And um, also, I was talking to you know some other districts such as Hillsdale that have class three special officers um, in their buildings at a rate of part-time rate of $30 an hour. So when doing the math and thinking about it, we can actually employ spe class three special officers in all of our buildings um, for the next five years for the same amount of money. Um, so at this point, I'm really not comfortable moving forward with motion E at this time until we re really discuss um, some other options. Thank you, uh, Dr. Romano. You're, you're muted. <laughs> uh, there's, there's just a few pieces to what I wanna say and I'll try to be as concise as possible. You know, uh, without trying to read people's minds, it, you know, it feels like <clears throat> at best we're gonna have a split vote here, um, like a five, four kind of thing. And, and, you know, I would hate to see that happen. What I'm wondering is, you know, are we just simply at a point where we could just take one step back and just maybe get a little more information for the entire board and have a board discussion about it so that rather than, you know, in public vote on something that just makes it by, by the skin of its teeth, um, as opposed to just taking a step back, maybe tabling it, getting some information, and then maybe next meet, you know, in the next meeting or so, approving it or not. And, um, and it just brings me back to I, 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 uh, uh, an idea that I think, I think Mrs. Price had presented earlier, just in terms of security. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Mrs. Price, I think, I think you said something about um, if you have armed security guards in place, it almost, it almost negates the need for the man trap, right? So, so you know, and, and, and I, I, had voiced some, I had voiced some concern about a year ago, similar to that. And, and so, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not against the uh, security vestibules, um, but I would love to just simply revisit the conversation so that we, you know, Dr. Gonzalez started to um, um, list for us, in you know, um, basically the highlights of the security implementations that that we that we've done up to this point. It would be nice to have a conversation about what exactly what we've done, how this plays into it, what the plans are after that. And I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that we've never done that, but it would be nice just to take a deep breath and and, and maybe have that conversation again because it feels like almost half the board needs that. Right. Um, and then as far as the security piece goes, you know, the good news is uh, when it comes to armed security guards and, and, and one time expenses like security vestibules, you can have both. They don't come from the same pot. They're two very different. You know, when, when you when you um, when you fund um, personnel. You might do something like a second question, which expands your base budget. Forever. Um, well, or until you modify it or you know reduce it. Um, you, 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 don't, you don't take money for a one-time expense and spend it on ongoing personnel. So you don't, you don't pull it out of capital reserve or out of your operating budget and, and, and hope that it's gonna be there in the following year. So, so my point is, you know, if we, I, don't know how long, I don't know how long it's been since we've had the last conversation about armed security guards in buildings. I don't believe it's been during my time on the board, but 
the beauty of doing something like a second question for something like that is that the community votes. If the community wants it, the community votes and the community commits to paying for it on an ongoing basis. Anyway, my point is that it feels like it's worth just taking one step back and maybe having a conversation with context before we move forward um, in the way that it feels like it's gonna move forward tonight. Thank you. So, uh, so in other words, like a motion to table, basically. Let, let's just get through. I, I saw uh, Ms. Price's hand um, go up. We'll get through the, the discussion and we'll make a determination on that. Thank you. Uh, and I, yep. I, I, you know, and I, I as a as as a health and physical education teacher, I I know that one of the things we're taught in our trainings is the first place they come is the gym or the cafeteria. So, you know, that's my perspective on on looking at this. But Dr. Gonzalez, I would I would appreciate, and I should have asked this question ahead of time. I apologize. I'll give that be my my last new member faux pas um, to gather more of that information from you ahead of time. So I'm better prepared for this question. I just think that we can, you know, um, this, where this may very well be a good tool. I just don't know if that's the best tool for what, what we need, not having all the information. Thank you. Okay, uh, Mr. Rosado, yes. I, I, I just want him to add something so it might change somebody's comment. So if we could just let him out before, Mr. Rosado. Just just wanted to let the, you know, I know this is, as uh, Mrs. Hanlon uh, mentioned, this was multi-year. Um, we had the architects, we probably spent uh, in total about $100,000 in this on this project already. I'm just letting the board aware of the right. financial impact that's already occurred. Right. Um, and the this is probably something that happened over a course of uh, multiple years. Um, and I know uh, Mr. Miller also was uh, in communication with um, local law enforcement about the, this as well in, 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 in recommendations, so. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, Mr. Pontello. I'm local law enforcement. I was never consulted about the security vestibules, but that's besides the point. Um, if we spent $100,000 to design five or six, uh, what would be five, I guess, right, uh, vestibules, uh, shame on us. And a uh, million dollars for a feel-good measure is, I think, way out of the realm. Also, we had an opportunity to have a closed meeting tonight to discuss these issues, but for some reason, we didn't have one. In addition, I think it's almost cavalier in a sense that a million-dollar expenditure would be put on here, and it's just almost suggested that we should say yes for it because it came from somewhere else when we were given no information. Again, like all the other items on here, we could have simply been given a link to the paperwork that was involved with the preparing of this so that we were prepared to have had reviewed it already in the past. That wasn't done. And I think that's a disservice to us as board members. So you can't really blame us for, for having an opinion about it and just saying no. So I just want to clarify um, the proposal and the amounts were given with to the prior board. And I know that precedes you, Mr. Pontillo. So um, that that was done and that was included in last year's budget. So this is money that's allocated in the budget uh, that the board approved last year. I, the board approved these projects. So I was under the directive of moving forward with the project. <laughs> so that's why it went out to bid. Um, Thank you. The um, as far as a uh, discussion in private, this is a matter that cannot be discussed in private. This has to be in public. Private session is only uh, for uh, legal personnel items uh, or sale sale of property. So that's why it has to come here, and that's why we said we couldn't discuss it in private session. So this is the time to discuss uh, any concerns. Um, I know the agendas went out on Friday. Um, and this resolution was on <clears throat> that initial agenda. I know, no, I, I didn't receive any uh, personal, um, anyone reaching out to me to ask any questions about it. I mean, I would have, I was available for questions at that time as well, <clears throat> personal questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Rosado. I have, um, in, in just the order I saw him go up, I have uh, Ms. Hanlon, Ms. Gersmeyer, and then Dr. Romano. So if I can get um, Ms. Hanlon, please. Yeah, first of all, I'd like to clear up the comment that you weren't, uh, that the 
<clears throat> current police chief of Westwood Police Department uh, wasn't asked about it because this was developed before you were police chief. So your predecessor most likely was, and that, you know, uh, let's not put that out there that you weren't consulted. I, you know, I don't want the public being led on to think that the board isn't doing its job nor administrators. There was a former person in your seat. That's a person who would have been consulted, not you. You, at the time, were not that rank, first of all. Second of all, all you newer board members, as um, I think Mr. somebody just brought up, Mr. Rosado, I believe, if there's something on an agenda that you have a question on, you need to reach out to the superintendent or in, or you could have reached out to Mr. Rosado about this instead of waiting till you're on the dais to ask that question. If you felt uncomfortable and needed more information, it would be appreciated to not do it this way. Um, and totally understand that you're, you're a new member. So please in the future, uh, you know, I strongly recommend to somebody who's been on the board that if there's something you don't understand, reach out, get that information for yourself instead of, you know, uh, coming this way and, and saying we'll get this information. It's our job as an elected official, if there's something that you don't understand or something you want more clarification on, reach out and get that clarification. You know, that would be appreciated by all of us so that we can have that good dialogue amongst um, the nine of us. Um, so that's what I wanted to say on that. Thank you, Ms. Hanlon. I had uh, Mr. Gershmeyer next, please. Yeah, I was just going to echo what Mr. Rosado just said about, you know, what we're allowed to talk about in the exec versus public um, and, and that the monies are already voted on and allocated for the fiscal year we're currently sitting in. So um, it's, uh, I mean, this is, this is, this was set in, set in place to, to, to start movement on it a, a year ago already. So I, I know it's, it's hard coming in at the, at the, uh, the 11th hour of the process as, as a new board member, but my main question for Mr. Rosado would mean this this doesn't is not no in no way timed to the budget work we have to do um, for the upcoming year because this is already this is already essentially not quite paid for but it's allocated and and the process has already started so I don't want to delay a project if it's set to start the summer if it's something that um, was already th there were many board meetings and the community was was involved and public forums and um in fact that actually came came about during a very tense time in, a, in with with the national news so it, it's uh and and i but i i do agree with with uh this is price um it it would be helpful for for especially the newer board members and for refresher for some of the rest of us uh if either dr gonzalez or mr rosado can can provide some of the, the other security measures that have been put in place the last couple of years as, as a recap. Um, I know like new, new door locking mechanisms, uh, th things, yeah, so, things to that nature that, that could just be helpful as a recap. So that, that's some, uh, one more thing to private session. That is another item that is private session that we, our security protocols, not projects that we've done, but some of our pr protocols are, that would be considered ex private exact session that we would be able to discuss um, any I'll defer to Dr. G. Dr. Gonzalez. Yeah, no, I just want to point out that I, I will forward to the board um, our security updates that we've uh, done over the past several years. Uh, typically, we had one a year, I want to say going uh, about three years back, just given the, the current circumstances, we, we didn't do one for this year. But uh, you'll, you'll definitely be able to see the 2018-19 security updates, um, you know, in those presentations. So I'll make sure the board uh, as a whole receives that. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Dr. Romano, I had you up next. Yeah. So, 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 so maybe I can make, maybe I can, um, make my question uh, a little more concise. Given the apparent level of discomfort, would it derail this project if we simply tabled it for one meeting in an effort to allow people to do the homework they need to do, um, ask the questions they need to ask, 
so that we can come to the table and simply vote on whether or not we're going to move forward with security vestibules as opposed to the whole host of other issues that are causing apprehension. Um, would that derail the project one meeting? We have 60 days to approve a bid. Um, right. The only other caveat I'd throw in there is, um, you know, delaying it to March 18th to the next board meeting uh, pushes us back 30 days, um, which will then push the project back 30 days. And the, the, the timing of the project is to coincide with the opening of schools so that doesn't impact the opening of schools if we are planning to move forward on this project. So that would be the only caveat I throw out there. So between now and so between this vote and breaking ground, which is going to be, I guess, the day after school closes, ideally, right? Right. Um, you're, what you're saying is th there's a whole list of things that needs to happen between tonight and the day after the last day of school in order for us to finish this successfully. So, so the answer is no, we could not table this for one more meeting without derailing the project. Without potential de de delays to the project, no. Yeah, it, it could right. it could cause delays to the project, which could okay. impact start of school. Okay, like I said, um, you know, listen, I'm I'm I'm, 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 I, I'm I think I'm, the other part of this is a lot of the projects and in, in, in these projects in the in the in the uh, construction itself, a lot of it is is renovating the, the new storefronts and creating new doors. So that's why it is expensive. You're creating new glass doors. Um, and replacing some of the older uh, doors that we do have. Um, so it is an, an improvement to the building as well. It's not just a security vestibule. Um, okay. I mean, so I'll just leave. You know. Mr. Fontillo. Can we get the drawings perhaps? You can actually see what these are, what they're like. I, I mean, I don't know. How, how long does this go back, Keith? How long, when did this project get bid? This started um, probably actually, uh, Mr. Pontillo, when you were a patrol officer and, and you came to those meetings right after New, uh, Newtown. Um, discussion on, on security vegetables happened then. Uh, it was a recommendation from- I, I was a patrolman in like 2001, Keith. Or, 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 sorry, you might've had a, a, a ranking. I don't know. I'm, uh, you're wearing a blue shirt. <laughs> um, with I still wear blue shirts, so. see? Yeah, but <clears throat> I, um, I think you were on the, with the SWAT team at that time too. Um, so around that area. Uh, but uh, this, uh, this has been ongoing uh, and has been a topic of discussion uh, multiple years. Um, and this is actually a two phase project. The last year uh, was the phase in, in, in getting the plans together and submitting it to the, the uh, state for approval. Um, with this year, uh, submitting the bid out for uh, um, construction. So it was a multi-year phase project. Okay, but I, again, I'll go back to my other point about, uh, you know, you're saying that security discussions would have to occur and, and closed. I mean, we could have had a quick certain, session. Certain about security this. items as far as what the certain items are enclosed, certain items can be discussed in public. So depending if we're going to discuss proprietary the, stuff related to security, I don't think that should be done in public. Yeah, so the, uh, but um, yeah, the plans are available uh, if you want to review them. I mean, they're, they're here. Uh, I think you know me well enough to know that if you're asking me to approve a million dollar expenditure, that I'd like to look at the drawings. That's fine. So I would they, love, I would love yeah. for someone to send that to me. Thank you. Okay. So where, where are we standing on this? Because we're, we're, in the middle of this motion, right? We're, we're, we're in discussion about it. Um, Dr. Romano? Well, I, I, I think what we're hearing is that, that we, can't, um, we can't delay one month because if we delay one month, it's highly likely that we won't get the project finished over the summer, unfortunately, because you know, regardless of how we got here, regardless of the why, there's discomfort, there is discomfort. And it feels like, a significant portion of the board, but we're hearing that we can't delay it. So okay. it sounds it sounds like there's nothing to do but vote, but that's just one that's just one person's interpretation. Ms. Handler, 
hopefully my computer won't freeze again. Um, could we possibly do a special meeting just on this item? One item, yeah. one week from now? That That's way, um, if, uh, out of fairness to newer members, they can look at those plans. Mm -hmm. uh, is that sound palatable, folks, if mm. we delayed it a week so that we're not really backing it up if we decide to go ahead with the project? Mm -hmm. We're not screwing the timeline so that schools could open on time. And that, out of fairness, would give uh, Mrs. Price and Mr. Frontilla more time to look at the project. That, that's my I think suggestion. that's... I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna take it an opportunity to speak and just say I do think that's fair, um, but a, a fair idea, Mr. Rosado. Um, procedurally, do we need to actually take a motion to table this? Okay, yes. okay. So, if it's okay with the board, I'd like to move forward here and with a motion to table, or can I get a motion, please, to table? Uh, Ms. Halen, I have one, and I, I have Mr. Yeah. Cook. I'll, I'll make a motion to table it. For I'll second and, it. And, uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I got Ms. Halen, and I had I heard Ms. Colombo with the, with the second um, uh, to 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 do that. So we can, we can have a roll call. Uh, Mr. Abu Dawood. Just to confirm, we're voting on tabling E. Yes. Tabling. E, then yes. E. Yes. E, yes. Okay. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mr. Gersmeyer? No, only with the, the uh, I, I can't even. Caveat. It's going to be a long night, Tabling. guys. Um, no, yeah, with the caveat, that's the word, but the caveat that we do meet within a week's time so we yeah. don't delay right. the project. Right now, all yes. the, the, motion, the motion is tabling. Oh, I, yeah. I'm not going to say yes. Uh, Come on. Yes, yes or no? <laughs> it's all I need. And you froze. Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Mrs. Hanlon. Yes. Mr. Pontillo. I'll agree with the motion to table it for now. Mrs. Price. Yes. Dr. Romano. With the hope of revisiting this one week from now during a special meeting. Yes. <laughs> Mrs. Assembler. <laughs> yes. Mr. Parapato. Yes. Okay, motion E is tabled. Before we go any further into where we are, and given respect to the time, I, and I wanted to do this a while ago, I just I couldn't find a spot, but I'd like to just uh, give Maximilian and Isabel the opportunity to to obviously sign off if you'd like, or or hang around if if you'd like as well. But I just wanted to make that formal before we we move any further. So, thank you. Okay. So right now, you still have on the motion uh, for finance uh, now A through. F minus E. Okay, A through F minus Z. And do we have any uh, discussion or comments on those items? Okay, can we get a roll call, please? Mr. Abu Dawood? Yes. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mr. Gersmeyer? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Parapato? Yes. Mr. Pontillo? Yes. Mrs. Price? Yes. Dr. Romano? Yes. And Mrs. Assembler? Yes. Motion carried. Curriculum? Oh, curriculum, Dr. Romano? All right, highly controversial. I'm going to make a motion to move items A, B, and C under curriculum and programs. And do I have a second? <laughs> uh, Mr. Abudo, thank you. Uh, discussion and comments. Okay. <laughs> okay. Can I get a roll call, please? Mr. Abu Dawood? Yes. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mr. Gersmeyer? Yes. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Parapato? Yes. Mr. Pontillo? But yes. Mrs. Price? Yes. Dr. Romano? Yes. Mrs. Assembler? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Um, with Mr. Vantillo? 
Uh, I have a quick question. Um, for some reason, and I guess I'll pose it to either Keith or Ray, isn't there a bid out right now for security vestibule project? That is the bid that was out. But when, when was the bid due? Um, last week it was, it was in, it was turned in, uh, oh God, uh, two weeks ago, actually. Um, cause I, I remember someone, uh, calling me, asking me about, it. I thought the bids were due in sometime in the beginning of March. No, the bids were due in the beginning of February. Security investor bid opening was on February 11th at 11 p 11 a.m. Okay. Okay, so we're going to move to, to old business um, right now. The, the the before we go to I guess discussion, um, what I'm going to try to do to keep this um, appropriate is I'm going to just go around the horn once we have a topic on the table um, and, and give everybody an opportunity to speak, and then afterwards, if, if anybody would like to add something new to the conversation. Um, what, I, what I'm trying to avoid is kind of the, the back and forth and kind of going over each other. Um, so we're, gonna, we're just going to try to do it this way. Um, if I come to you and I'm just going to kind of go more or less the order on the screen. If you have no comment at that point, you could just, you know, pass and I'll move on to the next person. Um, and, and right now, the, the first item that I have on the list um, is the discussion of regulation 7250 uh, for facilities naming. Um, you know, does, does, I'll open the floor at this point. Yep. Dr. Romano, I'm going to go on the order of my screen. You happen to be right on my screen. So it worked out perfect. Go ahead. So, um, so I, 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 um, I'm wondering if we might uh, consider making a motion to approve the, um, the recommendation for Vito Trouss, the Vito Trouss naming of the um, field, if the board through a straw poll would agree that that particular instance might serve as the perfect standard for what it is that we're trying to do. It's it, certainly, it's not due to pressure. It's not due to anything other than the fact that it seems to present itself as the perfect or one of the perfect standards for facilities naming. So we're not just sliding it through, we're gonna learn from it and perhaps take the time to craft our regulation without the time crunch of the veto trous thing, which is also a benefit, but that's not the reason for doing it. It's simply because it serves as a really good standard for what the work that we're trying to do. Um, and so I guess I'm not gonna make the motion right now, but I'd like to make that motion but I'd love to hear how everyone feels about that before I would do before I did that. Make the motion to to name the facility using it as an ideal standard for what we're about to do in terms of regulation work. That's it. Okay, Miss Miss Hamlet, I had you up next. Any? Oh sure. <laughs> you don't you don't have to go. You know this isn't like a, you have to go. This is just if you want to ask the conversation. Squared. <laughs> Mr. Gerstmann, um, you're on deck. <laughs> I, no disrespect to uh, Mr. Trous. I would prefer to uh, continue with the way they were, that we were setting up the policy and the regulation and, um, you know, continue in, in that light. This is, this is not about the person. This is about, uh, you know, making sure, you know, uh, we do do it right because um, it is the first time we'd be naming something after somebody who, who is not a board member or an employee. And, um, you know, uh, while we have received an application, it also is, um, we just created that, I, I, I might be freezing again, but we just created that application. So, um, and, and in the application had various things to it. Um, and even the person who made out the application himself agreed that he felt that there should be a full committee that looked at it. Um, 
So uh, that's where I am right now. Okay, uh, Mr. Grossmeyer. Any... Yeah, sure. Uh, one, Mrs. Hanlon, if anyone's watching Netflix in your house, maybe ask them to wait a few hours. No, I'm just messing with <laughs> But But in all seriousness, um, as I had given the committee report, um, it, a lot of times we, we have a discussion and, and there's a general consensus and we move forward and, and recommend up in the committee report. But we had a lot of different ideas in committee um, to the point where I think it'd be good to bring all those ideas here to the full group, which is why we're discussing it in old business. And this is all in regards to the regulation itself. Um, so as, as I said in the, in the, in the, in the committee report, there are really two options, either as the regulation is written, which would be to, to it formally lays out how a committee would be built with various counts of people from various parts of the community, various stakeholders, uh, some, some board members, some parents, some community leaders, some, um, if it's school specific, someone from that school, that kind of thing. And then the other idea that came out of committee was um, that the the, 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 the initial group that would receive the application and do first review would be the Finance and Facilities Committee since it is about naming a facility. Um, it's kind of lent, lent naturally to that. And then that committee could uh, invite various stakeholders to the, the next committee meeting where that would be part of that committee's agenda. Um, I can see the merits in both of them. Uh, I just do want to make sure the uh, the, uh, the third option that was there was that the application and the policy were descriptive enough uh, that wouldn't require a regulation and would just come straight to the board for approval. Now, I'm a little uncomfortable, and actually it was said in public forum today, having 100% board input and approval on something that affects more than just us. Um, and some of us have different roles in the community, others are more involved in the community, uh, community. others are new to the community. So I, I think it, my feeling is that it would be good to involve as many stakeholders as possible with the caveat, because I remember that word caveat, that I don't want it to delay the process too long trying to organize everyone's calendars to get together. So um, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's all, that's all, that's, I wanted to make sure I, I shared everything that we were all considering in financial facilities with the full group to help make a, a, a more informed decision. Thank you. So, so just to, to, before I, I go into the next person, just to, I kind of almost wanted to separate what, what Dr. Romano was suggesting to what the topic is as far as the regulation. So, so after all the committees had different opinions but it seemed to be the committee was the was the hold up mostly. Um, so I kind of was I thought that would be a good starting point for us. Um, and, and with respect to what Dr. Romano, I feel like that's let's maybe have this conversation and then we can move to that conversation. But you know, to to Ger, to to Mr. Gersmeyer's point, it sounded like it was either do we give it to finance and facilities, do we give it to the whole board, or do we take the recommendation of of the stakeholders. And the point I'm going to make is, is, you know, I don't know Peter Trouss and, I, and I'll be honest with you and I'm, and I'm, I'm trying to keep them separate, but this is what this is one of the driving forces. To me personally, I would love to have a, a committee of stakeholders in the community represented and made making that recommendation to us as a board to approve. It would go a long way with me. Um, that's how I feel about that section of the regulation as far as um, involving stakeholders. And Mr. Stickle himself um, was was a fan of that and was proposing that um, as well as, you know, we have board members, we're, we're talking about the process. To me, this is the process, right? Like, what, let's get this regulation and the next step is, is going to be finalizing it. So um, just my thought, just wanted to share before I moved on. Um, I saw Ms. Sembler and, and your, your Hand was up, and you were uh, next on the board here, Ms. Sembler. Yeah, um, to Frank's point, I agree with you, Frank. I don't think we need a regulation for this specific naming of the facilities. I think we have heard from the community, we have heard from our constituents, and you know, we can't be tone deaf. 
Um, I don't know how much more as a board, how many more people we need to hear from. We've heard from current mayors of both towns. We've heard from former mayors. We've heard from police chiefs. We've heard from students. We've heard from um, council members. Um, this has been going on since before Vito passed away. I think it's time to make a motion. I think it's, it's, it's past time um, to make a motion and let's see where this board stands um, because we're dragging this out. Um, for Mr. Stickle, I appreciate the fight that you have put forward. Um, a former board member, Steve Kalish, had started to try to change the policy, which we did get done. And um, James, I admire you <laughs> for, for your continued um, perseverance and, and showing up to every board meeting. And I think this board needs to give you an answer. And I think we can't give you false hope. We need to see where this board is at. And um, I think we need to take a vote and we need to see where, where we're at as far as naming this um, after veto. I think it's long overdue and I think it's well-deserved. And I think as personally, um, you do kind of need to put your feelings aside and think about the community and you need to listen to the community and you need to listen to the, to the public, whether you knew Vito or not. I, I mean, I had the advantage of knowing um, and being around him. Um, I know some of you have not, but I can't imagine, um, I just can't imagine anything, any, any more information that we could possibly need. Um, we have the application. We've heard from so many people. I mean, it's time. Um, I think we need to make a motion. So I just want to clarify just one thing, just, just based on just your comment, just real quick, just so we're on the same page. I'm, I'm not saying that I'm against the veto trust thing. I'm trying, uh, if we end up making a motion for that, great. I, I just think we need the regulation as well. I'm not saying one has to not deal with the other. So in other words, I still think regardless of what happens tonight with, with the field, that regulation piece still needs to be discussed and decided upon. Um, in regards. And then if we solidify that, that doesn't necessarily mean that we don't take a motion to vote. So it's, it's I'm trying, if I'm trying my hardest to try to keep veto out of the discussion about the regulation. And then we can talk about veto. If, if, if that makes sense, I, I apologize if it doesn't. Um, I, I will come back to you, Ms. Sumble, I promise. I just want to, to, to hear the um, the rest of the board. I have Miss Colombo. I, I, you're up on my. Yeah, uh, Matt. Matt, I think what you say makes sense. You're trying to separate the regulation from the actual vote for or for veto because the regulation, if this comes up again, right, guys? If we want to name another field or somebody wants to name, I don't know, the auditorium. I I don't know. This way, we have this set in stone. So that's like a step. So there's the finish the regulation, and then as far as so I I'm I'm kind of on the same page with you there. And then as far as the reg, as far as veto goes, um, I, I do like the committee. Um, I do like putting it to the stakeholders and I do like them coming together and voting on that. Um, if it comes to the full board, then I, I fall back on the old, um, the policy of waiting the three years. So I feel like if, if we want an immediate answer now, I would feel more comfortable if it's the stakeholders and, and the community that, that comes together and presents that decision to us, you know, that immediate decision. But if it's coming to fall on us to make a decision, I feel comfortable with the original policy of waiting the three years to make that decision. That's where I stand. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Price, do you have anything you want to add to this? Um, I'm going to actually exactly what Ms. Colombo said. It's if it comes down to regulation and policy and decisions, the three years is, is sort of there for a reason. And my heart is, you know, I, I know Beto personally. And, and, you know, so it's not like the, the emotion is there, um, but the regulation has to be clear and solid so that going forward that we don't, we, we have, we have a precedence we have already set in place for other things should they come up. Thank you. And and to be clear with the stakeholder thing, just so we're on the same page, the stakeholder, if we went with the stakeholders, they don't vote, they would be making the recommendation to us as a board 
and then we would be voting on their recommendation. Just just to clarify what how that's stated. Um, I have Mr. Pontillo. Uh, do you have anything? Yeah, sure. Um, I think that the regulation, and, and we discussed this in committee, I think the, uh, the biggest concern about the regulation was the establishment of the committee, the layers that it adds to the process, where those people come from, how long it takes to assemble the meetings, how long it takes to get the information back. When that information comes back, where does it go to? What is the appropriate place? You know, we were in finance and facilities. Uh, it's facility naming. I kind of thought that that would be the place for it to land. However, there's uh, larger implications, I think, from the naming of any facility in the district. And I think it needs to come back to the full board because of that. Um, but, uh, you know, when I look at the uh, actual policy with respect to, um, to this topic that was just changed, you know, we're adding so much to it that really doesn't need to be there. And I think it overcomplicates the process. I'm actually not a proponent of the regulation as it's written. Um, I'm, I'm not even a proponent of the, of the regulation. I think that Strauss S. May, there's a reason why they didn't have the regulation written already. Um, and I think that, you know, having a six page regulation for a, a three paragraph policy is uh, a little over the top. So uh, with respect to that, I, I would I, I think that we should shy away from an overly uh, elaborative um, regulation. Uh, as far as the application goes, I think it's a, a good thing to have in process. I think that any facilities naming application should be going through that type of process and vetting by the board. But at the end of the day, as the policy states, the board can vote to name the facilities for the district. And I think that that's where the decision lies. Um, with respect to veto, um, I, you know, I haven't really had time to review the application. Uh, I saw some of the excerpts of it that was sent by, uh, by Ray there uh, the other day. Um, so, um, you know, I, I think the arguments that have been made uh, in public session are compelling. And I think that the public session is the right place for people to come and express uh, their uh, the things that they're seeking from the district, whatever they may be. I think that's the best place for it because uh, everyone gets to hear it. It's not in committee. It's not in the back room. It's not, there's no chance for the telephone game. Everybody can make their own interpretation of the information that's provided to them. Uh, we've heard a lot of people come and talk and, um, I think they make a compelling case. So I think that, um, you know, we should probably do a straw poll um, about where this would head um, and, and take it from there. Uh, Mr. Gerstmeyer. This is just about the language of the policy as it stands. It's not to, to counter counterpoint anybody else's uh, thoughts right here. Um, it, it does say that no one will be no no such individual will be considered for memorialization in a school or facility name during his or her lifetime or within three years from this present unless supported by a two-thirds majority of the full board. It's talking about consideration. This wouldn't be a vote to do it. This would be a vote to consider it early. Just that's the way the policy is written. No, 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 no person should be, no such individual will be considered. Or within, you know, within three years from his or her passing, of a supported by a two-thirds majority of the full board. I think a vote to approve it is premature. It's a vote to approve the waiving of the three-year stipulation of the policy. That's that's I'm I'm almost reading that literally. Okay, uh, Mr. Abu do you have any? So we discussed it in committee committee was good with the regulation we wanted to add the and again this is based on the regulation so nobody gets up in arms as to who we're naming it after we discussed doing a background check and adding that to the regulation so i'm good with the regulation i agree with andrew it is a three-year wait time i'm happy that James not only got the application, but submitted it right away. But as Mike said, I didn't have time to review the full application. And I didn't know Vito either, but I don't think that matters in what we name. It's what the full committee would want. And somebody recommended that finance be the, be the ones to review and present to the board. I agree that as James said, that we 
have a larger committee. We get people involved, including the building principal, who should be involved in that process. There's a reason he's the building principal. And we then get their report, and then we make our decision. So mine is only making sure that the regulation gets that one piece added as our committee had recommended. Dr. Gonzalez, can you uh, clarify something for me with the regulations? Um, I know a lot of it's going around with the three years. The way that the, if I'm interpreting the regulation correctly, anybody can apply to, to name something after anybody they would like. There's a box that they check off whether it's been three years or not. If that application comes through and it's not been three years, it can go to a vote. It's one motion, right? And it would be yes, but you would need two thirds. Or it would be if they were passed for more than three years, then it's just a majority. Is that is that the way to interpret the regulation? Yeah, that, that's the way I uh, developed the regulation in order to address that uh, you know that potential for a double vote because to Mr. Gersmeyer's point, if to be considered is one step in the process, then you have to have a vote for that. And then if the answer is no, or if the vote is no, and you don't have the two thirds of the majority, then it, it, it doesn't go further. If the answer is yes, then you still need this other step to order to consider then whether or not you're gonna vote to approve, which wouldn't require the two thirds majority at that point. Um, so this was just an attempt to try and consolidate that together so that every application would be gin, con, uh, given consideration. Okay, thank you for that. Um, did I get, if I missed anybody, did I miss anybody? I'm gonna go back to, to, to anybody with another thought here beforehand. Okay, I see Mr. Pontillo, uh, please. Uh, so <clears throat> I, I think we're actually in the process of considering it, right? We, we sent an application to a student that wanted to make application to name the, the field after veto. Um, so it is under consideration. I think to a degree, we're actually splitting hairs here. Um, if we were to take a vote and two thirds of the people voted to do it, um, to, to name the facility within three years from the person's passing, obviously you already have a majority of the board who would wanna do it and they're waiving the requirement. So it would logically follow that those, that same group would be naming the facility. You know, I, I mean, I think that um, you could put it up in two separate motions, but the second one, if, if six people vote yes, is, is, is pretty clear what's going to happen next. So, um, and the, the policy doesn't speak to the application, right? That's part of the regulation that's not approved. So um, it's kind of interesting that the application's out there completed, filed back with the district, but we don't have a regulation on what we do with it. So that's kind of a, I think, a, a bit of a problem here. And we've put ourselves in a quandary because in, t in theory and in practice, actually, we're, we're considering an application that's been submitted and completed to name the field after veto before we have a regulation about how to do it. Um, so again, I'll go back to, I don't think we should have a regulation because the board can simply name a facility uh, if it so chooses. Uh, Mr. Apudu, I saw your hand go up uh, prior to right after Ms. Fontillo, and then I have Ms. Sembler, then I have Dr. Romano. So, uh, Mr. Apudu, I'm going to defer. I, I had a separate statement to make, but I'll, I'll wait. No problem. Uh, Ms. Sembler? Right. To Mike's point, um, there, there, we haven't been able to find any regulation for this policy on naming of facilities anywhere. Um, we don't need a regulation for this um, policy on naming a facility. Um, and especially, I don't believe we need a regulation in this particular case. I think um, the stakeholders have made their opinion clear to us of all the people we've heard from, of all the emails we've gotten, we have not heard one single person object to naming this field after veto. Not one. Um, and I think that that's pretty telling um, of the voices in our community. Um, I think the application as is, um, is over five pages long. I think it's five pages I have here and paragraphs and paragraphs um, about the value to students 
about his value to education, about his value to the school community, the significant civic contributions made, um, all of his accomplishments, we have everything we need right here in this application. Um, in addition to that, we not only do we have everything in the application that we can consider, um, we also have all of the um, public speaking and, and people that we've heard from and the emails. I think, um, you know, to Mike's point, we make a, I would like to make a motion um, to take a vote to see if we can accept this application as is without a regulation, which is not needed, which is not required, which is not anywhere. We can't even find one um, to name the field after Vito Trouse. And if we get two thirds, um, we don't have to wait the three years. If we don't get two thirds, we do have to wait three years, but then at least our students know where they stand. At least Mr. Stickle, we're not dragging him out dragging him through, giving him false hope that this is gonna happen before the three year time period. Does that make sense? Well, you're, again, I, I you're, it's a, you're making it about veto in my opinion, but I'm just looking to see the will of the board for whether or not we want a regulation. I don't think we need a regulation for this. Okay. The, I think there's a reason there is no regulation uh, just like there was no regulation for the policy that Mr. Pontillo brought up. I think there's a reason Strauss Esme does not have a regulation for this because it's not needed. Are you saying not a regulation for v for this veto or not a regulation for naming anything in general? I think at this point in time, I mean, maybe it would be something that I would consider in the future, but I think for this particular instance, we have the application, we gave him the application, we've all had time to review the application. I don't think we need now to delay the process and now make a committee of the same stakeholders that we've already heard from. We've already heard from these people. Um, now we're gonna delay it, make a committee, have them come to us <laughs> with a recommendation to name the field after veto and then have vote again later. Let's just have the vote now. Again, but this is about not just veto. This is beyond veto. This is about other people that are going to come through the system. So, so, so if we I want to Frank's point, if you want to bring it to committee to make a regulation, not the one that, you know, I don't think we were all in agreement with the one that came before us, um, then we can do that for future, for the future policy right, for, the, for future namings. But for this particular case, I don't think we need to delay the process. We've already heard from all of those stakeholders that would possibly be part of a committee. We're gonna get, those people are gonna come to us, they're gonna make the recommendation, and then we're gonna have to do a vote anyway. Agreed. Do vote now. So, so again, Ms. Sembler, I, I know, and I apologize if I'm, if I'm repeating myself, but there are two separate things on the table right now. Right now, we're talking about just the regulation. If, if when that closes, the topic becomes d doing veto trials, and that's what the topic becomes. But right now, I, we're trying to gauge where we stand with the regulation for facilities naming, taking veto out of it. So I'm, I'm not, I feel like it's being made that me or other people are not for him. That has nothing to do with what this conversation right now for me is about. This conversation for me is just about where does the will of the board stand with this regulation, um, which I felt after being on each committee that the major hiccup, not everybody's issue, but the major hiccup was what are we doing about the committee? Um, if there's other issues, that's fine. We can bring them up. Um, but but I just wanted to be clear that I, I'm not against what you're saying at all. I, I, I'm in I'm, a lot of what you're saying I'm in agreement with. I'm just trying to stick to the topic is the regulation. If we're, when we're done with this, if somebody wants to put that motion up, by all means, that, that can happen. Um, does that make sense to you? I, I'm not trying, I, I hope I'm not coming across as rude or nothing. I'm just trying to explain to you where I'm, my head is at, which is trying to get this in. So- And I think I, Frank, I mean, I guess he, Frank had said, you know, let's make it two separate, two separate things. Um, okay, Dr. Romano, you have the floor. 
You're muted. Uh, you're muted. Number three. Uh, should you have to be blocked out for a minute? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right. Go ahead. I just need food. I hope we could take five between this and the budget thing. I was thinking the same thing. Uh, otherwise, I'm gonna. I'm you know. <laughs> I can't be I can't be held accountable for my words or actions if I don't get food before the finance thing. <laughs> so, um, so focusing on the policy, the regulation, the possibility of a regulation and a committee and and, and the application. Then, um, I think it's important to look at the. Uh, I, I guess. Um, look at the redundancy in what the regulation states and what the application states, or at least the redundancy of tasks, or maybe they're the same thing, they're just not defined as such. In other words, um, just having the opportunity to review a sample application, not naming who's just, you know, ha happen to have a sample application on hand, having read through that, it got me thinking, you know, if the, so, so the superintendent, according to the regulation, will assemble or superintendent or designee will assemble a committee. Um, so that answers the question that I had, who will select the committee members? Will that be a standing committee? And, I, and, I, and I, I'm assuming the answer is no, it will be ad hoc based on the occurrence. So in other words, if we wanna name the, um, the courtyard at the high school after you know, a woman who used to sit there and teach there, whatever it might be, different committee, but the same basic makeup. What is the committee charged with? You know, it says that they'll, it says that they'll make a formal recommendation, a written recommendation, right? I guess through the superintendent to the board, but what does that formal recommendation look like? Is that another standard form we have to come up with? Or is the formal recommendation, the completion of the application by the committee? Or does the application get created and then go to the committee? And if you, like I said, there's a lot of redundancy then. If the application is not what comes to the board from the committee, then what does come to the board from the committee? And it can't just be some arbitrary letter that they write and it looks different every single time. That doesn't help us, it doesn't, doesn't seem fair. So, so um, and then the last thing is, um, yeah, that's all. So is it an application? Is it a PowerPoint presentation? What's the committee doing? And we already have the application. So. I, I would argue then, or, you know, assert that in an effort to answer a lot of that, we have the policy, we have the application that maybe the, um, maybe we need to just simply, you know, if anything, consolidate the regulation. You know, it, it, it could be as consolidated as, as simply having the regulation explain the distribution collection and, 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 and passing along of the application to the board. And then anything from that to where it stands right now, but right now it's too long and we have to kind of clarify, right? So, so, so we have to clarify what is, what is the committee is producing? Does it have anything to do with the application? You know, um, and then, yeah, that's all. I, I think we start with that. Otherwise, how can we sit here and talk about the regulation? Because, because we could sit here and say, oh yeah, we're going to have a regulation, but what the, what's, what's going to have? What's going to, you know, all right. And again, need food, so I apologize for yeah. talking like this. Um, no worries, so, oh, Ms. Cole. Give me one, one, one minute just on this. So, um, we as a board are just you're, you're seeking our recommendation, Dr. Gonzalez, or so. No, I, I'm fine. I'm asking. Uh, back uh, in back in December, the board wanted me to develop regulations, so I yes. did what I was told to do, um, as yeah. it. <laughs> as it relates to the, you know, trying to provide a structure um, that allows the um, Board of Education to consider a facilities naming request. So, so that's the reason for it. Um, you know, I, I think it can be, if, if the board doesn't want a regulation, again, a, a, re a regulation is administrative. So all due respect to the board, you don't have to worry about the, the details. That's my job. Um, and I think if, if you would rather eliminate the administrative regulation and just as a board, take it on your own, that, that's fine. You know, that, that's a board decision. And, and certainly because the, the purpose of the policy 
is to grant the board the opportunity to consider the naming and then vote on that naming. So that that all resides at the okay. board level. So okay, thank you. you. Know, again, if if I have no <laughs> I have no um, commitment to this regulation other than you know I put it together in the attempt to try and provide a uh, clear process and nice. and you know including the um, you know did not define the the output of the committee uh, other than to say that they would present a report of their findings and discussion and what they would either accept reject or, or modify the recommendation. Uh, Ms. Colombo, uh, you, you were... I yeah, I was of... just going to piggyback. I think what Dr. Mano, what you're saying is, or well, I, I don't know the right uh, language. Would we make a motion or a vote to say application policy is what we're going to use or get regulation, add the regulation? So I think that, is that what we, like right now, would try to decide? What, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna use just the application and that policy and that's how we're gonna use for naming and not the regulation? I think that's what we have to decide as a board. Am I right? Is that what you're saying, Dr. Mono? Dr. Well, Mono, if you can answer that, please. Uh, yeah, so, so actually a little bit of sugar slipped out of my stomach and into my blood. So I, I can actually be a little clearer for about 30 seconds. So here goes. <laughs> I think what I was trying to say was we might just have to simply add two or three pieces to the policy and be done. We have the product. We do need to hear from the community. So maybe it's just something as simple as this. Maybe we have this policy that requires the completion of the application. Upon the receipt of an application, we simply, um, we advertise for a, a public, um, how could I say it? You know, um, um, uh, a public presentation uh, at a board meeting during the public open public session where those who are interested, those who have Advocate taken the time to put together the application would come and make a presentation to the board during that open public meeting. And then the board as a committee of the whole would process it and decide on it. It just seems so simple, cut and dry. Like you're going to have a committee made up of that's going to be hand selected. And we know where that's going to go politically. I mean, come on. It's going to get voted up or voted down based on what? And then, and, 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 you know, poor Dr. Gonzalez is going to get, you know, uh, well, I don't want to use any religious references, but it's not going to be good, right? Because he's the guy who picked the committee. So now he's going to be tortured for that. And that's going to drag, it's going to be protracted, especially if it gets voted down. Let's just simply say in the policy, part of it is must fill out the application. Once we receive the application, we will post for a public demonstration. People can come, they can speak about the individual. They have five minutes during it, blah, blah, blah. And then the board deliberates. Is that a motion? Can I second that or no? Uh, I, I didn't hear a motion. It's not, it's not a motion, but I'll I make thought you were making a motion to do that. <laughs> I mean, if, if it has any traction. You sure, you sure you weren't making a motion to do that? No? Uh, okay. I, I'll, I'll, I mean, I, I, I got uh, Ms. Price and then Mr. Abudod. So my question is then, are, would we include the background check in the policy that was discussed in regards to being in the regulation. Sure, why not? Absolutely, why not? So we're talking about rewriting the policy. Just adding two or three points, that's all. Okay, so this is something we can kick to the policy committee to bring back and then to, to, the, to the full board is, is what I'm hearing. Mr. Abudur, if you can, uh, you have the floor. Thank you. So I, I I feel like we're literally beating a dead horse. The the item agenda that we're or the old business item that we're talking about is a regulation, and so many different points keep coming up, and we're we're just need to finish the one item to bring up all these other items. So I, I need to ask a few questions, and then I'll go, Doctor Gonzalez. Um, the policy that was referenced for this regulation, who wrote the policy? That was originally Strauss Esme and then the board uh, in 2018, I believe, is when we uh, amended the policy, reviewed the policy and amended it to include the provision uh, of a community member of significance um, to be considered. And then in, so I, I pulled the policy up. So in, ja in January of 2020, 
is when we revised it. And six of the board members that are here tonight voted yes for that policy. The three that aren't here anymore also voted yes for that policy. So the policy's in place, and it's within three years from his or her passing. And I think Andrew even read earlier. So now what we're, what we're trying to decide on is a regulation, because we revised it, Grouse Estimate doesn't need to make the res- reg- regulation, if I'm correct. We're trying to figure out, do we want the regulation or do we not? That's the first point. So I'm making a motion, and, and my dog's going crazy. I'm making a motion that we put forth the regulation as is adding a background check to the regulation the way all three of our committees met and agreed to it. So there's my motion. Do we have a second on that motion? Okay. Can I just... So yeah, well I have to I had to ask if there was a second on the motion before I can let okay, you speak. No. So well no. you don't know that. I I was waiting. I'm for saying no for me. That's yeah, no, I was. It's not an individual thing. It's just if we didn't have a second, I'm going to give you the floor now. We didn't have a second okay. for the motion. Go ahead. We have the floor now, Ms. Frontella. Okay. Uh, I would like to make a motion that we not accept Regulation 7250 as written and that we kick it back to the policy committee to make adjustments to either the policy or the application, incorporating the changes that we've discussed tonight so that we can get the dead horses fur out of the screen and we can continue on because we're going to be here till 2.30 this morning. I would also make another motion that we add Keith's budget presentation onto next week's special session. Oh, yeah, well, we have... That's two separate, okay. All right, so the first motion, what, can you just repeat your first motion because we, yes, we, the first we're motion would the be table. to The first motion would be to not accept policy or regulation 7250 as written and that would go back to the policy committee for incorporating the language as discussed tonight into the application of the policy including the background Mr. Check, right? Rizzotto, can, yeah. uh, I'm, I'm sorry uh Mr. Bontillo uh, there, there's no motion for the policy to be accepted so I I just to clarify I know you're saying a motion to not accept it but there's no motion on the table there's no recommendation from anyone to accept it. So I, I, I understand where you're going with it. I just don't so you, think- So you recommend that I not make a motion to not accept the regulation <laughs> that wasn't accepted? Well, there's no, I, I don't, I'm just trying to- Okay, great. No can we move on then? <laughs> can like, can we move on, on then? This was, this I'm is trying to end the conversation. I'm this trying to end the conversation. Like, I, like Joe I, said, there's, I, I, there's I, I, dead horse fur all over the place right. here. I'm trying to end the conversation on this matter because no one else has anything to bring up. I'm just trying to move the meeting along. So there could be a motion to close the uh, old business, but. <laughs> well, I don't want to, I don't want to close all business. I'll, I'll make a motion to close the discussion on regulation 7250. Do we have a second? Second. No, I'll second it. Okay. Moving forward. Roll but call. now he can make the other motion. Roll call. Oh, yeah, we got to do roll call. Oh, I'm going to do roll call. Sorry. Uh, Mr. It was a lot of hands up, so I just <laughs> roll call. There's a motion to close the discussion. Mr. Budo? It's motion to close discussion on 7250, correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Mrs. Colombo? Yes. Mr. Gersmeyer? Yes, but let's keep moving on this. Let's not miss it. Mrs. Hanlon? Yes. Mr. Pontillo? Yes. Mrs. Price? Yes. Dr. Romano? Yes. Mrs. Sambler? Yes. Mr. Parapata? Yes. Okay. Motion, uh, discussion closed. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, other topics for all business. Ms. Price. Hi. I'm sorry. Ms. Um, Price. Yes. So I'm just going to, uh, I just want to put out there and, and again, as a new board member not being involved in prior conversations um, up until last month and, you know, going with the reopening that everybody is so passionate about, 
one way or the other in our community. Um, and as a parent, you know, I've seen the surveys and I know there are many ways to interpret the data that's coming back from the surveys. Uh, I would just like the consideration of our administration to maybe consider, and it was actually kind of brought up tonight in the public session that, that we give our, our parents and our children two choices. One is to stay full remote for the rest of the year, because we know that that is at the comfort level and in some families, the best choice for them to make. Um, and, and, and I support that a hundred percent because everybody needs to, to do what's in the best interest of their family. But the other choice to be to go back to, back to school full time. And I know that that's not necessarily a popular um, choice either, um, but we would know kind of which way it is like one way or the other when we have two when we have three and four and five and, and some of the other proposals of, of, of different ways to go back to school just to have those two options to see what that data shows us in order to get you know get us back to you know maybe on a different a little bit different path and I'm again I'm not talking Cali index I'm not talking about any of the other the other issues that we're using for for metrics right now but just the data of in this situation where we are right now would your student go back to school full time five days or would you keep your student home and with that information um because I know there are people that will, will definitely have that hard line one way or the other, would, would probably give us the opportunity, and I'm not discounting the, others, the, the other buildings, but at the high school where we are at so low capacity, we could potentially bring all the students back that wanna go back full time, keep the kids who want to, and parents who wanna stay on remote, and probably not get up to the capacity that we're looking at for social distancing or at the very least, because as a parent who had a senior last year, whose life just stopped, get the seniors back into the high school building. So keep the hybrid program, but bring those seniors back in so that they have something that resembles their own sense of, of this closure to their 13 years in the Westwood Public School District. And I, I just would like that to be just under some consideration um, as we're making these decisions going forward. I know they're administrative decisions and we're here to support the administration, but that's my, my as I'm talking to people and I'm looking at the whole thing and in being in a building myself, who we will probably not go back to school full-time, my heart breaks for all of the kids. Um, I want them to get back to something where you know, the data says they can be safe. The data says we can do it as long as our numbers can make it. And I think if we just have that, that, that definitive yes back five days or no, I'm going to stay full remote. And maybe that has to be a hard line that if you decide to be full remote, unless all of a sudden magic happens and the world goes back to normal and everybody can go back full time. Now that's just, a, a, you know, something we have to stick with. And, um, that, that's my, my thoughts in, about our going back to school. Thank you. Um, anyone else? Dr. Romano? You're muted. <laughs> so, um, can we just clarify? Um, so I know, I know we closed, we, we motioned, um, voted to close the old business discussion about the regulation. Um, do we have a plan after closing that conversation? Is, is, it that we're, is, that, is that we're going back to the policy committee or that we're just gonna wait for someone to bring this up at the next meeting? I was under the impression that we were just bringing it back to the policy committee to-, to Okay, I, just, I, just make, I want to make sure we say it out loud so we all hear it and, and we know that that's our plan because I didn't hear that. My motion to do that. I, I, did, I did hear that fly around, but I didn't hear that as part of bringing it to a close, that we're bringing it to a close because it's going to go here now. Great, that's good news. All right, thank you. Okay, anyone else? Uh, okay, Mr. Abudud. So, Dr. Romano, I... I took it as it was coming back to policy. 
taking the recommendations from everybody mm-hmm. and their discussion so that we can bring it back to the next meeting and finalize okay. all the details. And then whether it's taking it to finance with the application or we just take it to the full board and, and finalize this application that's okay. presented to us. So, and it gives us more time for all of us to review the application. And it still gives us plenty of time if approved for the due process to take place for next year. Okay. That so, being so, said, so I'm sorry. So, so yeah, thank you, for that. So, so for, thank you for the clarification. The reason I was asking was because I was just thinking, you know, so, so knowing that then, you know, Joe, since, since uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Abu Dowd, since you are the policy okay. chair, I'm going to send you my notes and I would just encourage anyone else who had, you know, a proposal tonight to please send Mr. Abu Dowd your notes because we, we, we threw, we tossed around a lot tonight. It's a lot to absorb. So that's what I was going to say. That's we want policy to have something to consider when they meet now about this. So, so that's what I was going to say. If anybody has, their their notes their opinions they want to forward and then we'll present it to the full committee and come back at the next meeting and hopefully have an answer for everybody who spoke publicly tonight ending that topic since i still have the floor mr parapato right i I happen to I, i have this quirk about me that i not only do the zoom call but i watch it on youtube at the same time to make to see what the lag is and as i'm watching on youtube it doesn't show that the student representatives are still with us. And I just want the public to know that both Max and Isabel are still sitting through this meeting, even though their cameras are off, but YouTube does not reflect that. So they're both still here and they're both still listening and learning from what we're doing. And they've done this at every meeting. They, they've never given up, they've never signed off. Even though we allow them to leave, they're still here. So very proud of the two of them for doing that. I appreciate you adding that last part about we allow. Can I make a motion leave. that they get the first two periods off tomorrow because of what time it is? <laughs> no, uh, I'll second that. And Isabel, <laughs> thanks you. <laughs> uh, Ms. Because Sebra, we're well within our jurisdiction by doing that. Why should anything change now, right? <laughs> let's 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 carry on here, Miss Sembler. I saw your hand up. You have the okay. floor. Two things, because I I do want to um, come to a conclusion on this issue. One. Um, for the uh, regulation, I don't believe we need a regulation at all. I believe the policy as is, along with the application that was given to us with all the detail and criteria is um, sufficient and it will come to the board on a case by case basis. And that's our role and that's our job and that's our responsibility is that as board members, we get the application, we look at it and then we make a decision. Um, I also wanna make a motion that we accept uh, Mr. Stickle's application as is tonight um, in regards to naming the field after veto. I do not believe that we need a regulation in order to do that. So I'm wondering if I have a second on the floor, if we can get a two thirds vote um, and not wait the three years, which is in the policy. Okay, just clarify what your what the motion is. I heard two different The motion things. is to accept Mr. Stickle's application as is tonight um, in naming the field after Vito Trous and waiving the two third, waiving the three year time period, but we need yeah. a thirds vote. I think we can only vote on the second part. We we don't have to vote to accept the application. We accepted it already. It, it's been it's been acknowledged that we received it. Like there's no there's not really no acceptance part of it. So, but like the second part, that's definitely something that can be a motion in my my. Opinion. So you're voting on leaving the three years. That's what the vote is. For this case, for this application? Yep. Yes. Do I have a second? I'm sorry, I okay. just, <laughs> you're, you're motioning to waive the three years, you're motioning to accept the application. I, what are we doing? I just want to get this right. Uh, yeah. I believe it's one in the same. It's accept- Not the way the policy is written. The application has on it a box. Does is it three years or not? Correct. And the box is not checked that it's three years. So I'm accepting the application as is with the box not checked with three years. And I mean, it's two. Is that two separate motions? I mean, it's on the application. I, I just don't think the first part's even needed. We 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 received it and then acknowledge that we got it. That's yeah. 
I, I we think didn't, we didn't ask for any additional information on the application. There, it's, it's, it's not something we have to. The do. application is to name the field after yeah. the trout. You don't have to accept the application. No. Like it's, it's just extra. You're, just Michelle, you're asking for for us to vote. Yes. To, to wave it. To wave the three. Mm -hmm. That's to what accept you're the application as is, as it's written. It says on the application that it's not. It hasn't been three years. We can still accept the application, even though it hasn't been three years. We have the authority to do that. It's on the application. We can vote on it. But instead of needing five votes to accept this application, we need two thirds. So the, the two thirds is to waive the three years waiting period. Mm -hmm. It has nothing to do with the application. It has to do with to waive the three years. To waive the three years. So I just want to interject here <laughs> before I go any further. So uh, I'm not making a decision about your motion one way or another, but I, I just want to be clear. So if, if I heard Mr. Abudu correctly, we, when we put this to bed, we were looking to put this back into policy to create the policy to, to be able to do both things at that next meeting, which was vote on the application and come to a conclusion on combining everything we were looking for into the policy with input from everybody prior. So it, it, we weren't looking to push this off. We weren't looking not to do it. We were looking to just process, right? Create the policy the way we want it, which was a lot of people's ideas and it seemed to be agreed upon and have something on the agenda for the acceptance of that application. I, if I was hearing that correctly, that's what I heard. It, 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 I can't prevent anybody from putting a motion on the table, but that's the way I heard it. Dr. Romano? I mean, I, I would love to go with your interpretation, but I don't think that the regulation, Mr. Abu do, are you, are you were you hearing that the regulation was off the table and that we're only looking at modifying, tweaking the policy at this point? Is that what the policy, okay, that, that's awesome. Then that, that I'm so glad, yeah, I mean, I, I love that interpretation that we're looking at tweaking the policy, regulations over, and that the policy will acknowledge the existence of the application. It'll, it'll identify where it's gonna go and it's gonna add the criminal background, the background check, and, and, then, and then whatever other suggestions that come in between now and the next meeting. So that sounds like we're very close to being able to handle any and all naming and then using Proposals the application we have, and then using the application we have as the catalyst to, right. to get this started. Right. So, so, to, to, so in, in respect to what was being said, I, I just think it's we're, we sound like we're a meeting away from being able to put both of those things right to bed. So, so, so before, before Michelle, before when I had suggested that we make that motion tonight and then use this opportunity as 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 a possible standard for future development. In my mind, we were months and months away from future development. This could actually come back to us for a first reading at the next meeting. And then, and then once we have the first reading on it, maybe we go back to, let's go forward with this now because we know we're gonna have the second reading. We don't have to wait two months. It's gonna be one month from now, as opposed to now, like, you know, we're so close right now. We're so close and we seem to have boiled it down, eliminated a regulation we're only a, we're like one step away, so what? So, yeah. So for what it's worth, well, I, mean, that's, I, I, think, that's I think what Matt is trying to say diplomatically is, could you just wait one month instead of going <laughs> and doing that? Out yeah. of respect for the out of respect for the process that we just defined. I mean, we we just we just jumped leaps and bounds ahead tonight, and 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 we're this close now as opposed to this close. Out of respect for that, could we just wait until the next meeting before we go and do that? The special session or the next monthly? Whenever we get back that policy from the, yes, from the think, policy committee, um, which which at the at the very latest would be March twenty fifth, possibly sooner at the special meeting, but but certainly at the latest March twenty fifth, and so on, on that March, night, eighteenth, eighteenth, March eighteenth, March eighteenth. So we're talking. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, March eighteenth. I'm I'm thinking the next curriculum committee meeting. <clears throat> sorry, but or well, something. Honestly, uh, just just anyway. just to be fair and 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 for all fairness, we, if Michelle wants to put the motion on the table, no, no, I, I, know, I know, I know, I know, I know. I yeah, yeah, it's still on the table. Actually, she made a motion. I just so, want to make sure it's hold on, hold on. I just want to, like, but again, before we go, on, hold on, hold on, everybody, 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 hold on. Yeah, sorry, 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 sorry. No problem, no problem. Sorry. So, 
it, to Andrew's point, the motion is on the table, but we do need a clarification. Uh, Keith, if you could help me procedurally here. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand what the motion is. I, I, I know what you're saying, Michelle. Um, you're motioning to accept the application. Are you mo but what does that mean? Well, just, on the we're accepting the application. It doesn't mean you're like, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm just trying to understand. And I think for clarification for all the board members to understand what they're going to be voting for. Oh, you're trying to use the word approve instead of accept? Yes, thank you. Okay. To approve the application as, as is, it is. Mm -hmm. um, without the, you know, it's, it's, it's on, thank you, Matt. It's on the no application that it's not within the three year time period. That does not mean that we cannot approve it and that we cannot vote on it. So we have the application, we have the policy, let's vote on it and let's see where everybody stands. And to Mr. Stickle, if he's here, if he's watching or to the public, if it doesn't make the two thirds um, vote tonight, that does not mean that it's not something that, is it something that cannot be brought up again? The regulation had that, the policy does not. Right, there's a lot of chicken before the egg happening with this. So th th we're in a weird spot with the, we have the example, which is good. And we got the application out there, which is good. And got it back, which is good. But the fact that we haven't really decided what the heck we're doing with it is bad. So you, yeah. Mike's exactly right. Mr. Pontillo. The, the right. toothpaste so, is out of the tube already though here because the application went out and was accepted back, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Um, the application has been received. Has been... Okay. It's all Again, <laughs> let, let's stick. Let's stick to this. And since we what haven't listen, officially approved have... the policy and the regulation, tonight's vote, the ramifications of a no vote are kind of. I think, right? You know, listen. Well, without uh, without Dr. the Gonzalez, regulation. Go ahead, Michelle. I'm sorry. Doctor Gonzalez ahead. said from the beginning, this policy does not require regulation. It is a board decision. Why are we delegating or looking We're to not, delegate uh, our authority? into a committee. It doesn't make any sense. This is this is our domain. This is our responsibility. This is our role as a board. If you want to vote no, then vote no. But let's put it out there for the public. It's yes or no. Are you in favor of the application? The way that it's been submitted, we're all aware it hasn't been the three years. That does not mean it cannot happen. It just means we need more than a majority. We need six people in favor of this vote now in order to make it happen. Um, I don't know why we're, we're going. Miss Sembler, all right, here we go. Miss Sembler's motion on the table is to approve the application, which will need a two-thirds vote to carry. Exactly. Do we have a second for can that? I, can I ask a question before we vote? It, well, you, you know, there's a motion on, so we're looking for. A we have to. We have to. Well, hear it, if there's a second. It first. depends on my my answer. Depends on the we, answer. We can discuss um, after there's the discussion period. There's after a discussion the, period after the. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So is, do we have a second for, for that motion, which is to approve the application, which will need a two thirds vote to carry? Okay. I'll, I'll make the second. Okay. So we have a second, Mr. Pontilla. Now it is open for discussion. So Ms. Colombo. So my question, I, and Michelle had asked it before, if let's say they, there's not a two thirds vote tonight, is she, is she allowed to make a motion for it at a next month's meeting and the next month's meeting, you know? Oh, so she is. Okay. That's what I was wondering. Cause I know you asked that Michelle, but it didn't get answered. And I wanted to know that yeah. too. Based, so based like, on what's in the policy. That's correct. Okay. Yeah. So if tonight you didn't get a two thirds vote and then like it was brought up again, you know, in a month or two or now and it and it goes back to vote, you can, you could do it again. Okay. That's all I want to know. That was, that was actually part of the regulation that, um, that, that, that's where that was that was uh, that buried in there. That's one of the new things in the regulation that would go in to the policy. No, no, that's what was no, in the no. written the written regulation that we've decided we're not using. So that doesn't exist now in the policy. Okay. So do we have any other comments or discussion? Okay. Can we do a roll call, Mr. Rosado, please? Mr. Abu Dawood. No. Hold on, I'm sorry. I ran out of space. One second. Mrs. Colombo. So I'm not saying no to veto. I'm saying no to the three, the wave in the three years. Okay. 
Uh, Mr. Gersmeyer. No. Mrs. Hanlon. No to waiving three years. Mr. Pontillo. Oh, yes. Mrs. Price. No to waiving the three years. Dr. Romano. So I, I would never say no to this to this overall effort, but I'm not ready to say yes because we're only one month away from resolving this, and so I'm going to abstain. Uh, Mrs. Sambler. Yes. And Mr. Perpato. Um, so yeah, to Dr. Romano, I'm going to abstain with the um, caveat that March 18th, we will have it resolved. Okay. Motion did not carry. Okay. Um, so any other topics for old business? Uh, this is Price started a new topic we should get back to her you're i, I i'm so i'm getting a little weary here and i'm i'm, I'm in i'm falling into the dr romano um I'm, i want i'm dying to call for a recess but i'm i'm trying to get through all business first so i apologize you're right it was about reopening if i if if i was correct that was the topic but that is the topic that's on the table right now so do we have any further discussion on that and i have miss sembler um you're up just real quick just to clarify, so if we do not have, it doesn't matter if we talk about this again on March 18th when it comes to veto, because if we do not have the majority of the board that is willing to waive the three-year waiting period, the topic of veto is not going to be able to come up again um, until we've hit that three-year mark, correct? Incorrect, no. Hmm. The, the, no, the, you could bring it up again. You could bring, you can ask again. The same that was, question. That was, yeah, that was with the Thorne same board there. members that are not willing to wait for three years. So again, we're, we're trying to put that topic to bed tonight. We, in, with respect to the rest of the evening, the, the, I will leave it at this. The conversation about this application is not over. It is simply being moved to March 18th, not for a delay tactic because we feel like we have a very good plan in place and we are now a month away from, from getting this done. And th that seems to be the board. But right now, the conversation is about reopening. So I'd like to stick to that with all due respect. Thank you. OK, uh, reopening. Uh, Mr. Pontel, I see you have a half hand up there. I'll take it. <laughs> all right. I will continue the conversation on reopening. I appreciate it. Um, so earlier, it was suggested that if I wanted information, they ask for it. So I did ask for some information uh, with respect to um, how the decision was to arrived at to not uh, go back to reopening and, and uh, refresh everyone's memory last month. I offered a third option uh, because of uh, mixing cohorts to, to give people an option to come back on the, on the five-day schedule. I wrote some comments and I'm just going to read through them. Um, I, too, am getting a little tired, so uh, let me just get right to it. So I asked for information related to the health guidance provided to the district in order to gain a better understanding of how we got to where we are and the district would not provide any of that guidance to me. Other surrounding districts have figured out how to implement safe return to school protocols and have been doing so. Beckton Regional High School is a good example. Uh, and there are also other examples, approximately 38 of them in Bergen County, as mentioned earlier this evening by Dr. Sforza. Uh, parents have expressed concerns for the social, emotional, and educational health and needs of their children. Uh, there was a motion earlier on this agenda, contrary to the motion on last, month, last month's agenda, to retain kids in this district can no longer reside here. Uh, this is an affront to the parents of this district seeking the space to return their children in person instruction. I'm working to understand why we are not back in school. My attempts to educate myself through the administration have gone unanswered. Parents are spending time at home, money for tutors, forming learning groups to meet the needs of their children, which they are not getting through the district. The return emails to the parents of this district that have expressed concerns are not up to par and representative of the excellence in education that we profess. The COVID activity levels have been decreasing. The ICU admissions are decreasing. Regular hospital admissions are decreasing. And the CDC has reduced the quarantine times and circumstances from 14 to 10 days. In Westwood, COVID levels on the 14-day metric are, would be at 41 cases, which is 0.00327% of the population. 
and on a 10-day metric would be 26 cases or 0.00236% of the population. Recent executive orders in New Jersey have allowed the following changes. Religious services, services have increased from 35% with 150 person max to 50% with no maximum. Collegiate sports are allowing two parent guardian spectators. Large sports and entertainment venues with over 5,000 seats are allowed at 10% indoor and 15% outdoor capacity. Restaurants have been increased to 35% indoor capacity. The survey that went out last, uh, last month after the meeting was positive in showing a willingness to return to school once safe to do so. At both the middle and high school levels, there was support for the five days of instruction. The problem with the survey is that the commentary once safe to do so is uh, completely open to interpretation and uh, there's no measurement. It's only a dangle of a carrot, if you will, for the person seeking to be returned to school. The return of sports to our schools, which co-mingle learning cohorts and bring students from the outside to the district, not donning PPE, have completely taken away the follow the science argument about transmission. Uh, quarantines come from the theory that 15 minutes or more in a 24 hour period, while you're within six feet of someone, require that quarantine. Certainly the sports and the mixing of cohorts in that uh, capacity would put people at higher risk from a scientific perspective. And that is a CDC recommendation that is followed by the New Jersey Health Department. The health department guidance issued on February 15, 2021, that we were all sent as board members, uh, offers the term to reduce quarantine for significant economic or other hardships. Is this placing money over health, education over dollars? This guidance is shameless in allowing other conditions unrelated to the science of COVID-19 to change the rules for the benefit of the person claiming the hardship. The Code of Ethics, Section D, asked the Board of Education not to administer the schools, but together with the fellow board members to see that they run well. I am not of the opinion that they are running well in their current format. Why is there an application to not require standardized testing due to the COVID-19 pandemic? Is this so we do not see and print the negative consequences associated with some of the learning models currently implemented? This is contrary to the President of the United States directive to go forward with that same testing. Section J of the Code of Ethics requires complaints to refer to the Chief Administrative Officer and for the BOE to only act on complaints at public meetings only after the failure of an administrative solution. The lack of daily in-person instruction has gone on for too long. I was hoping that this month, uh, this last month between meetings that there would have been strides made, communications occurring, potential plan modifications, thoughtful deliberations on how to safely bring the kids back to school. And so far, none of that has happened. No other district is using the Cali Index as a method for returning kids to school. Um, we have no notes, as we learned from the pandemic response committees in, in an email about what goes on in those meetings. To my knowledge, we haven't had a teacher survey since November and that the survey that went out in November on returning to school was only for the elementary teachers. And everyone has to remember that the things that are being recommended are not a forced return to school option. It's solely to open the options up for parents seeking the best educational benefits for their children. A lot of people have expressed concern and those concerns are going unanswered. And I'm concerned about that. I'm concerned about that as a board member and I'm concerned about that as a parent. You're seeing all over the country, people wanting to sue boards of education. They're asking that districts provide them with more they're paying their tax dollars. A large portion of their tax dollars are being spent on schools and the schools are not doing what the kids need and they're not meeting the needs of the kids in a variety of ways. So um, I would like the board to consider the following motions with respect to developing policy. And I'm gonna read them both and I'll, I'll read them again, but I'll be finished after I read them both. So I would just ask that I get to read them both. Number one is that a policy be developed which removes the Cali index in yellow for two weeks being a demarcation line for determining it to be safe to return to school. I would also note that there needs to be language that discusses decision-making uh, during pandemic and unforeseen emergencies with the Board of Education. And then secondly, I would like to enact a policy that parents who wish to have their student return to daily instruction who are denied that opportunity receive alternative methods provided at the expense of the district to meet the educational needs of their children. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, is, is that a mo is that a motion that there's we can, two separate motions there? But we that would be something that would have to be developed as a policy, correct? So what I'm making a motion that we develop policies? Well, I mean, so listen, you're just making a motion. You're making a recommendation that policy looks into. I, I'm making a motion that we get rid of the Cali index because it's arbitrary. It's completely arbitrary. I, I, I've waited, I've asked for information, and it's arbitrary. It doesn't make sense. People want their kids to return to school. They want their kids' educational needs met. You've listened to a whole host of people come on here tonight who are begging this Board of Education and this district to get their kids back in school because the kids need it. I think that we owe it to those people to do that. Although the schools are running somewhere in the 25 or 50% capacity for in-person learning, we're still spending 100% of that bu of the budget. And that's a shame, actually. Okay, Keith, is that a motion that can, can, can like, can that be a motion? I I'm asking, I I'm procedurally, I I'm really not sure, but can- Part, a part of our responsibility as board members is to make policy. So I'm asking for the- Right, and then policy. we need a first reading and a second reading to a national yeah. policy. So the, the it, I guess it's a we motion can't to, just make to a start the process. So we could just take this can and kick it down the road as far as we can, right? But, it's but I'm just saying it's, it's not process. something we could vote on and just make happen right now. That's just not the way. Okay. Well, the policy making why, why, can't, Mr. Why, Mr. Garcia, why can't hold we on. vote? Mr. Why Pontello, can't we vote? Mr. Pontello, please, please hold on. Give me a minute. I'm Mr. Rosado, can you please um, just let me know if that's a motion that can be on the table to remove the Cali? You're, you're muted. I apologize. The board has the authorization to, to pass policy uh, and the procedure of the passing the policy is a first reading and the second reading. Um, so if, the, if there's a motion to administer, to put forth policy, I guess, to be fair to all the other board members, Mr. Pontello, you know, uh, actually seeing a policy and seeing what, what how did- do, how I have, do I have permission to work with the board of ed attorney to bring that to the next meeting then on the, the emergency meeting we're gonna have? Well, the what media the attorney for we have a policy committee. Yeah, let the, let the let the attorney develop the policy. That's not the the purpose of the attorney. They don't write our policies. Dr. Dr. Gonzalez. Gonzalez. Yeah, I I just want to caution the board. You know, you are policy making. Uh, you know, body, but you can't create policies, or it's not advisable that you create policies to administer the district. So, you know, if if you go that route then you are, are certainly treading on the, you know, policy making uh, path to potentially even uh, violate your own ethics uh, charge. So I, guess I, I don't think we're that. violating our own ethics because of the other no, I'm just offering of, that uh, portions as, of the code of ethics. And that's why I think we should enlist the attorney because the attorney, right, would be able to tell us what we can and can't do as a board. I've seen board, you've seen, uh, you know, news of boards overturning superintendent's decisions regarding school reopening plans. Okay. okay, you're a policy making board. That doesn't happen. Mr. Pontillo, thank you. Mr. Gersmeyer, we're gonna get back to the motion in a minute. I just wanna hear it out because this is this is something that's on the floor. So Mr. Gersmeyer. I just wanted to point out that we can't, um, we can't pick and choose which which items of the code of ethics we we honor and ignore in in one action. So we can't, say we're acting on behalf of these four parts of our code of ethics, but by seriously violating another one, each action has to be evaluated across the breadth of the entire code of ethics. So we can't cherry pick which ones apply to the situation in any situation, not just to this situation. So the failure of an administrative option, that's an opinion. Uh, everything being arbitrary, that's an opinion. Um, we can't, we cannot tell the administration, do this. Agreed. But so, but there, there are, there are, I see, I see where you're coming from with a couple of the other items from the code of ethics, but in order to, 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 to use those as the, the, the reasoning behind it, but, but by also simultaneously violating other items of the code of ethics, that's not how it works. You can't cherry pick. 
also, I just want to just to, to let you know, Mr. Pontillo, too, at the end, there, there is an evaluation process for uh, Dr. Gonzalez. So, so at the end of the year, that is your opportunity to, to make yeah, those that, comments. That's, that's not, obviously, that's not the, uh, the, in, the intent of what I'm speaking about here, right? You'll listen to the people come on here tonight. Can someone show me in writing then where the Cali index being in yellow for two weeks is a demarcation line for safe returns to schools? Yes or no? No. Isn't it just has logic no based on data? It's called a data informed decision based on figures coming from the state in our region. I, I don't understand why anyone calls it arbitrary. It's data directly related to transmission and a decision based on data. If, if, if right. it was how many cases, how many cases have we had a transmission in the school from student to student or faculty member to student or student to faculty member? How many? Nobody can actually prove that. You know that. I, I asked for a number. Yeah. Can someone you, give you me know a that it's not possible no. to get that number. So it's a, well, it's hold a, on. Wait a, a second. Not, we're not, we're not, I, I don't want to have this conversation. Mr. Pontello, even if the will of the board was to pass that motion, that doesn't make Dr. Gonzalez have to open the schools. That's just waiving the, what you consider to be the arbitrary indicator. So it, it's, it's- If it's not arbitrary, show me where it's not arbitrary. There, the state of New Jersey has not given any indication other than mitigation, social distance and wearing a mask. Therefore, we have to come no. up with some metric. So, or not we, the, the, the district has decided to use data to come up with a metric. So show me another district that uses that method. Little Ferry, New Jersey. But that's not the conversation that we're looking to have. And it's been well received in circles. And I can say this, and I know Dr. Gonzalez won't, but in the circles of education, that Cali metric index or using other metrics and data has been proven or, or has been accepted pretty well, well received amongst the, the ranks of administrators. What I will also say is that a lot of the districts that have successfully done it don't have the numbers that we have. And yeah, we might have 80% that want to come back, but that causes the problem of social distancing. Okay. So everything causes I'll, another okay, issue. Fine. So that's great. So then I'll get to my second motion. My second motion is, is that we have a policy that parents who wish to return their students to daily instruction who are denied that opportunity receive alternative methods provided at the expense of the district to meet the educational needs of their children. Okay, that's real clear, right? If parents are worried about the educational being, well-being of their children and they don't feel that their needs are being met here, right? Why are the tax scholars going to, to fund what isn't in their kids' best educational well-being and needs? It's right in our code of ethics. Our decisions are supposed to be based around that single item, right? The, these decisions are supposed to be in the best way for the kids' educational needs. That's what it's about, right? Am I wrong? All decisions. That so singular parent, sentence is right, but the way you're if applying a parent, it, you're... If a parent is expressing concern about their children and what they're learning or how they're learning or how their kids are responding to what they're doing, the district needs to offer alternatives if we can't provide them in classroom instruction, whether that's be that they get to go somewhere else, but they should be getting the services for their kids from this district and the district's responsible for that. The service. So I make a motion, not necessarily. I'll repeat, I'll repeat it. I'd like to make a motion that parents who wish to have their kids return to daily instruction or denied that opportunity by this district, receive alternative methods provided at the expense of this district to meet the educational needs of their children. And I would ask if someone would, be, would second that motion. Well, I would ask that. And is that, a, is, do we have a second? on the table. Ms. Price, okay. Do we want comment or discussion? What, what Mr. Also no, hold on, hold on, Mr. Abudud, please. So uh, I, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Rosado or Dr. Gonzalez, we can't pass policies to administer the district. That's not our role. And this, that's what this is. And, and I believe Dr. Gonzalez stated it earlier that uh, the board is not to uh, administer the, the district and could potentially face ethic charges 
for those that put forth the policy. It's, it's out there. I'm just, as an advisory only, I mean, I can't control what, or we can't control what the board puts forth. Dr. Gonzalez? No, and, and just on this specific motion, it's actually obligating and ex expending district funds. So this has not been part of the budget. This is not part of a prior year budget or, or current year budget discussion. You know, if, it, if it's something that the board wants to discuss under the budget work session, uh, we certainly could talk about, you know, the additional supports that we have in place, whether it be our acceleration academies or the, uh, the tutoring. But again, such a motion to expend district funds, again, falls within the realm of administration, not the board. And Mr. Parapato, I still have the floor. Yes. As part of discussion, I just ask that everybody stops talking over each other and waits to be called on. Because I'm missing, and I think everybody is as well, we're missing what, I, I miss part of what Mike said when Andrew spoke and what Andrew said when Mike spoke. It's, it's not fair to us or the public when everybody just speaks over each other. So if they can just, everybody can just wait to be called on. I would appreciate it. Thank you for that. Um, I see Ms. Price. Just to, uh, to clarify, because I, do we have, uh, for those students who are struggling and who's, you know, we heard a lot of the parents say things tonight and I'm sure that they're not the only ones, they're just the ones that got to speak tonight. Um, but for the students that are struggling in that capacity, um, do we have things in place already to be supporting them? A lot of what I see, and again, I'm seeing it from a high school parent perspective because I'm not seeing what's happening with the younger kids, but are there things in place for those parents to get at this point, as opposed to what may end up being um, remedial and, and out-of-pocket expenses to be able to bring, to help their kids along? So is, is there stuff that this, and, I'm, and, and I, I guess I don't really want anybody to tell me they can meet with their teacher on Zoom. Um, is there anything else in place that's there that I'm not aware of that the students have and the parents have as resources to support them because they're not being successful in this environment? In, in terms of anything specifically, are you referring to beyond our tutoring? So through the CARES funding over the past year, uh, we definitely have been able to set up uh, additional supports that we haven't had otherwise, or that would potentially be limited to, say, uh, students who are eligible for Title I services. So by having the, the CARES money, it expands our, our reach and our opportunity to support uh, any student who needs it. So that is at the uh, elementary and middle school. Is that correct, Mr. Rosado? It goes up to the middle school? I believe, yes, it's in the, and then there's, I'm, I'm not sure what's in the high school. Yeah. I, I guess my question is, is that, is that what does that look like? Because if, if I'm a student and I'm not learning in this model, and then you're going to offer me tutoring at, like, so for the high school, the tutoring session or the office hours with the teachers are at 235, and it's in this model because they can't meet with the, tu the, the teachers after school at 12, 11, or whatever time they get out of school. They can't stay and meet with their teachers and get more from them to get them up to speed, it, what else do we have to offer them but m just more time with their, their teachers on this platform? Uh, I, unfortunately, the, uh, under the circumstances, there are no other options. You know, it's either a hybrid or it's either in-person or, or remote. Uh, so we're able to meet students where they are uh, and, and attempt to support them you know, and coordinate uh, with the teachers accordingly. So I, I would not, um, you know, speak on behalf of the of Mr. Connolly and what his staff uh, accommodates. So I definitely, you know, that's a, a more a school specific question, but certainly we are, are are willing and prepared and and have the funding to support that those additional uh, tutoring services. Outside of that, you know, we don't have Sylvan Learning. We're not paying Sylvan Learning or anything like that. I'm not sure if that's you know the the suggestion, uh, but we are 
able to, okay. So we are able to, you know, utilize our existing staff uh, and, and support them um, and pay them to provide additional services. And, and I think even included in tonight's uh, curriculum committee meeting or, or yeah, committee uh, meeting minutes was the reference to what we have in store in the coming months for and including the summer. Okay, any other uh, discussion before we go to roll call? Mr. Pontillo? Isn't the goal of this education system to do the best we can for the kids? When you listen to the parents talk and you listen to the level of frustration in their voice, when you have people calling in who are crying while they're talking on public session, clearly something is wrong here. I think we need to figure out alternatives. We can't be tone deaf. We can't ignore it. It's not going away. This problem is getting progressively worse. What we're not doing is taking action. We're seeing new things or seeing new developments come or looking for solutions. It's like we're sitting stagnant waiting for this magical Cali index to come down so that the kids can be invited back to school. And all the while, we're losing instructional time, and it's not in their best interest. So I think that we need to do something to move the uh, ball down the court, so to speak, for the children. Any other comments or discussion, Ms. Sembler? And then Mr. Abu, uh, Abu Dhabi, you'll be up next. Uh, two things. Um, I think that... Um, we have a plan for our kids to get back to school at every level. And I believe that we're ready, right, for the kids to come back for phase two in, at the K to five level, five days a week, at the middle school and high school level um, for AM and PM sessions, correct? Is that, am I not speaking? <laughs> I think we have the death shields that were ordered and that are in. Um, and we are ready to make this happen. And I think um, the, the, the impatience of parents, including myself, of waiting for this um, Cali metric to drop um, is extremely frustrating. And I would also respectfully request that we the administration reconsider um, looking at that measure um, because I do believe it's in the best interest of our kids to return to in-person instruction sooner than later. And the Cali index that we're, that is being looked at is taking into consideration the entire Northeastern region. I would ask that we look at our numbers and our situation on a more local specific le uh, specific level, Westwood, Washington Township, because there are in, in this area, there are plenty of schools that, you know, do have their, have more students in and increased capacity um, in this Cali index state. So I would just like to request that, you know, the administration look at that again and maybe consider instead of waiting for the entire North Eastern region to drop into this yellow, um, maybe just looking at Westwood and Washington Township because you have the authority to do that on a local level, which is why every school district is doing something different, right? Because every town, every community has different numbers, um, has different situation. Um, so that's my two cents for that. Um, as far as the request for students who aren't getting what they're receiving. Um, I think we talked about it at the last board meeting and I will say it again, that I do believe we are accepting requests for students who wanna go remote. And it's an ongoing thing that has been um, very accommodating for that population of our community. The, the, the population of the community that has wanted to go remote on and off, on and off and doing all this, um, I think our administration has been above and beyond accommodating, allowing that to happen. But I think we're missing another portion of the population of parents, 
who are on the other end of the spectrum who are wanting a little bit more. And I think that when we look at empty school buildings, our, our high school and our middle school buildings are almost empty. We have 75 or I think it's 78% or maybe it's changed since the last time um, we met that are fully remote at the high school. So I believe that our administration can figure out a way for the students who do want to come back five days a week to put them because you're not going to get a full capacity of students, right? Have we looked at those numbers? Um, and I think that's something that we need to look at for those requests to come in and see if they can be accommodated. Maybe they can't be, maybe you're going to get, you know, too many, but I think it's worth looking at. And I think it would ease a lot of people's um, anger and frustration to see that that option has been looked at. And we have numbers to show that it could or could not work um, at the middle school and high school level. And I felt it as a parent myself of, you know, a student who's really struggling in the middle school. And, um, and I think for those kids who have shown that and parents who are requesting it and there is room and you can still do the social distancing, right? Because we only have, you know, 48% in the building um, that you can in some way try to accommodate those requests or at least look into it. At least show us that you've tried and that it could or could not work. And those are my only two uh, points on that. I had Mr. Abudud and then Ms. Colombo. So I, I believe we still have a motion on the floor. Well, this is, we're still, this is. I know, it, it's, it, it's, it's 1230. So, this, I mean, anyway, it's, the, the motion was made. Other districts use a Cali index. I've called many districts. There are charter schools that use it. There are private schools that use it. There are public schools that use it. The public schools that were mentioned tonight and referenced by someone who runs one have less than, 20 kids in the classroom on an elementary level and they're more than six feet apart. I sat there and called these schools. It, it's a fact stating things that are lies doesn't help make our decision. We still do not administer the district. It, it, it's not our job to administer the district. And for those who believe COVID is fake, there are people on here who have had it, who have spread it, there are sports teams who have spread it. It's in the reports that come out from the mayors. They don't specifically say it, but we all know people who have had it. We all know, all know people who have spread it and the families have gotten it. So it's not fake that COVID's out there. We're not here telling people we don't want their kids to be educated. We want them to be educated, but we also don't want them to die. And the reason it's not spreading in schools especially our district is because it's not overpopulated right now. But when 78% or 88% or a hundred percent want to go back, it's going to spread. And then those same people are going to say, Dr. Gonzalez, you killed my kid. It's a no win situation, but we're not the ones administering the district. So we can say everything we want, just like the public. Can. The administration runs it. We still have a motion on the table. Ms. Colombo, um, any uh, comment I, on the it, motion? I know everyone's so tired. Uh, it's a dumb, I have a dumb question that I'm not really looking for an answer, but I'm just putting it out there. Cause I, I, I believe, you know, I following the Cali index, but what if it's like April and it still hasn't gone down because the weather is nicer. Would we be able to then go five days and like open the windows and spread out a little bit more? Like, would that be something that would be considered um, even though the Cali index for two weeks hasn't gone down, but the weather is nicer. And now the kids are able to like move out and be outside a little bit more. Like I said, you don't have to answer it, but I was just wondering out loud, like if it's April and and it's close to May, or maybe the Cali index isn't down yet, or would we still keep that hybrid model or would, be, would we be able to maneuver ourselves outside a little bit? I don't know, just a thought. Just trying to find a solution for those families. Dr. Gonzalez? 
Yeah, no, I, I've addressed that as part of my you know, presentation this night and in the past, that if, if the health professionals offer anything that, that could bring us back sooner and, and safely, I'm all for looking at it, okay. but we don't have that. So if they come back and, 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 and reference the you know, increased air ventilation and when, uh, you know, fresh air because of the open windows, if they, if okay. they say it's okay, then that's okay. Awesome. But I'm not the health professional. Okay. Um, anybody have anything new to add to the conversation, Mr. Gersmeyer? It, it actually doesn't lend to the motion on the table. So I'm fine with just waiting okay. to go back to regular old business to just kind of keep talking about what Mrs. Price brought up. Okay. Um, Ms. Semblers, your comment about the motion on the table? Yeah. Just two quick things, just to clarify. My point about you know the administration considering those kids to come back five days a week, I guess would take away from Mike's motion if the administration was doing that for those kids and taking, if there was space in the classroom, right? You can say yes or you can say no, you could take it on a case by case basis, just like we're doing with the you know remote work accommodating kids. Um, if a parent you know puts in a request and there's room in the classroom um, and they can still, be socially distanced, um, why not accept that request? And then you wouldn't have a need for, you know, tutoring or outside money. If there's space in the classroom, let the kids in that need to be in is, is my point. And um, shoot, I forgot what else I was gonna say. Okay, all right, can, can we go to a roll, Mr. Pontillo? Oh, um, I, th Hold I on. think it's. A I'll come back to you, Mr. Hold on. Just no, oh, Mr. I'll come back to you, Mr. Pontello. Go ahead. Let go ahead. Go ahead. No, finish Mr. Your thought, no, Mr. Pontello, please go. Okay, so <clears throat> the motion that's on the table is, I guess, a budgetary item, uh, and uh, I guess through all the accusations that have been made during the discussion, um, I don't really see that this is administering the district, right? That the the board approves the budget, right? So if I'm saying that this motion is about making budget funds available for people to have their educational needs met. That's certainly something within the budgetary purview of the board, no? Mr. Gersmeyer or Keith, actually. No, I, have no, I, I, I have a question for that Keith. question. You, Keith, you don't yeah. have to answer that yet. Keith, uh, my question is, is that the way you just worded the motion? Because I don't believe it is. You worded it in a way that would put the district on the hook for millions of dollars open invite everybody take your take your problems to the district so that and, and they'll get paid for that's the way you worded it no i did you're, not no absolutely you did. not i'll run it back no, on youtube so you can play it back all you want yeah you, right, you know, guys, this is, guys, we're gonna this get down the, stop stop we're gonna go stop, down a rabbit stop, hole here stop we're not no, going down a rabbit, rabbit hole, hole everybody is, stop mr gersmeyer mr gersmeyer mr pontillo that's enough here's what we're gonna do we have a motion on the table the motion i was on the asking table. a question i want to finish it was i had the floor I you can't the floor. Right now, I, I just want to clarify the motion on the table because I, I tend to concur with what I'm hearing. I just, we are at 1230. We have a motion on the table. We've been talking about this for quite some time. Can you please, Mr. Pontillo, clarify the motion that's on the table because it's been so long now that I honestly <laughs> am not sure what the motion is. Okay. Well, again, I asked Keith a question. The board has the purview to approve the budget. Is that correct? Yes or no? The board approves the budget. The board approves the budget, right? The budget right. was approved last April. Okay. But now if we were to make a provision based on the motion tonight, that would be in a policy. It would perhaps be a policy issue, but also an allocation issue, is that correct? As per the motion tonight, you're directing the board, the district to allocate funds and resources for additional- The educational needs of our children. support that was not included in the budget. Okay, so the board could deny the budget that exists and look to place monies for that though then, correct? No. No, votes on the we budget. Have, we have, so, so we have to approve the budget, the budget as you wrote it. Is that what you're telling me? We already approved it. As the, 
as it was approved last year when it was presented? Well, listen, I'm not session. talking about what happened yesterday. I'm talking about what happens moving forward, right? Well, Obviously, this, this, this motion is not retroactive, right? This is something that would history. be happening moving forward. Yes, but, but the, the budget for the tw uh, the tw 19 uh, the 2020 2021 school year was approved last April, so it is retro. It, it goes back to when it was approved at the at the public pr presentation, in which the board members, the nine board members, voted the budget in to place. That is then the then the uh, taxes are are issued and 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 we work on the budget for the school year. The new budget presented that's supposed to be presented later or uh, discussed how, later is for next year. So how, how much is left for the educational needs of the children out of the existing budget? It's I there's I can't answer that question. It's not fair for you to ask me that question now without being prepared. OK, could you answer that for me to point in the future then? I can we can do a, a projection based on what we have out there. And I mean, I have some discussions that I will discuss on, on that. But again, um, I, I can do another. I mean, listen, so so we, we can sit here at three o'clock in the morning, right? And everyone can throw up all the roadblocks you want at me, right? So everybody, I'm sitting here looking for solutions to the problem and everyone wants to keep adding more problems to the solutions I'm looking to find and, and make accusations and, you know, call me a liar or whatever, whatever the, the, you know, when you weed through all the comments are. That, that's great. The bottom line is, is that I'm looking to do something that satisfies the thirst for people looking to satisfy the educational needs of their children. And all I'm hearing is, is all the ways we can't do it. Maybe we should spend 10 minutes looking for ways that we can. Okay, do, so do we still have a motion on the table? We have a motion. Okay, we were seconded. Close, you can close discussion and do roll call if you would like. I would like to close discussion and, and do a roll call, please. Sure. Mr. Abu Dawood? No. Uh, Mrs. Colombo? No. Mr. Gersmeyer? No, but I'm still open to discussion in all business about things. Mrs. Hanlon? No. Mr. Pontillo? Yes. Mrs. Price? She dropped off. Who? Ms. Price, Ms. I, Ms. I heard Price that go. I was off. trying to figure out who dropped off. Her computer maybe may have died. I mean, I have no idea what happened, but she did. All of a sudden, she just dropped off. All right. I'll, I'll just, I'll just note that she's earlier. left at 1237. So uh, moving on, uh, Dr. Romano? Only because I don't believe we actually can do this, I'm going to say no. Ms. Assembler? No, I think it's too vague. Mr. Parapato? No. Okay. Motion is not approved. Okay. Um, the, the discussion that's still open is reopening. Um, does anybody have anything they want to add to this? Ms. Sembler? Yeah, I mean, back to moving forward without the um, Cali index being in yellow for two weeks. I'm just having trouble understanding when it comes to social distancing, um, why we can't at least at this point move forward with middle school and high school. So the middle school and high school plan is to have 42.5% capacity in the morning, 42.5% capacity in the afternoon for middle and high school, which is within the same capacity range that they are in now. So I believe that it makes sense and it's fair and it's the right thing to do to 
at the very least, let the middle school and high school students move forward into phase two and have them switch over into phase two since they are going to still be able to maintain the required social distancing and the capacity is still going to be the same as, as, as it is now. Does anyone else here think that's a good idea? I'm, I don't understand why those two um, buildings should not be able to move forward. Dr. Gonzalez, I, I know you've presented it. Is, is there, do you, do you have um, an answer to that? Other than- An the, answer, the, no. The same, okay. okay. This, this yeah. is, these are decisions that are, are always taken under consideration. So as I typically do, you know, I, I regroup with my administrative team. Uh, the administrators regroup with their pandemic response teams. So again, you know, I, this, I'm assuming- I'm not looking hundred, for an answer. And, and, and I'm assuming, again, this is not a directive. This no. is just feedback. So I, I get all the feedback as I have. Okay. Uh, and and it, it gets considered. So I, uh, Yes, I'm not asking for an answer okay. on the spot. I'm just saying, you know, it makes sense if we're going to be at 42 and a half percent, and that's within what we are now. Um, it's basically just a schedule change for the middle school and high school levels, right? It's just switching these kids from um, every other day to AM and PM. And I believe that that could, you know, that would help uh, many of our community members and many of our students to at least see that we are taking a step forward in the right direction, but we're still going to follow um, you know, the, mm -hmm. the Cali index uh, recommendation um, at the elementary level, since they are going to be at a, they're going to increase their capacity. And I think it's just, it's just an idea. It's a thought and anything, it's a compromise and it's could satisfy um, a lot of people. Any other uh, discussions, Mr. Pantello? Uh, I think Stacy's trying to get back in, but it doesn't look like her audio. I don't know if there's a administrative permission if this meeting's kind of odd, but her name's popped up, but her video and her audio is not on. She um, said she might be having technical dish difficulties. She was actually in her video was on, but then I think she um, turned off the video. She she put in um, the chat. Sorry, she put in the chat. My apologies. I was kicked out of the meeting. And I'm trying to get my audio and video oh. to work. Okay. She had it for a while. I guess it kicked off. Hmm. So, you know, to piggyback off Michelle's comments, um, you know, we just put a 50,000 square foot addition on the middle school. When, when you hear comments, there's not enough space for social distancing. Uh, it, it just, to me, it defies logic, you know? And, and again, here I am. Uh, I'm asking a lot of questions and, and, you know, I'm not really getting a lot of answers, but it's kind of, I find it frustrating. I find it frustrating as a parent. And I find it frustrating as a board member. Um, so I, I think there's other things that we can be doing. And I think that we owe it to the people of the district. We owe it to the students and to, to not see the ball getting moved down the field here is uh, it's frustrating. And, and, you know, I, uh, you know, I read the emails that come in and, uh, I find myself agreeing more than disagreeing with some of the emails that come in. And um, I really just think we need to do something for the kids. You know, you know, we talked for the discussion on, on, you know, my commentary there a long time, all the things that we can't do. Let's talk about the things that we can be doing, you know, like Maureen's idea. Hey, can we come back when the, when the weather's good and open the windows because there's ventilation? It's an idea. Right. There's there's people that are willing to, to you know, give their time, uh, expertise and, and money to do this. People are spending money for for tutoring cohorts with their own kids so that they're getting more. You know, kid people are sending their kids to Catholic school because they know that th those schools are in session. And to see neighboring town communities have their schools in session and ours be not. It's uh, it, it's not a good look. So I think. Uh, I think we really need to be focused on on, on doing more and and, uh, and you know getting through this. You know, more people are getting vaccinated. 
uh, the, the mortality rate is way down. We've learned so much since March of 2020 with COVID uh, in the treatment and stuff like that, that it's not affecting people like it did uh, originally. And, you know, not seeing, not seeing strides made is, uh, is frustrating. Any other discussion on reopening, Mr. Grismeyer? Yeah, um, it's just it, what's hard about this whole topic is that there's studies for every every subtopic of COVID. There's studies on both sides that that show different opposing views, whether it's transmission, whether it's um, symptoms or asymptomatic, or in what age range, or or, or you know lawn haulers, what age are more lawn haulers than others down the road. There's tons of stuff out there, and there's a lot of conflicting information, just like there's conflicting guidelines and everything else. Um, and and I, I I tend to agree with what Mrs. Simler is saying about the upper grades, just because of the sheer stats of what's been happening. And it be I think it'd be wise to just keep keep looking at that and keep keep talking with the the, the, the leadership teams and just to see what can be done um, from that end, especially because they're near the end of their high school career. Um, shifting back to the elementary level, um, the problem with, the, that, that's where the class size stuff comes into play. The class size is, issue isn't, isn't really at the upper levels, um, but down below, because of the physical space limitations, which you know has caused classroom shuffling every year in, in, the, in the four or five years I've been paying attention, um, that's, that's a problem pre-COVID. So it, it just rears its ugly head now when trying to figure out a five-day next step for the primary grades. Um, the problem with discussing three options that are simultaneous is that once you try to get five days a week back for the, the younger grades, those class sizes shove the, the uh, severely decrease the social distancing way below six feet because of the size of the rooms that effectively eliminates the hybrid option. So the introduction of the third option takes away one of the original two by nature. So you'd be left with five days a week or four remote. And that's, that's the choice. And the survey, the last survey where you were asked to come to it asked everybody what they wanted to do. One of those two things, right? That was the, I think we got the survey before the holiday break and then we had a, we had a, we had to submit it soon after, right? Um, it was worded in a way that said, when conditions improve, what would you choose to do? And that kind of changed the way people responded. It, it, it was a, it, it tweaks the, the sense of what's happening. So it, I, I think it inflates the percentage. Now, is it worth, is it worth another survey? I think it is. Uh, I think to say, given the current situation, and with these two options, what do you, what are you, what are you committing to do? And then you get a better number. Um, I know that the, the district has already figured out across the board, grade by grade, classroom by classroom, based on the January survey result, what the the class sizes will look like, and that that's already been gathered. It's not like that hasn't been done, but I think. I'll say, I'll say right now, we answered we would go back because we said when conditions improve. I was like, yeah, sure. Yeah, five days a week, let's do it. Because we all want to go back. But conditions are improving. They're definitely better than they were on January 4th, that first day back, you know. Um, it's, it, it's going in the right direction. But I think you get a better commitment level and understanding and, and statistics. I always talk about having the data to, to, to help make informed decisions. I think you make a better informed decision with a more direct survey about what, what do you wanna do now um, to really get that feedback. And I'm sure parents are probably complaining like, oh, I don't wanna fill out another survey, but I think we need to, to get, the, get, get more clarity on that because check all that apply people, it's different combinations of answers. It's I checked the first two, but not the third, but other people checked the second and third one. It, it's, it's hard to, it doesn't make a quantitative uh, and really give you a final answer of X amount of kids are going to be in the third grade classroom here and the kindergarten classroom here. If, if that's on the table to, to reevaluate, 
I think that'd be a wise thing to look into. Okay. Um, any other topics or any other discussion points on this? Okay. Ms. Sumbler. Okay, to Mike's point about, you know, not talking about all the things we can't do and talking about the things that we can do, offering suggestions and ideas. Um, I just want to reiterate that there, I did offer three ideas of what we can do at this point um, that I hope that the administration would consider. One was looking at the Cali index on more of a local level as opposed to the entire Northeastern region. Um, the second was the possibility of having middle school and high school students start their new schedule of AM, PM, which would increase their in-person instruction um, by a number of hours each week um, without increasing the capacity um, and still keeping the social distancing uh, measures in place. I think that's something we can do um, right away. And the other was something that we've been talking about for several months is accepting requests of parents. And if they can be accommodated, maybe they can be, maybe they can't. Um, but there are classrooms where you can accommodate these additional children that are struggling and that are having difficulties and put them in the classroom. They don't have to have a tutor. They shouldn't have to, we shouldn't have to allocate funds. We shouldn't have to do anything else. Um, with the understanding that there's going to be times where you cannot accommodate a student. Maybe there's students struggling, but you're at max capacity for that classroom. Parents will understand that, but at least they're at least look into it, you know, make it a possibility for those classrooms that are empty. So we're doing something. We are making strides to accommodate as many of our students um, as we possibly can. And I do think that um, I could be wrong, um, but I think that all of our kindergarten classrooms are physically larger than the other classrooms. I mean, I know they are at, Berkeley, at Washington um, and maybe that is something that can be looked into that at this point, maybe it's just the kindergarten. The kindergarten classrooms are bigger. They can accommodate more. Um, these are just some ideas. These are just some options, um, some suggestions that I hope, you know, and I know Ray does listen to what we say and I know that mm -hmm. he takes it back and um, he, and, and, you know, maybe something will come out of those suggestions, but I think Mike has a good point. Maybe if we bring our suggestions instead of our, um, instead of just shooting everything down, maybe. Um, we would be a little bit more, we could be a little bit more productive. And I do want to thank everybody that, you know, spoke on public forum. I think listening to these moms cry, I want to cry too. <laughs> like I'm there, I'm with you. And I, um, I've cried, we've all cried. Um, and this is, this is hard and it's heartbreaking. It's heartbreaking um, to see our kids laying on the floor. I, you know, my son works in our dining room. I have a bench, a dining room bench. <laughs> And I, you know, walk by, he's laying on the bench and, you know, it's, it's a constant, you know, battle um, in, in many of our homes. It's a constant battle with having to give up, make choices every day about work or my kids, you know, and, you know, a lot of people are in that situation and are struggling financially and emotionally because of it. So, um, you know, when I hear other parents, um, you know, I just want you to know that um, I feel you and I'm, I'm there with you. And thank you for coming and uh, speaking to us. Okay. Um, I, I thank you, uh, Ms. Sembler. Can, can I just make a motion to, to close all business uh, in respect to, to what we still potentially have on the docket here? Um, uh, do I have a second? I, I, Ms. Colombo, thank you. Um, Keith, can I get a roll call, please? Yeah, or I, you, discussion, you don't know rather. Any, like, motion and second to, to move forward, but you can just oh. move forward to new business. Okay. Uh, and, and, I, and it's not that I don't respect this conversation. Uh, I, it's just, you know, I don't think I need to reiterate it. Um, but, but to move forward to new business, um, I don't even know where my paper is anymore. 
um, is the budget workshop, correct? So I know Mr. Pontillo had, had mentioned earlier uh, before that even is entertained. It, it, if that's not what you're going to say, I'll get to you in one second, Mr. Pontillo. Um, that's where I'm going. So if you're okay. going to do it, kind of yeah. So I, I'm going to ask Mr. Rosado, with, with all due respect, how much does does what has to happen tonight? Can it wait till our, our special meeting? And my question is, how much is this setting you? Because I, I understand and I respect what what you're trying to assemble. So I want to kind of give you the opportunity to let us know where this falls. So um, the the purpose of the workshop is really just to go over what we're put together uh you know i know uh, a lot of information came to you guys today because we got state aid numbers today so you know it was it's a push to get the stuff out uh bottom line i have to approve a final budget by the may 18th uh, march 18th meeting um it just this it was just giving affording the opportunity to to review what's in the budget and to get back feedback uh, from the board so that if I any changes or, or requests needs to be done, have the, it gives me the opportunity to to make those changes in time. Um, it's not something that has to happen now, I guess. Um, uh, the only thing I ask if that special meeting and as opposed to a regular meeting where it's just strictly workshop meeting, no action being taken um, so that we could just focus on task and, and don't have to go forward with the uh, going uh, actions. So we would, we would have the next week, the special meeting, if we did this would be the discussion about the vestibules because those, that has to have a, a vote. So action would have to be taken. I, I, I'm just, oh, I, yeah, this. I, I, that's right. I forgot. That yeah. meeting was for that purpose. Uh, <laughs> so could it would the budget be, it, go first then? Like, could Keith go first before us just so he can get his? Well, he, he has to be here. Does, does it, no, it doesn't matter. Whichever way, it doesn't matter. We're going to be. We could also agree to start a little sooner if that works for people's schedules too. Mr. Pontello? Food, food for thought. I mean, I came home at five o'clock and there was a manila envelope that had a whole bunch of pages that are supposed to go into the budget packet. I didn't even get a chance to read it. So I think that everybody here, it's one o'clock in the morning with the reduced, with respect to the process. I think everybody have a little bit more time to, to actually review the pack with all the information and it would be a good thing. So I, I would make the motion that we adjourn the, so, uh, the, so, the budget to the uh, special session, the budget yeah. workshop to the special session. So be, I know we keep talking about the next meeting, but can we like pinpoint a date and time? I mean, uh, let's just do next yeah, Wednesday. Wednesday. Can we do next, next Wednesday or Thursday? Next Thursday. Do you mean next, do you mean next Thursday? Next, yeah, next Thursday, Thursday, which is our, that's our usual board meeting. That is Thursday. Seven o'clock. We, we can't go a week. It's already Friday. <laughs> next Thursday, seven o'clock. It is next Thursday, seven o'clock. Or do I mean, can you go earlier? Six. We shoot for six thirty or six. Six thirty. I mean, uh, I I gotta I have to advertise, so I yeah. need. Unless yeah, just, you do it Wednesday, does anybody want to do it Wednesday? I'm trying to get out of this screen so I can look at my calendar, but. I can't get out of the screen. Alt, alt tab, alt tab. Put your mouse at the top of the screen. No, I got it now. I, I, it was that was that was the problem, Doctor Romano. Exactly. I, what I can't do Wednesday, but I could do six o'clock Thursday. Uh, what does that bring us to March fourth? March fourth. I can. Hey, hey, Matt. Yes. As, as Keith just said, he does need time to advertise it. So Wednesday probably wouldn't work. But I think okay. Keith, you'd six. have to tell us what Thursday. would work for you to advertise it. If I advertise and get it out there. Yeah, if I advertise, uh, I can get the advertisement in by 12 tomorrow. I think it'll be in uh, Monday's paper. Yeah, Monday or Tuesday's because paper. Because it wouldn't it Thursday. wouldn't get in community life. And it, right, but it wouldn't so it wouldn't get in community life, it wouldn't get into Pass Act Press. But it get in the record. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mich Michelle said she can't go Wednesday, so we Thursday. Yeah, Thursday. So uh, Thursday, we, six thirty. Is that does that work with everyone? Thursday, six thirty. I sure. Thursday at six thirty. Just I will I will be missing the beginning of the meeting. Just so you know, I'm okay with that. I'm just letting everyone know now. I have a presentation I have to make at six thirty for for something, and then I'll be on. So I I with respect to everybody else's schedule, I'm okay with starting it and then coming on if that's okay. Otherwise, I don't think we could start. I don't think we should start without you. I think right, so then seven o'clock would would unfortunately Thursday, seven o'clock. Okay, Thursday, seven o'clock. Okay. Okay. 
And we'll have one on, motion, on, one item on for the uh, vestibules, and then the discussion of uh, the budget workshop. And then just to reiterate, just so everybody's aware, if, if we can just, you know, if you have some questions that are going to develop some some process for him, if we could just get that out to to Keith in advance, um, it would just be helpful to kind of move the meeting along, uh, Mr. Fontello. Can we get the information on the vestibules that was discussed earlier tonight sent? Like tomorrow or not, you know, next Wednesday at 5 30 or something. Yeah, we, uh, okay, thank you. Okay, um, somebody want to, Mr. Bodude? So, you, did you mean to send it today, Mike, because it's Friday? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I, that's what I said. We can't do it a week from today because if we do it, it's going to be next Somebody Friday. Somebody make a motion to adjourn Thursday. this meeting, right. please. All right. Sorry about it. Sorry about it. I make a motion to uh, close the meeting. Do I have a second? Oh, then come the on, Joe. Meeting. Dr. Romano. <laughs> Thank All you. All favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Good Aye. night. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good morning. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>